the 2022 Gemini Science Meeting. If you came early enough, you got a bit of BTS and Coldplay. I think we'll put on music. It's more energetic that way in the morning. Okay, I see a lot of sleepy faces, but we have a really great program planned for everyone. Um, we have in the morning, uh, we'll have a session on black holes, AGN and quasars. Um, we'll jump around a little bit in terms of scientific area. We have stellar populations and star formation after the break. The break will feature a celebration for first light of the ghost instrument spectrograph. And then in the afternoon, um, we will actually go back to two talks on exoplanets that were moved from yesterday. And one change in the program is that Jennifer Burt will be the chair for the last two talks of the day. So let me see what else, what other reminders we have here. Um, testing. If you have not tested in 48 hours, we encourage you to do so, particularly before you go out with a large group of people to eat or drink and have to unmask. And then I think Jerry had a reminder for speakers, if you can come up um, when the Q&A for the previous talk starts, then he can get you wired up and ready. Okay, so before we start the talks today, we thought it would be helpful to introduce um, the Gemini staff who are present here, who can answer your questions and we will do that. So you can see uh, all those names of the Gemini staff here. So I'm just gonna uh, call their names and please raise your hands. So Julia and Christine, we must be at the back. So remember their face. Of course, we are wearing masks. It's hard. And Rodrigo and Christine again, Ricardo Salinas over there and Mark. Actually, I haven't seen Mark. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and Heron is today's chair. And Ruben, you saw Ruben yesterday. And it's me, Rihan, and Ruben again. And we have a second slide. Can you move to the next bit? Okay. <laughs> so these are the instrument scientists. So you can yet yeah, remember. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Kathleen, oh, okay. These are science fellows, Clara here, and Tong is sitting there, and Zach, yeah. Zach is all the way back. And Javier, yeah, our SOS, and Jocelyn, Jennifer, Brittany, yeah, she's there. Okay, and Joanna, <laughs> yeah, you know Joanna, yeah. And Frederick, yeah, and Kathleen, and, and oh. Sorry, Kathleen and Monica. All right, great. And Brian. And last, not the least, uh, Andre Nicolas. Is he? Oh, okay. Great. That's all. <laughs> so if you have any questions, please. Yeah, so Andre Nicolas will be sitting outside for the personalized user support. So if you have any questions about Gemini data, yeah, he's the person who can help you. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we'll get going with the first session. Okay, welcome to the day two Gemini Science meeting. This session is black hole quasars, black hole agent quasars. <laughs> and the first talk will be the virtual. So Alex Tetarenko will give a talk about the X-ray binaries. All right, cool. Hopefully you guys can hear me all right. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to come talk to you guys today. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. But today I want to talk about a topic that maybe you're not quite used to hearing about at the Gemini meeting. Um, I'm going to be talking about using time domain observations to study 
uh, jet and accretion physics in stellar mass black hole systems in our galaxy, systems that we call X-ray binaries. In particular, I wanna focus on showing you guys how Gemini's LOPK and Zorro instruments can be used to characterize variability from these systems in the optical regime. And this work is done in collaboration with some really awesome people all listed on the slide there. And I particularly wanna call out some amazing Gemini folk, um, Ricardo Salinas, Zach Hartman and Steve Howell who have really allowed me to take this kind of crazy idea and make it um, into real observations. So first of all, just a bit of an X-ray binary crash course for those of you who aren't as familiar with these objects. Uh, these systems contain a stellar mass black hole accreting matter from a companion star. And they give us a really kind of unique test bed for studying um, jets and accretion. And this is because they're numerous in our galaxy. They're pretty close to us and they evolve on human time scales. So the majority of these systems are actually transients where they progress from these kind of periods of minimal activity into bright outbursting states on time scales of days to months. So we can really watch them change in real time. Uh, now that you guys are all uh, experts on actually binaries, um, let's talk a bit about why we wanna do time domain observations of these systems. And really when it comes down to it, Time domain observations give us a unique viewpoint on these systems, especially when considering the complex relationship between the inflowing matter and the outflowing jet. And to really understand why, let's make a bit of an analogy to the supermassive black hole systems. So we now know that we can image down to event horizon scales in some of these AGN sources. And if we combine these kind of event horizon telescope observations with other ground-based arrays, as you can see on the slide here, we get a pretty good sampling of different scales from inflow to outflow in the system. Uh, the numbers are in gravitational radii, by the way, on the figure. But if you move over to the stellar mass systems in X-ray binaries, we get a bit of a different picture. So while these systems are located much closer to us than the extragalactic AGN sources, their black holes are millions to billions of times smaller in mass. And this makes direct imaging on horizon scales really not feasible. However, what we can do if we want to probe the material really close to the black hole in these stellar mass systems is we can use uh, X-ray timing techniques. But if we put that same set of ground-based arrays that we just talked about for the supermassive systems onto the stellar mass side of this diagram, you'll notice that we're probing quite far out in the outflowing jet. Even if we are able to image these systems with the Event Horizon Telescope, we're still probing like 10 to the four, 10 to the five gravitational radii. So there's this really kind of big gap here in scales of what we're able to probe. And this is a really a big problem because we have these kind of fast variations in the accretion flow um, near the black hole that we're probing with X-ray timing. And if we wanna understand how they propagate into the jet and down the jet flow, what happens is these signals get really kind of smoothed out. So by the time they reach these really far out regions that we're probing with these kind of ground-based arrays, it's almost like they've lost their memory of you know, where they've been and how they've got there. So we really need to kind of fill in these scales. And this is where uh, multi-wavelength kind of timing observations, especially in the optical and infrared comes in. It starts allowing us to access these smaller scales. So if we can measure these fast varying signals, then what kind of physics can we actually extract from them? Well, as I just alluded to, by measuring these fast varying signals, we can probe physical size scales that really aren't accessible with current, current imaging capabilities, you know, really going beyond even something that the Event Horizon Telescope could do for these systems and zoom in close to the black hole where jets are first launched and accelerated. Um, we are also able to probe notoriously difficult to measure properties like energy output and speed. And perhaps most excitingly, we can start comparing variability signals across different bands uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum, linking changes in the inflowing material, which is probed by the X-ray with changes in the jet, which is probed by the longer wavelengths. And this can allow us to sort of map out the sequence of events leading to jet launching and particle acceleration like we've never really been able to do before. So today we're gonna to be focusing on the optical and infrared regime. And to kind of give you context into why we need Gemini for this, 
I want to give you a bit of a brief overview of sort of the current state of the field in terms of measuring these fast varying signals in the OIR and extracting physical information from them. So really this field kind of got a kickstart in the early 2000s um, with the introduction of these new fast readout detectors that allowed us to start probing sub-second time scales in optical and infrared. This is getting clo us closer and closer to what we are already capable of doing in the X-ray. And the first unambiguous detection of this kind of fast variability from a jet in an X-ray binary actually came from a system known as GX339-4, where significant variability was detected on sub-second time scales in the optical and infrared, and it was found to be highly correlated with the X-ray. And that's actually what you see here on the right side of the slide. This is a cross-correlation function that measures basically time differences between intensity fluctuations in different signals. And here we see about a hundred millisecond delay between the X-ray and infrared in this system. And the study was really the first suggestion that variations in the accretion flow uh, probed by the X-ray here could subsequently be driving variations in the jet probed by the infrared in this case. And really was kind of a proof of concept uh, for doing these kind of multi-wavelength timing studies. And we've actually kind of graduated to a bit more complex analysis now. Um, beyond cross-correlation functions, we can actually start delving into the Fourier domain. So we can do things like power spectra, measuring the amplitude of variability over different time scales, or cross spectra, which allows us to really characterize the causal relationship between two different signals. And it's kind of like a step up from this kind of cross-correlation function that you see here on the left side of the slide because it allows us to characterize this sort of delay and correlation behavior over many different time scales of variability by essentially decomposing the signals into different time scale components. Now, what's really exciting is we've now seen that we can start modeling these Fourier domain timing metrics and this with real jet models. And this really opens up the possibility of actually studying detailed physical processes taking place inside the accretion flow and the jet through just the analysis of light curves alone. We can understand how, for example, changing jet properties could imprint on these time domain metrics. Now, on the bottom of the slide here, I give you a bit of a kind of timing metrics cheat sheet, just so you remember what every um, metric tells us. And today we're gonna to be talking about legs and we're gonna be talking about power spectra. And one in particular feature that we can observe in the power spectra, as you see pointed out on the slide here, are these peaked features that we call quasi-period oscillations. So keep that in mind for a few slides in a minute. All right, so we've had success with other instruments for doing this kind of optical fast timing, but we still have quite a lot of limitations with these kind of studies. In particular, it can get very difficult to get time approved on these fast uh, photometer instruments. And even then we only have get sort of short observations. We're talking less than an hour max. And this really pales in comparison to what we're able to do at longer wavelengths. Like for example, with the VLA, we can observe these X-ray binaries for four or five, six hours at a time. Additionally, you know, we haven't been able to do systematic studies of optical variability, for example, throughout an entire X-ray binary outburst. We've only kind of got snapshots. And this is where Gemini comes in with um, its relatively new instruments, Allopaking and Zorro. Now, fair warning, Allopaking and Zorro aren't designed to do you know, fast photometry, but they have all these specific uh, characteristics that make them really ideal for these kind of studies. For instance, we have really fast time resolution, tens of uh, milliseconds. We get two simultaneous bands at once, a pretty good size field of view. Um, with Alopeki on the north and Zora on the south, we get basically full sky coverage for wherever our extra binary is. And of course, we have really great rapid kind of target of opportunity response and coordination with other facilities. So Gemini really kind of ticks every box for what we need to do optical fast timing observations of extra binaries. So we started this kind of program to try and start observing these systems with Alopeki and Zora a few years ago. And I want to show you guys some of the most interesting results that we've gotten. Um, in particular, of a X-ray binary that we call 4U1543-47. So this system went into one of these bright outbursts last year. It faded, and then it started this sort of reflare or mini outburst earlier this year. And this is where we got um, 
Gemini Zorro observations combined with um, infrared fast timing with the Hawkeye instrument on VLT and nicer um, X-ray data. And as we see here on the right side of the slide, this is a, what we call a harness intensity diagram, which basically shows evolution of this system throughout these outbursts. So we have um, X-ray luminosity, essentially a pro proxy of mass accretion rate on the vertical axis and X-ray hardness, um, which is basically a ratio of high energy to low energy emission on the horizontal axis. So you'll see that sort of reflare period that we sampled pointed out there. And all of this X-ray analysis was done by this awesome PhD student at Texas Tech, Eli Patty, shown on the slide there. So what did we see in the Gemini observations? Well, here's a snapshot of a couple of the light curves that we got in the field of view. And you can see that we already see kind of rapid flaring um, variability, and this was really encouraging. So we wanna characterize this variability that we're seeing from this system. So as we talked about earlier, we delved into the Fourier domain and we create power spectra. This is what you see is um, power spectra from the blue filter in the main panel here where the different colors are different days of observations and uh, simultaneous X-ray in the insets. And you'll notice that we see this lovely peaked quasi periodic, periodic oscillation feature in the optical. Interestingly, it appears to evolve with time. We also see a similar feature in the infrared, also evolving with time, but a factor of two lower in frequency. And we see absolutely nothing there in the X-ray. So let's take a closer look at this quasi-periodic oscillation. So here we have um, the frequency of this feature versus time. And we kind of have two scenarios to try and reconcile what we're seeing in both the optical and infrared. So either we have what we're seeing is two different harmonics of the same quasi-periodic process, and they're both evolving somewhat linearly with time, or we're seeing the full evolution um, in time of this quasi-periodic oscillation feature. Now, if it's case B here, um, we might expect the frequency of this feature to correlate with other time-varying quantities, like for example, the X-ray flux. And we did see this. Uh, quite a clear correlation here. So this might lend to option B. So this is just one of the timing metrics that I told you we we're gonna be talking about. We can also try and understand what the relationship between all of our different time varying signals are using cross correlation functions. Um, and with this metric, we found that both of our optical bands were highly correlated. The X-ray in the infrared was also highly correlated. That's what you see here on the slide. This is one of these cross-correlation functions, again, showing that familiar 100 millisecond lag that um, we saw in those other sources a few slides ago. But weirdly, the X-ray and the optical seem to not have any kind of clear correlation at all. And this really puzzled us for a while. Um, but we realized that the variations in the optical, the, the amplitude of these variations were quite low compared to, for example, the infrared. So we think that the correlation is just getting lost in the noise at this point. All right, so how do we put this all together and kind of create a physical picture for what we're seeing in these time varying signals? Well, we think at least our working theory is that the optical infrared emission is coming from the jet. And we have a processing jet driven by a processing inner accretion flow. And that's what's creating that quasi periodic oscillation feature. But we still have to explain why we're not seeing any of this these features in the x-ray. Um, we have a couple of suggestions. Either what we have is some sort of obscuration happening in these systems. And this can be, for example, due to these systems, we can get these strong winds coming from the accretion disk and that can put a bunch of material in the system and block the signal. Um, this is also a really low inclination source. So we're looking at this system almost face on and that can be more difficult to observe QPOs. Or it could just be, again, this low signal to noise issue because we're looking at these systems in one of this sort of mini outbursts. So it's not as bright as it usually gets. All right, so hopefully I've given you guys a bit of a taste of what we can do with this kind of multi-wavelength spectral timing analysis of X-ray binaries. Um, but to really take true advantage of these kind of techniques, we need to be able to combine uh, observations across many different fast timing capable facilities that sample across the electromagnetic spectrum. So allowing us to sample many different scales across the accretion flow and the jet. And Gemini's Allopecan Zoro instruments 
hopefully have shown you that they give us a really great new option for doing this in the optical. Um, so I'm really excited to see what we can do um, observing more extra binary systems and really getting a more complete picture of accretion and um, jets in these types of systems. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. So is there any questions from the audience? Can everyone hear me? Oh, there we go, it's working. Thank you very much for that nice talk. Uh, my question is, uh, when you're doing these fast timing optical observations, how much does the atmosphere impact your photometry? Because you know it's changing sort of at the same time scales. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So in order to combat that, what we're doing is we do, well, we place um, other stars in our field of view so that we can actually do differential photometry. So we can get rid of that sort of effect. Um, when we create light curves. But that's a really, one of the really great advantages of Allopake and Zorro is we have kind of a big enough field of view that we can, for the most part, always find other stars, usually multiple ones. So we can kind of cross check our analysis too. Thank you. Any other questions from here or Slack? Okay. Then I have a question, quick questions. This might be very rare, rare object. So is there any survey for detecting these ones or? A oh, survey for like optical variability yes. in extra binaries. So yes. unfortunately not. I mean, well, before, you know, Allopake and Zorro, the only way we could do this was with specific, you know, fast photometry instruments. So for example, like, like I talked about Hawkeye on the VLT, or there's also a couple instruments on GTC um, mounted now that we can use, but it's been sort of limited to these kind of very specific instruments that allow us to get to kind of down to time scales of milliseconds. Um, so unfortunately no, no surveys that we can do, um, but with Gemini's, you know, Alopeke and Zorro, we've just got, for the upcoming semester, you know, a big bunch of more time approved. And we're hoping to kind of be able to observe a, for a full outburst about like 10 different observations um, in a system. So perhaps we can start building up a nice database of these observations of X-ray binaries with Gemini. Okay. Okay, thank you, great. So let's thank speaker again. Thank you. Our next talk is the invite talk. Shall we fun from the University of Arizona will talk about the quasars and the IGM at Cosmic Dawn. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about higher to quasars and how to use them to probe the evolution of supermass black holes uh, and the uh, intergalactic medium of the epoch of ionization. Um, so the first quasar was discovered like almost 60 years ago now. Um, and since then, of course, quasars have always been one of our primary tools to, uh, to study the distant universe. This figure has been used in the last maybe 15 years or so of Sort of highlighting what we knew about the most distant quasars. It was a summary of all the quasars that was known at Resh about six um, in a review paper 2006. But that time, most of these quasars discovered from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, but, and there are a handful of them. But even at that time, sort of, a, sort of three main conclusions about what's going on uh, in those quasars and how to use them to probe distant universe. One is, of course, the existence of these objects. These are luminous quasar rays beyond six. Tells you that the supermassive black holes powered by sort of billion solar mass black black hole um, already existed about one billion years after the Big Bang, so have to form them really quickly. The second point is uh, these quasars have their host galaxy that have a lot of hot dust emission in it. Tells you there's uh, these objects are accompanied by um, uh, intense star formation in the host galaxy. 
And the third point you can see here is on the blue side of the landmark emission line here of the that's the strong confidence and absorption, indicating that at that epoch, the universe is getting more and more neutral. There are a lot more neutral hydrogen uh, along the line of sight in the IGM. So we're getting, we're seeing the renovations ending. So that's all of the state of our state of art of 15 years ago. Since then, there are a few more quasars discovered. Uh, there's actually now about a thousand quasars that we know are ratio higher than five, about 200 are ratio higher than six, and 10 are ratio higher than seven. So it's very hard to plot all the quasars in a, in, in a, in a diagram look like that now. So it actually produces two dimensional plot. So basically, these are like 500 something quasar spectra. One line is, is a one dimensional quasar spectrum, just older than my redshift. So what you see here is really the lemma of admission line marks through the wavelengths from sort of redshift 5.5 or so at 7,000, 8,000 electrons, all the way to beyond one micron at higher redshift at 7.5, 7.6. So lemma of line finally, instead of UV line, is really now a infrared line now. Uh, and what you can see, instead of, in addition to this strong mass emission, of course, it's a signature of these quasars, is the, again, the very strong absorption on the blue side. Here, there's basically no flux left when you go to ratio beyond six. And when you go to ratio lower than six, you can see a little bit of flux that indicating, again, the renovation is progressing this way as the universe become more and more neutral. So that is something we have now. And what that enables us to do is to probe to the highest ratio beyond seven, and also have very large sample of objects and those rest of sort of six range to probe the end of renovation. And what enables to do that is really a combination sort of a four factors. One is the new generation of wide area optical and infrared sky surveys. So starting from the SDSS time, 10 stars, that then we survey the, uh, the DESI legacy imaging survey and various new, new infrared surveys allow us to detect these objects. These are surveys that cover, and of course also the Subaru HSC survey. Uh, these surveys cover basically the majority of the actual sky already, the regional depths. And then you have to find these objects, select these objects from the phonematic database. You're going to hear, I think, the next two talk about the more detail about how people actually do that, to do this kind of real object selection and fighting against all the contaminants. But even that is not quite enough. You Next step, you have to do infective, sort of a very efficient spectroscopic identification. And that's where Gemini began to come in. You have to use sort of eight to 10 minute telescope to take a spectrum to see whether it's a crater or not, what the rest of this. And finally, you know, we have way fine solar observation to probe the property of these objects. The last two steps are the step that Gemini has played a fairly significant role in our study. Uh, let me just show you sort of three of our post child demos system quasars. Um, this object was uh, discovered three, four years ago now. It was um, the most distant lens quasar and also the brightest quasar we know, the bright object really we know in the distant universe. This is a rest of 6.5 quasar um, at 18 magnitude. So, it, I mean, you all heard about the news about all the diversity stuff. I think in the rest of we're talking about 28 magnitude. This one is 18 magnitude, the rest of six and a half. Literally at the end of and uh, in the middle of renovation. The reason is this object is actually strongly lensed, uh, mag magnified that factor about 50. So that's the most distant lensed object. If you have time, we'll come back to talk a little bit about how the lensing is going to help us to understand the black hole growth. But the spectrum, the discovery spectrum, actually, a combination of MMT, CAT, and GNER, in particular, here that provides the infrared coverage of this object. And in particular, allow it to go to sort of a K band to use. The magnitude two emission lines actually to uh, to measure the black hole mass. Um, you sort of assuming the the line that is caused by gravitational uh, motion. The second object was discovered a couple of years later. This is a redshift seven point five two quasar, which at that time was the second highest redshift quasar. It was discovered um, at Gemini North using GNERS, um, and you can see the spectrum here. Again, the GNERS really get you to the very far end of K band allow you to measure the black hole mass. And this is actually the first object with a brilliant solar mass black hole that we know and rest of beyond seven. So we're pushing sort of towards the most massive black hole at the most distant uh, uh, at the highest redshift. 
And we're very glad and sort of uh, fortunate to that the observatory was able to work with the Science Center in Hilo and give the, this, uh, this object a very uh, good name, Hawaiian name, uh, Ponoa Ena, which means unseen spinning source of creation surrounded with brilliance. I believe this is the first quasar that ever was given an 18 Hawaiian name. So uh, we're really sort of fortunate to be associated with this effort. So that's the second discovery. The third one is actually the most distant quasar that we know today. It was uh, actually the lot we discovered at a very last observing run we were able to do in person before everything. Uh, so it's a redshift 7.64 quasar. But you can see actually it just shows you that in order to get the final spectrum, the relative faint object, we actually used a whole bunch of eight to 10 meter, six to 10 meter telescope to, to get this combination uh, to, uh, to really get all the way from the low lemma of emission to again the end of K band. And that's really where ge genius actually shines because there are few crop dispersion dispersing factor that cover sort of medium intermediate resolution and infrared. There's fire on uh, on uh, Magellan. There's uh, nearest on CAC, of course, extruder and genus. What genus is really good at is the far end of the K band that nobody else actually can reach to. And that gives us really this line to get a black hole mass. And the other interesting about this particular case are not only the most distant one, but you can see the absorption feature over here. And that is actually absorption for the absorption line feature coming from some of the highly ionized lines tells you there's actually a very high velocity, sort of a be beyond 0.1 C. These are outflows coming from the sort of H central part of the AGN tells you whatever the equator is doing is producing some kind of feedback. Uh, in the galaxy at those points already. And this kind of quasar is really becoming more common at high redshift. So that's a discovery. And let me, uh, so another question is, so now we know we reached to redshift seven and a half now, but how far more can you go? We heard about redshift 20 galaxy yesterday. I don't think we're gonna get redshift 20 quasar very easily. Um, the reason is the quasar density is dropping really fast when you go to high redshift. The redshift seven quasar I'm good, we're, we're talking about is about one per cubic gigaparsec. These are the most, the sort of rare, rarest object in the early universe. And if you're just extrapolating this density evolution and sort of ask the question for this kind of luminous quasar, at which point you get only one in the entire observable universe, basically in the entire four pi, you get this point by redshift about nine. In other words, you were talk, talking about sort of so called SDSS kind of quasar. These are Object again powered by sort of hundreds of million to billion solar mass black hole. We're running out of universe, really, volume, volume of the universe at rest of about nine to 10 or so. And the way to do that, to find these objects, is really the next generation sky surveys, Euclid and Roman, you know, infrared plus Robin Alpha's T in optical. And the challenge there is when you can detect them, how to identify them again. So there is really a combination of Again, things like Gemini Large Ground Based Telescopes for this kind of initial identification we're talking about, except, except they'll go to even fainter magnitude, and then using JWST for detailed spectroscopy to actually understand their properties. All right, so now I'm going to just do very quickly go over some highlights of what we learned from all these quasar in terms of their connection to uh, early galaxy formation. It's actually, we can see the connection of quasar with galaxies in sort of three different scales. And the scale of event horizon, at least still within the sphere influence of the black hole, we can look at the black hole mass and, and their properties to see how black hole receded and grow. And much larger scale, the galaxy scale, we can see the host galaxies and how quasar impact the growth of the really massive galaxies. And an even larger scale, 100 megaparsec scale, quasar, of course, are used to probe ionization that we talked already. So in terms of black hole growth, these are a compilation of all the black hole masses that we have on those quasars. Again, the way that we measure black hole mass is to go for these broad emission lines that are coming from fairly close to the central black hole. So well we've seen the real influence of, of the black hole and use the width of the line as sort of like a proxy of how fast uh, gas is moving. We're gonna hear more on, I mean, Friday of how to measure black hole mass in local universe, but this is about as good as we can do. And these black hole masses, as you can see, are sort of a rest of seven or so up to 
billion solar masses. There actually is one object that we have still trying to understand what's going on, maybe up to about 10 billion solar masses. Again, a ratio summit. So this is within a few hundred million years uh, from the first star formation in the universe. How can they go that fast without a problem, right? So if you're assuming these black holes are here, uh, that there's redshift, uh, there's, uh, there's mass, and assuming they're assuming uh, that they are creating as fast as they can, I think the rate, uh, as often as they can, 100% duty cycle. And then the creature, uh, the black hole mass will sort of double every 30, 40 million years. And then you extrapolate to see what kind of seed you need at whatever the redshift is. You can see that even if you form these black hole seeds at redshift, say 30, and ask them to just continue to grow nonstop, you still need 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 solar mass seeds. So that is beyond what you can do with things like the collapse of, say, population three stars. You have to have more exotic way of forming these very massive systems, such as so-called uh, direct collapse black holes. Um, how do we go there? I think that is really the question that the next generation of study has to address is, because now we're just posing the question. We find the end product of this black hole growth process. I really need to go to earlier stage that are which are fainter, more obscured, uh, to figure out exactly how creatures, how the black holes form um, and growth in, in, their, in their initial phase. But so the second point is about um, the black hole galaxy connection. Their optical infrared observations is going to be very hard because you have this bright crater in the middle. So the way we do it, of course, is to go to longer wavelengths. There's what ELMA is playing a central role. Uh, ELMA both can sort of detect the dust emission coming from the star formation of the host galaxy and atomic and molecular gas in those host galaxies very, very quickly. So you can do sort of 15, 10, 15 minutes snapshot and detect both of these quasars already with ELMA. And also, then you can turn around and really looking at what's going on with this object. There's a couple of examples of extremely high spatial resolution observations. You can see the sort of soft little perfect scale uh, observations of the host galaxy of these quasars. And the highlight these two are because they're sort of they're showing a lot of contrast of the of the kind of galaxy they're living in. One is huge, with the velocity field sort of look pretty massive, with even some holes in the middle who knows what's going on with some feedback or what. The other have the similar black hole mass, exactly the same redshift, much more compact, have a nice velocity sort of gradient that suggestive of this object is actually rotationally supported. It's not the thing that we're seeing. So when you see this. These quasars are similar properties, similar luminosity, similar black hole mass. But when you look at the galaxy properties, they actually look very different. Some of them are rotationally supported. Some of them look like some kind of dispersion dominant system. Some of them look disturbed with some merger or um, companion activity in it. But overall, these are strong star formers, uh, highly turbulent systems with a high gas fraction, gas mass fraction, very high molecular gas mass. The other thing we can do is when we have this high spatial resolution observations, we can actually measure sort of or estimate the dynamical mass of the uh, of the host galaxy and compare that with the black hole mass. So again, that's the sort of M sigma relation that we are familiar with. We can plot these quasars, the ratio of six or seven, onto the local velocity version with the black hole mass relation. What we'll see here is at least for the object that we're talking about. Um, they are about, about a factor of 10 above the local M sigma. In other words, these objects are forming black holes faster or earlier than the assembly of the galaxies. Now, one of the really exciting things is whether we can really probe exactly what the black hole is doing to the galaxies. And that comes back to this lens case that I mentioned earlier. Because this object is so bright, it's actually probably the brightest object in the early universe in almost all the wavelengths because of the lensing. Um, this is our observation that actually shows the sort of nice arc from the lens. But the combination of how bright it is and how, how high the magnification is means you can really go to high resolution. This is the resolution of about a quarter of a second. We can actually have a higher resolution observation from ELMA that really shows this nice feature over here. And you, the, the highest magnet, magnified part of this image has an effective resolution of about 20 parsecs. So we're talking about 20 parsec resolution observations with this ELMA observation, uh, a redshift six and a half. 
that actually gives us really close to that hole. We're hoping to figure out what exactly that thing is doing there and whether we can constrain an animal mass. Okay, so finally, very quickly about uh, uh, reanimation. Um, it all started with sort of detection of complete confusion abortion, a ratio of higher than six. But now we have all these quasar sidelines. What you see here is this is a transmitted flux or how transparent IGM is, a function of redshift of all the quasars we have. What you see is again, sort of a progression from transparent to opaque. So from, uh, from the universe higher ionized to become equally neutral. But the other thing we learned is that this process of ionization, how fast the universe is going from ionized to neutral and neutral to ionized is highly sort of a flat rating in the sense that there are a lot of life line of sight dispersion um, over rest of six and a half, five and a half to six. Some of the sight lines are very, very dark already at those points. Other side lines are still quite trans transparent. So if you put everything together for the randomization picture, uh, you see the, this all the of constraint coming from critical observations, you see the initial rise over here, rest of six and a half to seven, and five and a half to six, that we think the end is, we think the peak of renovation is really about just seven and a half or so. That's where the universe is probably half neutral. And then there's actually still a pretty big gap in the middle that we think our new crater sample is going to fill in to map out exactly how you go from 10 and minus four neutral fraction in the IGN to about half uh, over the period of only a couple of hundred million years. All right, so I'm, end, I'm going to end with uh, what's going to come next. We're all waiting for the Jarevsky data. So there's actually a very large high risk of uh, high risk galaxy uh, quasar program in cycle two from both GO and GTO cover about sort of 40, 50 quasars over in the, in the rest of six to seven and a half range over a very wide um, luminosity range. And our hope, these are similar data. Hopefully in the next two months, we're going to change that to real data. But the hope is really to use the JLST to detect stellar light to measure stellar mass with a increasing uh, sensitivity. Um, and then to connect them to quasars to galaxies with larger structure, um, and as also to provide GM galaxy connection with sort of all the different sidelines. And yesterday, I think people are mentioned uh, talking about what is the what role the ground based large telescope play in the JLST era. At least for quasars, I think there are three things where we think the ground based observation is still going to be crucial. One is again, you need those to uh, you need the eight to ten or later on GMT and TMAN to find them because it obviously it's going to be slow to follow them up or it's not efficient to do it. So they are still the uh, discovery machine. Of course, we still have the optical wavelengths all the way up to one micron or so. That's where we're gonna end up probing more detailed end our innovation. And finally, JWST of course have very sensitive spectroscopy, but it's not going to go to R of 30,000 that we really need to probe IGM enrichment, to probe to matter IGM temperature and so on, to map the entire picture of renovation. So the high sensitivity, high resolution infrared spectroscopy is still needed. But finally, I'm just gonna put a summary here. I want you to sort of take back these three pictures that I think highlight what we know about the highest rest of quasars. They're from early, and I think we're actually getting very close to time where we can ask the question, when the first luminous quasar appeared in the universe. They live in diverse um, black environment. I think JWST is really going to tell us, with, in a combination of ELMA, tell us what kind of galaxies they are in. And renovation of told by quasars seem to be rapid and inhomogeneous. And this redshift range is still the range that of ground-based optical observations is going to be very important. It's actually going to be Rest of six or seven and a half is going to be the astrophysically most interesting range of redshift that uh, more progress we make. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions from the audience here or Slack? No questions on Slack. No questions? That was a great talk. Thanks very much. I'm sure you've noticed in the last week a whole flurry of papers of redshift, you know, yeah. all the way up to 14, 15 galaxies. Um, I don't know if any of those show any kind of AGN signatures, but have you thought about 
um, you know, what those first quasars might look like. And then the, also I'm curious what the duty cycle is, right? Because some of these first galaxies we're detecting them, they're relatively bright the first pass here. And are, are they massive enough to be hosting quasars? And right, I've, how, I've, how, how frequently yeah. would you observe it? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of work on the on the AGN aspect of these galaxies. Uh, the thing that we learned from, at least from HST, the one slide I couldn't show, is actually they are um, among the, one of the, one of the interesting reasons work is actually there was a detection of a uh, radial and strong uh, uh, sort of MIPS um, infrared of detection of one of the most massive lemon Bray galaxy in the uh, in the cosmos field. So there's clearly AGI activity in it. And actually that object is, we still don't know what's going on. That object is so massive in terms of, or so luminous in terms of their AGI and power of magnetic luminosity that it somehow doesn't make sense of how rare, how, how in one degree you can find it. So I think there are a lot of things we don't know about galaxies and um, uh, about AGN in the hydro galaxies that Taylorosity will play a huge role in it. Um, probably the best way to probe that is actually, one is you can go to medium infrared, but that's probably still fairly faint. The other way is availability, right? So I, I am hoping that there will be multi-epoch observation to, to really figure out how many of these things are are changing because if the black holes are small, you will see them changing in a few months time scale or year time scale. Okay, and if I could ask a, a second question, um, you highlighted the power of geniers in identifying spectroscopic features way out into the, the mm -hmm. band. And of course, we're really excited to have these new IFUs coming on. Um, do you think that the IFU capabilities, particularly with the, the AO would be useful to, to probe at the, the host galaxies? I think they, they will certainly be useful for probe sort of slightly larger scale than the host galaxy. I mean, one example is um, actually we 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 have a program on using Muse, sort of go to rest of six, slightly lower rest of them. Um, then what you will see here is with Muse, with sort of their semi error mode, you see quite a bit of, uh, or even without AO, you'll see quite a bit of lemma of a halo around these around these quasars. So probably not the host galaxy itself because that's hard, because the quasar is too bright. But when you go to a few, because, and, and the whole galaxy is supposed to be fairly compact. So I think going to one, two kiloparsec is difficult. Going to five to 10 kiloparsec is really good. Because what we see from Muse is that when you go to that scale, there are a lot of lemma halos around it. You can actually even see the rotation of these halos that tells you something sort of gives some, giving some dynamic information about the gas going on there. So I think that is really sort of the, on the scale, on the edge of the galaxy or right between Galaxy and, and CGM is one that I think the sweet spot is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Then let's, thanks. There's no one question. Okay. Um, yeah, did you have a question? I saw your hand was up on Zoom. Yes, I, I I didn't know if I should ask on Zoom or if I should post the the, the question on, on Slack. But yes, please go ahead. Uh, I, I was wondering about the M sigma relation because you showed that that the the there are there are black holes that were very massive and above the the, the relationship. But I've I've seen some recent models that that show something the other way around that that star formation could prevent the black hole from forming because of feedback. Uh, is that maybe because of a bias that we cannot observe the the, the low mass black holes at these redshifts? Yeah, I, I, th I think that's really exactly right. The, I mean, the objects that we see are the most extreme objects. The, the reason that we see them is because there is a black hole in it. But the occupation fraction, for example, of these objects that Jen just mentioned is going to probably be low. So some of them just, we were seeing the the extreme example of a big black hole in the galaxy, there must be the other way around. Some of the galaxies didn't roll back over very efficiently. I think that's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Right. Let's thank speaker again. Our next speaker is Suhyun Shin from Seoul National University. And she's talk about the galaxy luminosity function at redshift five, improved by artificial neutral network and Bayesian information criterion.
Good morning. I'm Suan Sun, PhD student in Seoul National University. First, I thank the Germany Science Meeting Committee for giving me the chance to present our work. Today, I will talk about uh, um, our research about the crazy with the function of the uh, fight improved by artificial neural network and based on information criteria. Crazy luminous function is um, called the number density as a function of luminosity. Uh, considering that the crazy mode is likely to spawn us a black holes, it, it, it could be crucial key to investigate the evolution of craters and create you know, the spawn us a black hole and host galaxies. And it also can be used for estimating the contribution of craters to maintaining the intergalactic medium um, ionized in the early universe. So many studies have been conducted for um, crater surveys to, co to construct the crater luminous function at various relationships. The crater luminous function is often described by the power law functions. The faint and the slope is alpha, and the bright and the slope is beta. And as you can see in the rapid graph, um, there are a few data points in the faint part of the crater luminous function and of its value compared to its brighter part. Due to the shallow image depth of the previous surveys, it is hard to find faint craters. Therefore, it is very difficult to constrain the faint and the slope. Um, yeah, and uh, are causing a huge discrepancy in the faint and slope from minus 1.2 and minus 2. To elevate the difference, the securing faint sample, faint crater sample is essential. So, uh, we want to extend the faint and the crater luminous function of this five uh, as much as possible based on recent deep imaging surveys. Um, deep imaging data is one of two requirements to search faint crater. The other is efficient collection method, which can distinguish from uh, distinguishing promising crater candidates from other contaminant sources. Since end of stars and high of the galaxies have a similar colors to those of quasars, they could be contaminant sources. So to remove them, the conventional color selection is widely used for selecting high of the quasars. However, as you can see in the left graph, um, a selection using two or three colors and maximums cannot um, um, properly distinguish quasars from a uh, few dwarf stars and almost all of the galaxies. Um, they are indistinguishable in the two dimensional color cross space. On the other hand, the need of 2020 derived with some decoder luminous function and what is the five, um, without considering that the bank is the two beams uh, due to possible contamination by uh, light and bright galaxies. This is because high reddish galaxies become dominant population at the point of part of the um, case of luminous functions. Well, um, um, we have to um, we have to make a new approach to uh, select craters without um, contaminant source, especially for high reddish galaxies. So we apply the deep learning and delta VAC calculation as our new and novel selection method. Uh, the reason why we suggested the learning as our new uh, method, it is known as a um, great solver to classification problem, and it can determine the color criteria in multi-dimensional space, whereas color selection is determined by two-dimensional color space. And it also enables us to separate objects based on non linear boundaries, and which can be optimized by training process. And by the way, the computing time for demanding selections is much shorter than acid bidding, and it is very useful um, to select rare, rare objects in astronomical big data. And the data information criterion is a criterion to select the preferable model to observe the data. This criterion considers, considers then the likelihood and the number of data versus the number of parameters. So, um, um, uh, as you know, the film widget become better as the number of model parameters increases. So, 
if you want to compare the film result from from models with different uh, with different K, we should you uh, we should give a penalty to the model with a large K and in, uh, and other uh, calculate on Bayesian information criteria. Uh, the difference in Bayesian information criterion between models of the delta VIC indicate the uh, indicate how much the observed data is close to a uh, given model. So in our definition, if delta VIC is larger than 10, we consider a um, candidate as our promising k candidates. In our previous work, in 2020, we performed acid feeding for uh, quasar candidates using drop and uh, quasar acid models, and we calculated delta VIS values. And we found that the candidates with large delta VIS values are real quasars are managed by. So this suggests that it is efficient to this some quasar like candidates. So based on uh, deep learning and um, Bayesian information criteria, we searched for empty quasars. To achieve this purpose, we use the catalog of HSC as a video to video two. And this service comprises three layers depending on depth and area. Um, we use a deep layer, which is observed with two narrow bands as well as five broad bands. And the survey area is a 26 uh, square degree, and the five sigma depth per point source in I band is 26.7 molecules. Based on uh, deep engine data, we aim to make our case and responses one molecule deeper than previously um, reported UV luminous functions. Before applying our deep learning and data BIS calculations, we uh, pre-selected our candidates, so which have reliable photometry and appeared as a point source selections. Since we focused on quasars, which um, outshine the host galaxies, it is very important criterion. Then we pick up whether object, which is the prominent feature of how it is the quasars uh, due to the intergalaxy medium absorption. Then we trained the four uh, layers in your network, accepting six colors as its input and providing the probability to be quasars or non quasars as its output. Um, it is worth noting that the non quasars is a uh, non quasars comprised as a detected point source. So, uh, using the money model, we aim to exclude a uh, non quasar object from pre selected quasar candidates. And the performance of deep learning is shown in, in computer metrics. And as you can see, the two, two positive rate, the ratio of quasars classified, classified as quasars by deep learning is close to 100%. And surprisingly, the first positive rate, uh, which is related to contamination rate of our quasar survey by non quasar subject, is as low as 0.5%. Although the first positive rate of deep learning is extremely low, um, it cannot account for a difference in actual numbers of non quasars and quasars in the real world. So we adapted the delta BIC calculations as an additional step for uh, removing this class by the non quasars object. And we performed acid feeding using quasar and star acid models and calculate the delta VIC values. So as a result, we exclude the considerable um, candidates with delta VIC values less than 10. And we visually inspected the HSC FSFP images of VIC selected quasar candidates and the visually inspected quasar candidates are expressed in black diamonds on these plots. And these candidates have a bimodal uh, distribution in um, absolute molecule in prime possible contamination by Langham break galaxy. So we consider quasars with a brighter than minus 22 mag as our final quasar candidates. Based on our, our final quasar candidates, we built quasar luminous function and reddish pipe, which in minus 22 mag with our white wavelength data, which is one magnitude deeper than previous UV luminous functions. And we um, 
we derived the Stockholm tender slope of minus 1.6, uh, which is a constant with the previous surveys. And based on um, low number density of brain to quasars, uh, we concluded that quasar did not significantly uh, contribute to the ionizing background. And we also found that clear difference of the number density, uh, the bank part of the crazy luminous functions between uh, ours and the one of the galaxy are reduced to five. Uh, this might imply the contamination rate of private galaxies. Then we check the efficiency of our KJ selection process by estimating contamination and the recovery rate. First, we uh, estimate the crazy, uh, estimate the galaxy contaminations by applying eye selection and color selections to spectroscopically confirmed lineup by galaxies. Among eight galaxies, uh, three galaxies satisfy the need of 2020 color selections, whereas uh, our selections select only one galaxy. Uh, I think this is but this is based on small number statistic. Uh, it might imply our selection is more effective as a planning quasars from random by galaxies. Um, so to figure out the reason why our selection is more effective, we uh, normalize the LCD of quasars and random by galaxy to the iban proxies. And we found that the quasars we don't have more intrinsically rather continuum than those of uh, random by galaxies. This distinctive feature is properly sampled, cannot properly sampled by a selection using two or three colors at maximum. However, our selection using other colors can select this, uh, can trace this feature. Um, we um, estimate the recovery rate of known cages. In our survey area, there are six known cages and three promising candidates. And uh, unfortunately, the delta BIC calculation, this is one um, quasars and one candidate, uh, giving the, uh, resulting in the risk rate of 22%. However, when we add the near infrared and medium band data, the delta BIC values can be increased from five to 50. So this emphasizes the uh, emphasize the importance of using multi-ray dense data. Then uh, we used since we used the demonic as an alternative selection method to color selection, so we can we want to compare uh, the performance of demonic to that of the color selection. So we calculate the confusion matrix for two methods, and as you can see, the demonic has a very um, high true positive rate and extremely low first positive rate. However, color selections have very low um, true positive rate, which is close to 30%. This is because color selection is only effective for finding creatures at specific body shift range. Uh, so if we want to find creatures or rare creatures regardless of their body shifts, um, it is better to use deep learning than, than color selections to increase the chance to uh, find the bank pages. Then this is our sum summary for our work. And uh, I think we expect the combination of our efficient selection method and the um, general facility uh, can uh, will have a great synergy on a distant crater service. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Suyan. And is there any questions to Suyan? Hi, uh, it was great talk. Uh, can you comment a bit on the sensitivity of your BIC uh, metric on um, imbalance in your training sample? Uh, could you repeat your questions? Uh, if you could comment on the sensitivity of your uh, delta BIC metric on the imbalance in your training sample. Delta BIC? Are you asking about delta BIC selected candidates or? No, I um I, I was just curious if um how this delta Bayesian information criterion 
depended on the imbalance in your training sample. Like, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Um, first of all, I yeah, great questions. Um, I do, I do, um. As you mentioned, there are imbalance problem in the training sample. So we used um, quasar motors, acid motors averaged between 4.5 to 5 to 5.5 as our quasar training sample. Because there are few quasar, um, real quasars in our survey area. Right, and, and, and how many, um... Contaminants did you have in your training sample? Um, so uh, we use the same number of the samples in quasar quiz class and then quasar class, about uh, 100,000 samples. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any questions from the audience or Slack? Mm -hmm. So now you have this optical imaging data. So do you have plan to apply for the Gemini spectroscopic follow-up? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. I will have to. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Let's Thank you. look again to Sian. Next speaker is Yong Jung Kim from Gyeongbuk National University. And he's going to talk about the searching for high Z brain quasars with IMS. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Can I test? Okay, good. Okay, let me start my talk. My name is Yong Jung Kim. Uh, I'm a Sejong Science Fellow at Gyeongbuk National University. Uh, first of all, thank thank for inviting me. Uh, thank for giving me a chance for the this kind of contributory in Gemini Science meeting after the last meeting in 2018. And today I will talk about the, the searching for highly faint quasars with the infrared red medium deep survey shortly in IMS. And I'm currently working with the Professor Myung Shin at Seoul National University and other guys related to the IMS project. Uh, thanks to the previous speakers, we already we already know that uh, why the quasars are important, especially in the early universe. And so I just briefly review the basic concepts here. This figure shows that the, the ionization state of the hydrogens along the cosmic time, and after the recombination, you know, most of the hydrogens are are remains in neutral, but at around the redshift six something, the after the, some stars and galaxies born. The, all the all no, nowadays all the hydrogens are in the ionized fully ionized um, yeah fully ionized and the, this figure shows the mutual fraction of the hydrogens along the cosmic time and as you can see such a transition uh, occurs have occurred along the very within a very short time along the rest of six and seven this means that the, the most of the hydrogens are already fully ionized at rest to more than six. And here the key question is that the rich object can keep this another the ionized hydrogen after the part of the reionization. You know, quasars are very bright even in U UV, so they, they are they are expected to provide enough UV photons to keep the ionized state of the hydrogen in the universe. But the problem is that the, the the right figure shows the UV emissivity of quasars, and but as you can see in this figure, there are a lot of scatters between the studies to cut to, to where they when which they drop the some UV emissivity. This is because of the level of the faint quasars. The left figure shows the differential UV emissivity along the as a function of the magnitude, and as you can see here. They, uh, they peak around the minus 23 absolute magnitude. But the problem was that it, uh, uh, 
just few, a few years ago, if there are not many places in this magnitude range. So this gives some someone a lot of uncertainty to when determining when we determine the number density in this magnitude range, giving some lot of scatters in the UV emissivity. So it is not it was not easy to constrain the place of the role in the ionizing that giving some this kind of ionizing process. So we we are targeted to find some what to find craters with the infrared medium roof survey, the shortly IMS. IMS is a um, near infrared imaging survey, which uh, using some wide field camera on the UCURT, and it covers over 100 square degree area. And in Y and J band, and J band depths, which is down to 23 of planet magnitude, is very relatively deeper than the, the all sky surveys. And combining this with the surface TLS survey, surface TLS optical data, uh, we have performed uh, some Highly crater survey as faint well as the minus, uh, minus 23 absolute magnitude at ratio 5 and 6. Um, as the previous speakers told, already mentioned, the high craters have a very steep and very clear line of break, as you can see in the left figure. But so this gives a very red, red broadband colors, and such a broad, such a broad, broadband colors are usually widely used for finding some. Irish craters in the previous studies. We also initially select the, the craters candidates using the broadband colors. As you can see in the right two figures, the, this figure show, these figures show the color color diagram, broadband color color diagram at ratio five and six. And as you can see, the craters are located on, at the bottom right of the, this, this diagram. We set the some selection criteria, color selection criteria, and we we we, we initially select the sixty nine and twenty five crater candidates at ratio five and six respectively. The problem is that the success rate of the crater identification with only broadband is very low. For example, only as the student said, there is about the thirty percent something at ratio five and six, and like that. So here we introduced a new method to improve the selection. The, the first idea was that the, the, the medium, including the medium band follow observation. Medium band here is, um, here has a band width of the 5, 500 Armstrong, and this gives a very more detailed, giving us more detailed optometry. For example, this figure shows the broadband and medium band photometry of the crater and drop stars. As you can see here, the broadband photometry of these two targets are very similar to each other, but when you see the medium band, we can easily distinguish it from the, the phasers from the, the interlocal like drop stars with this kind of color system. So the, uh, we adopted the color selection criteria in medium band, and as you can see here, this is some medium band color criteria, color, color diagram that we used, and you select like this kind of the objects from the, our targets. Among the 69 crazy candidates at which the five, uh, 33 satisfied our criteria, so we take this set of plausible candidates. In the case of the rest of six craters, uh, we introduced another method that uh, about the, using the information criterion. Information criterion usually prioritize the models for a given data set. And here we use the corrected archaic information criterion, shortly AICC, because AICC is known to be very powerful for the small data set. So we apply this AIC, apply this AICC to the IRS crater and late type star models and calculate and set our system criteria to this distinct uh, find some good samples. And seven out of 25 candidates were selected as a plausible candidates. Now we have our plausible candidates at ratio five and six. So, so we have performed uh, some, some, some spectroscopy to identify their true nature. Uh, uh, most of them are very faint, as faint as um, about the 23 of plenty magnitude. So it is not easy to observe them with a normal telescope. So we need a very large telescope, like some, so we use the, 
Jim Olson in Germany and IMAX on Magellan and DBSP on Paloma 200 inch telescopes. And as you can see here, it's remarkable that they are most of, of, of most of, yeah, 20 of them are identified by the Jim Olson Gemini. And so here I greatly thank for the for Cajun Design School at Hathi and Jamie Observatory for this kind of the achievement. So the right figure shows our 24 IMS quasars as faint as the minus 23 magnitude. And with this quasar, so we checked our method with the method. First, we checked uh, some medium meta follow method. And it's amazing that it, uh, among the 33 medium band associated candidates, uh, 32, so it's, so it's two are uh, identified as a ratio five quasars, including the previous or known ones. And Unfortunately, there are some five quasars that are not that are not selected by our criteria, but this is due to the it's the medium band the imaging depths. So we 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 yeah they they deserve to be missed. And in natural the uh, inclusion of the medium band critically highly improved the determination of the potentiometric redshift of only a increase of the one or two percent. And this gives the prospects for the future medium band survey for all sky, like 70 years like that. And the second one is the AICC selection. And uh, among the seven AICC selected candidates, we obtained all the spectra of the band, including some known ones. And, and five of them are, no, are identified as uh, ratio six quasars. And this is a relatively higher than the 30% that I mentioned before. But for the, the other for the non-selected candidates, we cross-check them with the HSC optical data, which is one magnitude deeper than our data. Among the 25 color, for the, I'm sorry, relevant color selected candidates, 14 candidates are also covered by the HSC, and there are two quasars satisfying the AICC selection. It is interesting that the, the, both of them are have a very red colors both both in our data and HSC, as you can see here. The right figure shows the color. Yeah, the right figure shows the blue band colorful diagram, and the, the these two are uh, have a very both red colors. Even even we check even on the HSC data. Note that this blue line is the expected colors of the quasars. So and they are. In concept, they are consistent with the expectation. On the other end, the other twelve candidates with with that are that are selected by the AI system so they have a have a red red sorry red colors in our data, but with a more deeper data deeper HS data, they move toward to those stellar locus like that. This means that they are not likely to be uh, Irish quasars. So, so this this suggests that the, our our method is very effective for searching the the quasars at the survey detection limits, considering that the, most of them are very faint ones, are having some twenty three apparent magnitudes like that. So, with this data, we now want to we now want to, to estimate the number density or quasar limit function at five and six. Uh, this. Figure and this slide shows some some survey complements and the selection functions and this means that the, the how the quasar models can be selected with our data and our selection method we calculate this survey complements to finally calculate the estimate the number density. I just skip the details here. Uh, so with this the survey complements and the the selection functions and the, our discovered quasars including the Quasars, yeah, we really derive the quasar luminous functions at ratio five and six. We estimate the beam in the QLF and the parametric QLF, and uh, this figure so that the, the results at ratio five and ratio six on the right. And our results are shown as the red symbols, like the red circles in the left figure with the, some red solid lines, and also red circles on the right figures, right figure. And as you can see here, our results uh, are show that the, the in this faint magnitude range, they they have a very faint, faint, they have a very flat, faint and slow like this. And this is much lower than the, the previous results from the, the the surveys that covering only the less than the ten square degree area. 
we also check the there's some partial we also check the uh, partial number densities with from our surveys and concluded that the uh, such a high number density from the previous works are works are due to the small survey area and they may oh, they may they might overestimate it might be overestimated and so this and uh, note that the, the our results are in line with the results from the wide field surveys. And using the, this number density, so we now to calculate the UV emissivity of quasars, whether to, to see the quasar role in the ionizing process. Uh, we assume the very simple quasar UV spectral shape, and using the quasar linear function, we calculate the UV emissivity. As I mentioned in the introduction, there are a lot of sketches in the UV emissivity on the cosmic time. And our results are shown at this red things. Yeah. But if we focus on the very focus on the data from the uh, wide field survey, uh, we you can see that the, the all the results are in line with the model, shown as the some lines that uh, the UV emissivity decreases as ratio goes higher. And this goes higher, yeah. So we Sorry, if we conclude that the, the such a trend is uh, our our results are in line with this trend. And another previous study is derived the 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 photon density required for keep required to keep the ionized state of the hydrogen and from various methods. But here I show the two methods from and which are shown as the gray scales and gray shaded regions. Compare these. Comparing by comparing this with our results, we, uh, it, our results show that the quasars can only provide 10% of the required photons at ratio five and less than 3% at ratio six. So we, we concluded that the, the quasars alone couldn't provide enough UV photons to keep the, all the all the hydrogen, the ionized state of the for ionized hydrogen after the epoch of the realization. And according to the another studies, maybe the star forming galaxy, the star, right, the star forming galaxies may play a key role for this kind of process. So here's a summary of my talk and thank you for your listening. Yeah, and please feel free to take any questions. Thank you. Is there any questions? From audience, flag. Any questions? Okay, so then you said that quasars is not the main driver for the ionizing the AGM. Yeah. Then. Yeah, they are. They are not up to. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. The number density is not up to. Give some enough photons and then what source are the main contributor to this ionizing? Yeah, actually, other studies say that the, the star forming galaxy may play a key role to provide the UV photons, but the problem always the problem is that the, the escape fraction of the Lyman continuum photons does to satisfy the, the criterion that I mentioned that the, here, that the gray lines here. The star forming galaxies should have some very high escape fraction, like some 20%, something like that. But it's very, very high compared to nearby galaxies that having some 33%, 1%, something like that. So it's still not so but yeah, but we need to study more about that, that this to, to solve this question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thanks, Young Zhang again. Thanks. Now it's time to the uh, fresh talk posture. So poster fresh talk speakers, could you please come over here? Everybody.
Sorry. No. <laughs> Too late. Sorry. We'll go to the next one. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Kristen Chibukas uh, from Gemini North, and I'm the Fast Turnaround Program Lead. Uh, so the poster is just around the bend, um, but I just wanted to remind and encourage you all to get your fast turnaround proposals in. The deadlines are at the end of each and every month. Um, and there's one common misconception about fast turnaround um, that the science has to be urgent, and that is not the case. It just has to be good. So every one of you can submit your fast turnaround proposals. Uh, and the benefit of fast turnaround is that you can get your data in half the time as with regular queue. Uh, there are two caveats. Uh, so one is that the proposals do have to be reasonably short. Um, you probably don't want to request more than about 10 hours and less is better. Uh, and you do have to commit to reviewing eight other proposals in a peer review process. And if you don't think that you would have time for that, you can designate one of your co eyes to do the work for you. And this can be a student. Um, and student PIs can also act as reviewers. So this is actually a really good opportunity for students to get um, some experience with the proposal review process. So get your proposals in. Um, if you have any questions or if you have used Fast Turnaround before and have any suggestions for me, um, please do come talk to me or to any of the team members listed on the poster. Thank you. I don't, I don't know about that. Oh. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany, and I am a science operations specialist at Gemini North. I'm working on a project that looks at how Altair, which is our adaptive optics unit at Gemini North, handles on-axis extended objects. Uh, it struggles sometimes to guide with the natural guide star or laser guide star option because extended objects are different than the expected point source. They have a reduced magnitude within the aperture. They have a wider field of, view, uh, sorry, a wider full width half maximum, and they have an increased sky background. So we're looking at past successful and failed observations to try and better constrain um, the characteristics of these objects so that PIs can have better guidelines uh, for a successful on-axis extended object observation in the future. Um, you can come see my poster during the coffee break or look at the PDF online to see our results. And uh, this is work ongoing. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Emmanuel. I'm a postdoc at CASI. So this is about a stacking experiment that we set up to investigate the star formation uh, history up to a redshift of 1.6 in the alias N1 using data from the GMLT at 610 megahertz. Uh, to that end, we have investigated the specific star formation rate as a function of Yeah, the second slide. Yes, as a function of uh, mass and as a function of redshift. Now, at the depth and the sensitivities that we prove, these data pro uh, provides the first look of what will be achieved by key programs on the Meerkat, the South African Meerkat, and eventually the SKA. So, as such, uh, the uh, sources that we probe here uh, provide a good target for uh, follow up with uh, Gemini in the studies of uh, star forming galaxies at high redshift. So please come around and let's have a chat. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joseph Choi or Choi Hun and I'm um, a PhD candidate at the University of Oklahoma. 
So I present to you the um, first systematic study of a large um, sample of quasar outflows observed in um, the broad absorption lines. So we analyze a spectra of 50 broad absorption line or BAL quasars using our um, spectrosynthesis code called SIMBA. And we're able to obtain this um, excellent looking um, spectral model fits. And we're also able to constrain the various physical properties of these outflows, such as the locations and the mass outflow rate and their energies. And we're surprisingly we're able to find that these outflows are located not just in the vicinity of accretion disk, but actually located um, near the um, obscuring torus and all the way out to the host galaxy size scale of kiloparsec away from the central supply supply coil. And uh, we also included the information um, about the accretion properties of these quasars obtained from the um, wrist frame optical emission lines. And we were able to find this very um, robust evidence that there's two populations of these um, quasars within our sample. So compared with the um, unabsorbed um, comparison sample, they were able to find a low accretion rate objects and high accretion rate objects. And on top of that, when we um, included, when we looked at the outflow properties, they were able to see that these two populations actually do show a very different um, outflow properties. So come see our poster and ask any questions if you have any. Hi, I'm Songjae Kim from uh, Kasi and UST as a PhD student. Uh, uh, in our po in my poster, uh, I we found Bidaya uh, bright dust obscure galaxies in Akari Pier South, and we then we uh, performed the Bidaya spectroscopic follow for our high hyperluminous dust obscure galaxies using uh, Gemini South Flamingo two, and from the uh, NIR spectroscopic survey, we uh, estimated a uh, uh, supermassive black hole mass using broad HR up to 10,000 kilometers per, sec per second. And uh, finally, we, we also uh, present uh, optical spectroscopic data for our two peculiar subscale galaxies with Gemini's uh, South Gemos. Yeah. Come to my poster and uh, welcome to comment and yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm Karen Laley from the University of Oklahoma, and I uh, want to mention something about our spectral synthesis method for, for analyzing broad absorption line quasars. In the plot, you see the black line is the data, and uh, while on the right side, uh, the spectrum looks like a quasar spectrum, that's a, actually a Gemini uh, near-infrared spectrum. The one on the left side doesn't look like a quasar at all. That's because its spectrum is highly obscured by thousands of iron two lines. And uh, what Symbol does is it's a, spec it's a forward modeling method that can uh, analyze this, this can, can treat this problem. That is that in broad absorption line quasars, the lines can be heavily blended. You can't identify individual lines. The red line shows the model. Um, you can see it's an excellent fit. And this object, there actually was a, uh, a press release, Gemini press release, because this object has a outflow kinetic luminosity that is a record holder of more than uh, 10 to the 48th ergs per second. Um, and there is a bright future. There's like infinite number of questions we can probe. What I'm showing here is how the uh, broad absorption line outflows um, that we've analyzed uh, compared to other outflow channels, uh, the data is from uh, from the other channels is from Fiori et al. 2017. The x-axis is the uh, outflow radius normalized by the dust radius, so that one is approximately the torus. The y-axis is the uh, uh, maximum velocity. And what you can see is that uh, the x-ray uh, outflows and the other outflows, but the Remarkable thing is the broad absorption line quasar span at large rate range, and this is really just the beginning that we have, you know, 
30,000 spectra in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that we can potentially analyze and really find out what the contribution of bowel outflows is potentially to feedback and find links between feeding and feedback. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Reinaldi. I'm coming from Universidad Nacional de La Plata and Instituto de Astrofisica de La Plata too. This is the work done by Ivan Lopez. Ivan was a student in my faculty, but now he's a PhD student in Bologna. The main point here is that he developed a multi-fitting, multi-purpose fitting tool in order to fit spectral, spectral data cubes originally from Spitzer, but the tool is, sorry, the tool can be applied to other data sets um, like James Webb or anything else. And well, if you want to talk about the, the uh, tool itself, uh, you have the contact of Ivan and we all have applied, the, the first results are applied to M58 and the entire sing samples, the sing samples of a nearby AGNs detected by Spitzer. Um, well, we can talk about it later because I have to talk about another poster too. <laughs> this is us B2. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, these results are about um, that we have detected the, the second one radio weak blaster, which in turn was the first radio weak blaster candidate. Um, we were studying their emission about several wavelengths and studied several parameters that characterize uh, the um, radio loudness of this object. And we have found effectively that it is a BL lag object and it is radio weak. So I invite you to read the poster and talk about our main results because here there are some preliminary results, but the work is already done. And we are very, very happy with this result because it might open a new branch in the AGM family. So thank you very much. But there's a uh, Hello everyone, I am Raja Khatu. I completed my PhD defense about a month ago at the University of Western Ontario, and I'm presenting today on a highly accreting active galactic nucleus, Mercurian 142, that I studied as part of my PhD. So the big picture science question is how highly accreting active galactic nuclei, or AGN, grow, and we used Mercurian 142 for the case study. We have photometric data of the continuum emitting region in the UV and the optical, and simultaneous optical spectra covering the edge beta broadline from the Gemini North Observatory and the Lijiang Telescope in China. The technique we used is reverberation mapping that takes advantage of the variability in AGN in order to probe their size scales. We modeled the continuum and emission lines in both Gemini and Lijiang spectra to measure the edge beta line profile and we performed cross-correlation analysis using a Python-based running optimal average technique to derive a UV time lag for the edge beta emission. And if you want to learn more or have further questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions on the Slack. So please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. I'm a PhD student from the University of Tokyo. In this poster, I would like to report on a spectroscopic program to search for dual quasars. Here I'm showing the HS image of 10 of our confirmed dual quasars in this program, and their distributions in the redshift versus separation diagram. Among the 10 confirmed duals, our Gemini programs contributed half of them. Here I'm showing two spectrum taken by Gemini GMOS North and one taken by Gemini NIFS. And with the spectroscopic data, we estimated the black hole properties of these systems and found they are very similar to those single quasars in SDSSDR14Q. Then we decomposed the HSC quasar images into point source 
and the surgical profiles, then fitted uh, SEDs to, using Seagull to the host magnitudes and calculated the stellar masses. Taking the stellar masses and black hole masses of these steel quasars, we compared that to the local relation, which is a black solid line here, and we found the mergers are bringing these systems above the local relation, therefore they tend to have overmassive black holes, and we found the same tendency in horizon AGN simulation. Hello everyone, I'm Alberto Rodriguez Ardila from Brazil, and in this poster we investigate the iron two emission in active galactic nuclei. Iron two contributes to more than 350,000 emission lines from the UV to the near infrared and spectral regions. The blending of such a large number of emission lines produces a pseudo continuum that affects the measurement of other spectral properties in AGNs. For this reason, it is essential to fully understand this emission. Also, because of the difficulty in modeling the iron 2 spectrum, we want to find out other ions that share similar physical properties to constrain the iron 2. Our results show that O1 and the calcium 2 triple emission lines in the BLR are suitable alternatives. I will be very happy if you take a look to this poster and please let me know if you have any question. Thank you. Okay, so let's give a hand for all the poster flash um, speakers and everybody in the morning session. Hello, everyone. I am Raja Katu. I completed my PhD. I, I really encourage people to go on Slack and interact with those folks who have um, submitted virtual posters and to follow up on some of the conversations that uh, you may not be able to conclude. Please go on Slack and interact there. And also, of course, the speakers go and check to see if you have any any questions. Okay, so this is going to seem like a little bit of a wedding, but um, the organizers have uh, brought a cake to help us celebrate Ghost First Light, and it has uh, been a long time coming as the uh, instrument arrived right before the pandemic shutdown hit, and so there's a lot to celebrate. And so to kick us off, we have Kim Ben online and Director Jen Lutz, as well as Associate Director. Um, why don't you just introduce yourselves instead? Uh, hi, I'm Frederick Rantakura. And I guess that's my last name, which is the complicated part. But yeah, I'm the Associate Director for Chile Operations. So should I start with the... Yeah, no, I just want to say... Kim, she'll start. Okay. Go ahead, Kim. <laughs> We're uh, going to let you have the first word. Sure. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is just an introduction, right? So um, my name is Kim Van. I'm at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. It's just about as hot here today as I think it is there. Uh, but I really wish that I could be there. And uh, I'm really sorry that I'm not there with you now. Um, thank you so much for getting the cake. I'm really excited to uh, ask Federico to bring some back to Victoria with him. Um, so maybe I'll just start by saying it's been a long haul for Ghost. Um, Ghost had the unfortunate uh, luck of having many of its main components on a shipping container, leaving Victoria, coming down to Chile in uh, February of 2020. And so we're so pleased uh, that we've been able to make this progress and have Ghost First Light and be working well along our way towards commissioning. So I just wanted to say a great thank you to uh, the whole Ghost team for sticking with us and for all of the hard work of, that it's taken to, to reach it to this point. And of course, thanking to the Gemini staff for, in the South for their support and the development team. Patrick, would you like to say a word? Yeah, I just would like to thank everybody involved because it's really a team effort that we have the external Ghost builders and construction team. We have the science and engineering group. We have the development and all of us work together to really make the commissioning come out really perfectly. It was uh, played by really poor weather. Um, so basically the we, I, we assigned a week of uh, plan time to, to get the first light. And basically that first week was just thick clouds and we couldn't even open the telescope. But 
it was extended and we had the three nights of actually clear skies before we got clouds and snow again after the run and it really showed the preparation of everybody involved that in three nights we could get the first light and test out the full system so it's really a, a great work done by all people involved so i would like to thank you big applause for all of them Kim, would you like to say a few words before we cut the cake? <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm super confused. Am I? Can I say thank you to the ghost? Yes, team? please, please. Speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just super confused because Chris is online as well. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we really believe that this ghost instrument, um, that the design is world class the best in its of its category. We think the throughput combined with the new focal lane, focal plane and a slit process uh, and the fact that it goes way into the blue simultaneously is really gonna make this the high res spectrograph like of its of its class. Um, and and uh, you know, as you'll see in my talk, um, I, we think that we've really squeezed a lot out of graces. I can think of a lot more we're going to be squeezing out of ghost in the next uh, five to 10 years. So thank you everybody so much for your patience, for building it, for the commissioning. Really, really excited to uh, get some science out of it next. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Kim. Chris, would you like to say a few words? I'll, uh, I'll echo this a little bit in my talk and a little bit later, but uh, uh, being down there for commissioning, I just want to say that we're very grateful for all of the help that and support that Gemini has offered, especially over the past few months, um, just making the entire assembly and uh, integration and commissioning of Ghost, uh, the commissioning run of Ghost, very uh, successful and also uh, safe during COVID. Um, it, was a, it was a great opportunity to go down there and work with you all and uh, very much a pleasure. Thank you. I wish we could send you some cake. <laughs> so, all right, um, Janice, are we good to, to go? Yeah, everyone okay. should enjoy some cake and then we'll have two ghost talks following the break. All right. Hey, thank you all. Enjoy some cake.
I'm looking for Matt Taylor and Ricardo Salinas. If you're around, can you come up to the podium, please? Matt Taylor, Ricardo Salinas.
Thank you. Super adapter. So we can do this really fast so that we can take a break. Uh, mm -hmm. But the first three talks, the first two talks are both. Yes. Um, and then Billy. Yes. So the three, they're all online lessons that you will need to tell them when they only have five minutes. Yeah, I'll do the star thing. Yeah, but I think Matt, Matt should tell them. He should tell them you will get the signal. Yeah, he's going to. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, then there's only a three person. Every time before the talk, Matt will go up and introduce every speaker. Yes. And you're also, I'm sorry, you're the whole day, right? Yeah, I think that was the arena plan, but that's fine. Okay. He came prepared two times. Two times. The next day, I'm going to. Again. And everyone else is in person. All right, so that's, that's easier. We could check the, the Slack. So they should know that they're logging in. I think we tested Billy this morning. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay. Yeah, let me find the Zoom. Let me find the Zoom and then I'll take that. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Let's save some time, thank you.
Mm-hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's uh, definitely important. Uh, so we have a Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, I think that's uh there's
Sorry? Yeah, I have all the, the, the different. Uh, oh, oh, why is this reconnecting? Okay. Yeah, no, but you're going to mention them about the, 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 yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, the five minutes. So, but okay, I should suppose to take the time as well, I guess, to keep the time. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, for the in-person, in yeah. Uh, okay, you know how to put the stars on, yeah? Yeah, they annotate and yeah, there's okay, yeah. Yeah. stamps, yes. Oh, man. Okay, uh, starting a little bit late, but uh, we're just going to let the philosophy people uh, grab their cake. Uh, but while they do that, I'll uh, get through some housekeeping. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Matt Taylor. I'm a faculty at uh, University of Calgary, but I was a former Gemini Science Fellow at uh, Gemini North. Uh, so many of you I know, and I'm really, really happy to see all of you again. Um, so this, uh, I'm happy to chair this, the first part of this session, the uh, Stellar Populations and Star Formation session. Uh, along with Ricardo, who will be monitoring the online traffic, uh, just as a reminder to the speakers, uh, the online speakers, uh, Ricardo will give you a uh, five minute warning by annotating your slides with a gold star. The gold star means it's a great talk, but it also means that you need to start wrapping it up. Uh, for the in-person talk, uh, I will give a very, very highly technical uh, 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 five minute warning with uh, this piece of technology called the human hand. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get going with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Chris Hayes from uh, HAA in Victoria, and he's going to be telling us about the first results from science commissioning of the Gemini High Resolution Optical Spectrograph, GHOST, uh, to which we're all eating cake for right now. So uh, Chris, please take it away. Hello, everyone. All right, well, the uh, slides are coming up. Okay, here we go. Am I good to control? Can you all hear me all right? Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, let's make sure that I can control here. Yep, okay. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hayes, and I am a postdoc at the NRC Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to talk to you all today about the uh, Gemini High Resolution Optical Spectrograph, GHOST. Uh, our commissioning run and uh, some of the first data that we've gotten for it. So starting off, GHOST is the next generation fiber-fed high-resolution optical spectrograph for Gemini South, uh, and it's been a long time coming. The original call for proposals uh, that GHOST turned into was back in 2011, and over the next 10 years, it was developed, built, and uh, shipped down to uh, Chile in spring of 2020, where it's uh, had to unfortunately sit for two years, as you heard, due to uh, COVID restrictions. But uh, fortunately, over the past few months, we've had a great team come down to uh, Chile to assemble it and uh, verify it and then uh, let us do our commissioning run. So GHOST is a project that is led by the Australian Astronomical Observatory, but effectively it's a partnership between AAO, who developed the Cassegrain unit for GHOST, the fibers and the electronics, uh, the Australian National University, who developed the software and data pipeline, and then NRC Hertzberg, who developed the spectrometer. And of course, a, a team is nothing without its members. Uh, so I'd just like to show uh, some of the faces of the people who put in all of this hard work over the past few months to uh, put GHOST together. And of course, thanks goes out to uh, many others, uh, both past and present on the GHOST team. So now there is a GHOST down at Gemini South. 
So here you can see this uh, giant black box is the outer enclosure of Ghost, uh, sitting down there in the peer lab underneath Gemini South. And not only does it look really nice, but it also produces really nice looking spectra. So here you can see the blue camera and the red camera from Ghost uh, taking images, uh, taking spectra of a chemically peculiar star. And this was all released as the uh, first light images from uh, Noir Lab last week. And in the bottom here, you can see a nice flat fielded spectrum of this star from this uh, commissioning run data. So I'll talk a little bit more about this star later, but uh, to um, give you a little bit of a uh, brief on the ghost commissioning run itself. Uh, so it was originally scheduled for nine nights at the end of June, so only about a month ago. And uh, unfortunately, the weather looked a lot like the background here. Um, so we had a lot of clouds at the beginning of the run, and uh, not only clouds, and something you can't see here is very high winds. So this is a little snapshot we took of a gust of wind at 40 meters a second. This is about 140 kilometers an hour. So we had nice windy, cloudy weather for the uh, first part of the run. And by the uh, eighth night, we had only opened the telescope up twice, but neither were very good conditions. You could really only see the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, Gemini graciously extended our commissioning run by three nights so that we could uh, finish up all of the tasks that we needed to do, uh, which as it turned out, uh, after several nights of poor weather, we got three excellent nights that were enough to cover all that we needed with the commissioning run tests and uh, give us some of the data that I'll share with you today. So before I jump into the data itself, uh, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a walkthrough of um, how Ghost works and some of the unique features of Ghost. So starting at the telescope, we have the slit unit for Ghost, which you can see here. There are two positioners for Ghost here and here. And on each of these are small 1.2 arc second diameter IFUs that map from here on the, uh, at the positioners into two pseudo slits of fibers at the spectrograph. So the first slit here with these wider fibers maps into two object IFUs, and this gives us our standard resolution mode of about 50,000. So you can do up to two objects in this 50,000 standard resolution mode. The other slit that has these more narrow fibers goes to a single high resolution, 75,000 resolution object IFU and an accompanying sky IFU, whereas the uh, sky IFU for the standard resolution sits in between the two objects in the pseudo slit. Along with uh, an object and the sky, you also have a thorium xenon uh, internal calibration lamp that's fed by a single fiber into the spectrograph so that you can do simultaneous wavelength calibration and uh, for precision radial velocities. So once the uh, spectrograph takes, or once the, uh, the light goes down to the spectrograph, uh, we have the next uh, relatively unique component of Ghost, which is a slit viewer camera. So I've got an image of this slit viewer camera from the slit viewer camera down here in the bottom left. Uh, and the slit viewer camera takes a picture of these pseudo slits. So here you can see all of the fibers illuminated and there's actually a red and a blue copy on the slit viewer camera for the light that goes into the red and the blue science cameras. And this is useful for a number of different reasons, uh, more than I can get into in this talk, um, but particularly for the data reduction um, for precision radial velocities and for um, extracting your spectra more precisely to build up a better signal to noise. And the reason for this is that uh, for Ghost, in very poor seeing, the fibers will all be nearly uniformly illuminated, like you can see in this image here. But in cases of good seeing, because of the way that the fibers are organized, the light will be more centrally concentrated in your pseudo slit. And so if you look at the equivalent science camera image of something like this, you can see, some, you can see uh, three orders here of an object that's being observed in high resolution mode. So this is data that we took during our commissioning run. And you can see that the light is more concentrated towards the center of the order. And so by weighting these fibers higher during the data reduction, you can more optimally extract your spectra and get a better signal to noise by using the slit profile that you get from, your, from the viewer. You can also see here an illuminated thorium xenon uh, lamp fiber, which shows up in emission lines here above the spectrum. 
And the slip viewer camera is also helpful because you have different observing modes of ghost and you want to reduce them all with the same data reduction pipeline. So for instance, you can also observe with ghost in this dual target mode. So here you have two objects that are being observed, one that's fainter uh, on top and one that's brighter down here on bottom. And again, you're seeing three of these orders. And then you've got the sky fibers in between, which you can see here are actually illuminated. Uh, you've got an entire skyline that stretches across all three of these IFUs. And so having a, slit, having a precise slit profile from your slit viewer camera helps you with um, figuring out where these fibers and these, uh, this slit gets spread out across your spectrograph. So these are two of the observing modes of GHOST, high resolution uh, for, with the thorium xenon for precision radio velocities, and then two objects in your standard resolution mode. When you combine the two resolution settings of 50,000 and 75,000 with different on-chip binning modes, you can actually uh, get a number of different operating modes depending on the, your science of choice. So for instance, you can uh, increase the spatial binning if you don't need to keep that thorium xenon fiber separate from the rest of your object. Uh, you can increase the spatial, res the, uh, spatial binning so that, you, so that you can get a better signal to noise by reducing read noise. Uh, and you can bin in the spectral direction for the standard resolution because it's actually already oversampled and uh, that doesn't really lose you too much in terms of resolution. You can also push the binning a little bit further in the spatial direction. This is an example of a spec of a pair of stars that are observed with a, a factor of four binning in the spatial direction. Uh, you can see that they start to get close together when you highly bin in the spatial direction, but um, so you can push the binning further, but you wouldn't really want to do so with two objects. Uh, and we're exploring an option for observing with a more highly bin spectral binning that would give you a reduced resolution, but uh, might be interesting for some science cases. In terms of sensitivity, uh, here I have the sensitivity requirements of GHOST, uh, which are defined, these are the AB magnitude limits that uh, you need to reach signal to noise of 30 in one hour of observation. So it's something like 15 at the bluer end of GHOST's coverage, uh, and more like 17 and a half in terms of the uh, where GHOST throughput is highest. Now to give you a little bit of a comparison, so the red line here shows the requirements of GHOST as compared to uh, GRACE's, HiRes, and UVES, other high resolution spectrographs. And uh, in the dashed black line, I'm showing what is what was budgeted for GHOST originally. And in the dashed red line, you see the uh, predictions from the in-lab measurements of GHOST when it was uh, built, put together in the lab. And so the, uh, the fact that, we're, that this is so much higher than the requirements suggests that we'll easily exceed these, these requirements here and provide even higher sensitivity. Uh, and currently we're working on those on-sky measurements that we took during the commissioning run. Um, but that's a little bit more involved. So we will um, get back to you with more information on that in the future. So to show you a little bit of data from GHOST, uh, I would like to uh, show just a little bit of a gallery of objects that were observed during the commissioning run. So starting with uh, this spectrophotometric standard star. So it's a relatively boring star, but it provides us a good uh, set of images to show what you get from GHOST. So here you can see that you get a slit viewer camera image. You actually get many images with every observation. You also get a blue science camera image, uh, which you can see all of the individual orders going from red to blue. And you get a red science camera image with all of the spectral orders going from red to blue on this chip. And when you just do a raw extraction, this is what you'll get. Uh, so you can see all of the arcs, each color is a separate order and the arcs are from the blaze of the orders, but you can see the overall um, throughput combined with the spectrum of this star. And uh, you can see here the red orders and the blue orders. And you can see that there's a little dip in between because of the dichroic that splits the light between the two cameras. So looking at some um, fun objects. Uh, so here's the Stingray Nebula. So you've probably seen this image of the Stingray Nebula from HST. And on the right, I have a portion of the spectrum that we took from GHOST, uh, showing the Balmer series in emission, starting with Balmer Zeta, which has this nice horned profile. 
Uh, and I'm just going to let this play, and you'll be able to watch as uh, a whole bunch of Balmer lines go by, each getting lower and lower in intensity and closer together, as the Balmer lines should. Uh, because this is a planetary nebula, it has all of these uh, lines in emission. So you can get all the way out to Balmer 25, which is kind of fun. If you're interested in extragalactic astronomy, uh, here's an example of a redshift 3, something like a, uh, magnitude, a 17th magnitude quasar that was observed with ghosts during your commissioning run. And uh, you hardly need me to point out that in this blue camera image, you can see all of these absorption features that are from the Lyman Alpha Forest. And so uh, bear with me, this is still a work in progress, of course, because we've only had this data for a few weeks now. But uh, you can see here all of the uh, raw orders that are extracted, and you can see all of these absorption features, which I promise are not noise, because you can zoom in and look at all of these deep absorption features from the Lyman Alpha Forest. So going on to the, uh, the last one here, and this is my favorite uh, because I do uh, stellar astronomy. And uh, this is HD 222925. This is the star that was shown off as the, uh, press the first light press release from NOAA Lab last week. Uh, and this star is an R process enhanced star. So that means that it's enhanced in R process elements. These are heavy metal elements that are produced through high energy environments uh, like supernovae and neutron star mergers. And this star, which is otherwise a metal poor star, has a whole bunch of these elements in it. So it's a metal poor red giant. And just to focus on some of the normal aspects of metal poor red giants, uh, you can see here on this red camera image, you can see these two absorption lines that are the H alpha lines. Uh, it shows up in two orders. If you go redward on the camera, you can see the calcium triplet here in absorption. And if you go to the blue camera, the most obvious thing are these broad, deep absorption lines that are the calcium H and K lines and actually show up on two orders again. But you zoom in on the extracted spectrum, and you can see all of these absorption features uh, that are showing up. And this is because in the at blue wavelengths, you have a whole bunch of absorption from heavy metal lines. And just to zoom in on some interesting ones for this star, uh, this highlights a region around this europium line that is extremely deep. And you can compare it to iron, which is a more normal element, of course. And uh, you can see these really strong europium and other R process enhanced elements like yttrium, zirconium, gadolinium, dysprosium, samarium, some of these you might not have even heard of. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a comparison, uh, this compare, this is from Rotor et al. 2018 that compares this exact same star in black to a star that is not enhanced in R process elements in gray. And you can see just how much stronger these lines are in the star. And so this is one of the interesting things that we would like to do uh, with the groups here that I work with is to push this to fainter and fainter stars um, to do really interesting things. And just to leave you with one last note about uh, the spectrum. So this is the uh, full 1D spectrum, just as a reminder that GHOST provides simultaneous coverage of the entire optical wavelength range at high resolution, going all the way from about 3,500 out to about 10,500, so about 7,000 angstroms worth of coverage. And uh, with that, I will uh, just summarize in saying that uh, a lot of thanks goes out to the uh, staff at Gemini for making the integration, verification, and commissioning so successful and safe during COVID. Um, and uh, hopefully you will stay tuned for uh, more news about Ghost in the future and uh, when it will be made available to the Gemini community. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chris, for that uh, fantastic talk. Um, it's absolutely amazing how uh, how blue uh, Ghost is is going. Uh, are there any questions? And I'm actually going to go virtual uh, for the first time instead of going to the room first. No questions. You no know, questions virtually. Then let's go to the room. I'll take it. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, looking at the Ghost website, there's a mention of using it to do RV follow up of test planets as one of your science cases. Mm -hmm. And a statement that the expected RV precision is something like 10 meters per second. Given your resolution and the high resolution mode and the wavelength coverage, I would have expected that number to be a little better. And I'm wondering if you can comment on what is setting that limiting factor, if it's the lack of pressure, uh, pressure stability or the, I don't know, blue throughput, something like that. Uh, so I think in part, it might be a little bit blue throughput. Uh, I am not, unfortunately, an expert on the precision radio velocity work. So I don't think I can comment too much on that. Um, I, the, I can mention that the ghost instrument is very uh, temperature stable, um, but as far as uh, 
getting down to those extreme precisions, uh, I unfortunately don't have much more information. No so. worries. I'll go do some more digging online. Thank you. <laughs> I can put you in touch if you want with people who might be able to answer your questions, though, if you're interested. Oh, yeah. I will find you on the Slack and ask that question. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from the room? Anything online? There's the comment saying no questions, but great to see the beautiful ghost data. Oh, I think we Thank can you. all Please absolutely agree with that. Great. Thanks so much, Chris, for that uh, fantastic talk. Let's uh, thank Chris again. And uh, oh, thank you for the again. opportunity. That's a question. Uh, we, we have time if you, if you want to ask it quick. I'm sorry, but actually, I have a scientist question. So, if the ghost is available, so is there any specific software tool for the data reduction of the ghost data? So, right, yeah, Ghost is, is not currently yet available, and uh, there will be data reduction software that is currently in the works. Um, since the first data was only taken a few weeks ago, uh, we're starting to put the uh, data reduction pipeline through its paces and uh, get some of that ready to go. So hopefully that will be ready once uh, Ghost is available to the community. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on to our next speaker. Uh, I am absolutely pleased to reintroduce uh, Kim Venn, uh, again from University of Victoria in British Columbia. Uh, so Kim is going, uh, she's an invited speaker, I should say, and she is going to talk to us with a, uh, about a very intriguingly concise title, uh, just Metal Poor Stars. Hi everybody, I'm just waiting for the slides to come up. Okay, do I have control? Somebody there can tell me if I, ah, thank you, excellent. Um, thanks so much. First of all, it's uh, it's difficult to go to speak after Chris's talk because the ghost commissioning has been fantastic. Um, Chris captured that just beautifully. The range of objects that they observed during commissioning, the incredible um, success of the commissioning run, uh, and a special, a special thanks to uh, to everyone at Gemini for extending that run as well, so that they got the three good nights at the end of like eight or nine horrible ones. Um, so uh, I'm going to try anyway, though, uh, and be a little bit more general. Step back from just the commissioning of the instrument and talk about um, some some science. I hope that's what I was invited to talk about. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, thank you again to the organizers for allowing me to speak at this meeting, um, and especially remotely. Um, we have been using uh, Gemini instruments for some time now, mainly Graces, waiting for Ghost, um, and with a great deal of success. So I'd like to cover that and, and uh, kind of um, uh, direct you to where we're going with Ghost. I definitely want to acknowledge many of the contributions made by students and colleagues in Victoria and as part of the Pristine Collaboration who are named here. And um, uh, we'll get going. So let me see, does this work? Oh, please work. It worked. Ah, yes. All right. So before, before anybody can say anything, uh, you know, I'm sure you're all stunned by the JWST pictures, uh, as I am. And I thought I would start with one, because how can, how can you not? So this image from James Webb that came, it was the first one that I think it was uh, President Biden presented uh, two weeks ago, is, is simply stunning. It's showing galaxies at the highest redshifts when you combine imaging and spectroscopy. And James Webb, just like uh, where I'd like to go with talking about the metal poor galaxy, is interested in studying the early universe. So in this picture, in this image, uh, I don't know if you've taken these images and actually zoomed in for yourself, but I recommend doing it because it's super fun. And uh, there's this one galaxy in there that's a lens. So we know it's at high redshift, but um, I don't think the redshift for it has actually been published. And you can actually see little, little globular clusters uh, forming in it. So at least that's what we think. So, uh, you know, I just think this is amazing that we're going to be able to study the actual epoch of globular cl cluster formation. And as we've known for some time, those are not the most metal poor stars. They're old, but they're probably not the oldest stars. And so, you know, what I'm interested in are actually the oldest stars. So this is amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. But in the meantime, we can also still study our Milky Way to try to understand the early conditions in the universe by using metal poor stars. So if you take that simple timeline, Big Bang happens. Um, uh, uh, universe expands, uh, particles are made, uh, reionization happens it's after the dark ages, um, galaxies start to form, and then we're here today. 
if you look backwards at that, then you're doing galactic archaeology. If we can look at stars that formed earlier and earlier and earlier times, then we ought to be able to study stars that were forming when the galaxy was being built up. We should be able to study stars that formed maybe right after the first generation of stars that were enriched in only metals uh, from the first generation uh, supernovae. And so if we if we can find really metal poor stars, you know, things that were made of only hydrogen healing, that would be amazing, but we haven't done that yet. But if we can find metal poor stars, we should be looking at very early generations of stars. And that's the idea is that if we can look at things that have only a few metals, maybe they were in, enriched in only one or a few supernovae or only from a few generations, then we can use those little bits of elements to study which supernovae contributed, what was the mass like, what was the chemistry like, what was the distribution of this gas like, and actually start to study not only uh, formation of the Milky Way, but also origins of the elements. And so this is uh, where I'd like to go with the with my talk and why it's uh, loosely just called the, the Metal Board Galaxy. But before I go there, I mean, the summer has been amazing, right? Only last month, there was also the data release number three from Gaia. And that presented a bunch of incredible results uh, associated with galactic archaeology. So for one thing, object classifications for 1.59 billion sources, full astrometric solutions for 1.46 billion sources. So that includes positions, parallaxes, and proper motions. Astrophysical parameters for 470 million objects, uh, mainly from BPRP spectra, which is simply amazing. And this one image that I'm showing you is actually only a measly 32 million objects, um, but looking at an index that is associated with, uh, with reddening. So that's uh, amazing. And that index is actually based on, on uh, the RVS, the Gaia RVS spectra. So these spectra have resolution of about 11,000, only around the calcium to triplet region. And they were there to provide higher precision radial velocities, full stop. Radial velocities were the primary thing in order to have full, uh, chemo full dynamical phase space for uh, objects. Um, but also these, the, um, these RVS spectra are used for stellar parameters, metallicities, some chemical abundances for 5.6 million stars, uh, which was just published uh, you know, a few weeks ago. And, uh, and I want to show you this map because it's a little bit uh, odd because it's a metallicity map, but uh, RVS spectra are for the bright objects complete to only about G of 14, which means really they're the, they're the objects that are around us still in the solar neighborhood. So this metallicity map only goes to metallicity of minus 0.3, which is odd, uh, but you know, for the bright objects around us, that kind of makes sense. We're mostly looking at the disk here, even just up to solar metallicity. So we're not, you know, this map is hiding the metal poor stars that are available in Gaia. And so uh, just hit, oh, come on, oh, there we go. So if you really, I, I don't have time to go into this beautiful, beautiful image here from this uh, paper by the Guy Collaboration. But um, if you uh, separate all of those stars into quadrants, here's the galactic plane. You can go above the plane and below the plane towards the galactic center. Here's R towards the galactic center or away from the galactic center. And you can actually map out stars in the thin disk and thick disk. And the reason I want to put this image up here though, um, is simply to point out that um, Gaia does find stars down to metallicities of about minus 1.5, but not too many below that. And again, to G of 14th or so, metallicity minus 1.5, this seems to be roughly where Gaia is doing well. So one of my collaborators, Elsa Starkenberg, has recently been comparing SDSS metallicities with Gaia metallicities. And again, as you go fainter, so from G of 15 down to 16 to 17, at metallicity about minus 1.5 in SDSS, you can see that Gaia, especially for the fainter magnitudes, will go anywhere from minus, get a metallicity anywhere from minus four to about minus one. So for brighter objects, more metal rich, it's actually doing pretty well. But the, for the fainter objects and more metal poor, it's it's uh, you know very very large uncertainties and very few stars that are actually very metal poor. So the extremely metal poor ones around minus three or lower are the ones that we actually want if we want to study the early universe from cosmological models. Metallicities of minus three looks like most of those objects in our galaxy would have formed within well. 68% would have formed within about one gig a year, maybe a few up, uh, later. And so if we want to study the early galaxy, we really want to be studying extremely metal poor stars, which are those below metallicities of minus three. So Gaia is not going to do it. Instead, um, this is why there's still room for 
uh, photometric, <coughs> excuse me, uh, photometric surveys looking for metal pore stars. The one I've been involved with is the pristine survey, which is happening at the Canada France Y telescope, where a narrow band calcium a filter around the calcium H and K lines is converted into metallicities when combined with SDSS GNI data. This was the original calibration in the five years since 2017. We're now calibrating with Gaia data, Gaia. Uh, G, BP, and RP, and also being able to find revealing extremely metal poor stars. So pristine and Gaia have now been more coupled. Uh, and so there are other uh, surveys. There's a new survey coming out, JPASS, which will also uh, go a little bit deeper, I believe. Um, super exciting that these photometric surveys are so successful in finding extreme metal poor stars. But again, I'll just focus on pristine since this is the one that I've, I've been more associated with and also relates to Grace's uh, data. So as of June 2020, 22 last month. This was the pristine survey region of the galactic halo, plus a couple of individual dwarf galaxies and maybe globular clusters and a few objects, a um, few fields towards the galactic center. So we're really coupled now to Gaia and, um, and searching for metal poor stars to do chemodynamic analyses. So I've just hit return. And so at this point, uh, I'd really like to um, fast forward to data uh, from this data from Pristine plus Gaia that we've been following up at Gemini uh, with primarily Graces and soon to be Ghost. So the first significant follow-up that I want to discuss was uh, studying just Grace's spectrum, just two stars in the core of Triangulum 2. Triangulum 2 at the time, it wasn't clear if it was an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy or globular cluster. So by finding two stars that have different metallicities and that also look alpha poor, they really do have the chemical composition and, and signatures of of an ultra faint dwarf galaxy. I wanted to bring it up uh, today, even though it's a little bit old, um, because there have been more stars that have been uh, fainter that have been found and analyzed um, so that the there's a pr uh, an improved velocity dispersion now, which is a little bit lower, 3.4 rather than 5.1 uh, kilometers per second. This implies a mass to light ratio that's several thousand, whether it's 3000 or 2000, a lot. Very large dark matter halo. And I want to point this out because in our original, because of the GRACES data, which was observed in this epoch, we were able to see that one of these objects had no radial velocity variation, whereas the other one did. Uh, we were able to identify this object as a binary. And just recently, there's been an analysis of the velocity curve of this binary, where they actually can get the period of the binary and, um, and, and, uh, a and, and look at the impact of a binary on a very small velocity dist distribution. So the binary has uh, velocity velocity offsets of 20, tw roughly 25 kilometers per second, and the velocity dispersion is really, really much lower than that. So this really impacts your interpretation of velocity dispersion, which then affects what you would assume the mass to light ratio of this object is. So this is um, just a bit of a warning. Um, in this paper, they say this star actually doesn't affect it that much, but uh, I wanted to mention that because we're going to be looking at ultra faint dwarfs um, in the next few slides. Oh, please slides, come on. It hasn't gone forward for me, come on. Oh, I'm gonna risk it, I'm gonna press return one more time. I am not getting slides fast forwarding. Sorry guys, one more try. Ah, yay, okay. Hopefully it's not gonna fast forward much more. Um, sorry, then what I wanted to talk about was our, um, we're very, very fortunate to receive a large program for Grace's um, follow-up of pristine objects. The first of those papers was published last year as part of Colin Kilty's thesis, where we followed up on ex several extremely metal poor stars found in pristine. In the gray is the photometric metallicities that we found in pristine. In the in the red is actually the low resolution spectroscopic metallicities for the same distribution. So you can see that already we're finding that the spectroscopic metallicities are up to about 0.5 dex higher, but still these are all very metal poor stars. This is minus 2.5 here. So we just picked a bunch of the really metal poor ones, followed up with Grace's spectra, found some super interesting objects. These calcium poor ones, that's really odd. Um, these barium rich ones, that's less odd, but interesting. Some of the objects are in the Gaia Enceladus um, uh, merger remnant. 
And then some objects are even uh, in the galactic plane. So extremely middle poor stars, minus three stars in the galactic plane. So this is something Federico Sestito has been working on quite a bit to determine whether or not they're just part of the normal uh, spherical halo or whether or not these could be remnants of accreted dwarf galaxies. And I think Federico will be speaking a little bit more about that shortly. I want to point out one of them is even retrograde. <laughs> so it's in the plane, but going the opposite direction, uh, which I think is also pretty interesting. But I'll leave the rest of that discussion to Federico. Um, uh, Federico's also been following up with um, metal poor stars that we've been observing with graces in the galactic bulge. So I won't say too much about this because he's going to talk shortly. But the blue dots in here are the ones we have graces spectra for. Again, some of them are barium poor. One of them end up being barium, uh, sorry, barium rich, which is interesting. But the one that's barium poor is even more interesting since it falls into a region with other ultra faint dwarfs. Federico, don't worry, I'll stop there. And uh, I just wanted to highlight that one of the things that um, people discuss a lot is when you look at a star in the bulge, you don't know if it's just passing through the bulge or if it's actually born and raised and uh, you know formed in the bulge. And if we're going to study metal pore stars in the bulge, we actually want ones that form there because a lot of cosmological simulations suggest that that's where the first stars should have formed in our galaxy. So we're interested in following up on those. Federico is going to talk more about this. Um, this I, this uh, plot down here, which is the same as the mean um, uh, apocentric distances and Zmax values, uh, I think is super interesting because also when you look towards the galactic bulge, the distances from Gaia are a lot less certain. Um, you can see this in the Corn baylor jones um, distribution. It depends on what the um, potential looks like and how you interpret these. these. And so uh, I just wanted to point out something Federico did that I thought was fantastic and is buried in the appendix of his paper, um, is uh, actually try to take the mean distance and then uh, take plus or minus 0.1 kilometers, uh, uh, sorry, kiloparsecs, and look at what the difference in the orbital parameters would be. And I just think this was really lovely um, in the analysis. So I wanted to highlight that because I'm pretty sure Federico won't in his talk. Um, moving on, hopefully. Yes, um, probably the most uh, fun thing that we did was we discovered C19, the remnant of the most metal poor uh, star cluster. Thank you for the five minute warning. Um, and again, I also wanna thank Gemini and Noir Lab communications team and staff for helping us uh, with this press release, including making this image, there's C19 off to the bottom there. It looks like a disrupted uh, globular cluster that's just merging with our galaxy, or it's in orbit around our galaxy. Um, it was found as part of the Pristine Plus Gaia stream finder. So in, in galactic coordinates, gray is where Pristine is. These are the objects, um, individual stars that we were finding from the Pristine survey uh, noted by their metallicities. Down here, this is just taking um, uh, just which objects are associated together with C19. Uh, we followed up C19 with graces, these three objects with graces. Other ones with lower resolution spectra, La Most and uh, at um, uh, at the uh, I, uh, at G at, at the GTC, and basically we're finding that these objects are incredibly uh, constant in their metallicity around minus three point four. So if I show just a couple more slides from that. Uh, for C19, we found that the Bayesian distribution on the prior was really small, so the metallicity really, you know, it looks like a globular cluster with a single metallicity. And yet we found no variations in the iron or magnesium lines, but we found strong variations between at least one object in the sodium stellar lines. So we proposed based on the lack of a metallicity distribution and based on the um, sodium and magnesium abundances, C19 is a globular cluster, making it the most metal poor globular cluster that has ever been found. So this was super fun. It went uh, very viral, got picked up by a lot of news agencies and um, led to a whole bunch of interviews on like TV and radio, including one of the Gemini webinars. Uh, I want to highlight now what we're doing and where we're going with Ghost. So the thing that we've been the most interested in as we've been waiting for Ghost is using graces to analyze stars in the outskirts of northern ultrafaint dwarfs. For the great for the Ghost LP, we would like to be doing this in this in the southern um, ultrafaint dwarfs. And in this case, we're not using pristine at all. Um, Alan McConaughey determined a Bayesian analysis methodology to use Gaia data with uh, isochrones and CMDs in order to try to determine members of ultrafaint dwarfs, including out to very high 
uh, galactocentric um, half-light radii. So with Fletcher Waller, who's a, a master's student at UVic, we've been determining abundances and finding that all of these objects that we've analyzed so far are actually members of the ultra, ultra faint dwarf galaxies that we've been looking at in the north. And this is interesting because in Tucana 2, for example, there was a nature paper earlier this year where there was one object found at nine half-light radii, uh, as well as another one at kind of two and six. And, and what's so interesting is that if if these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies are survivors of the earliest galaxies and formed in uh, very high mass to light ratios with extended dark matter halos, then the objects at, at their cores within the inner two half-light radii would have been things that may have continued to undergo star formation and, and undergo some enrichment, whereas things that are beyond two half-light radii almost certainly were part of the first generation of stars that formed in these objects. And if these are the oldest surviving dwarf galaxies uh, from the early universe, and these are the objects that we really do want to study in order to um, in order to understand the early um, star formation, chemical evolution, in and, and re as close to the epoch of reionization as possible. So I wanted to mention this because this is exactly what we plan to be doing with Ghost, um, as as everyone has already seen, for, and especially from Christian's amazing talk. Uh, Ghost has this is an old image, the um, the but relative to lab specs, the ghost throughput is not too far off that which was expected. Um, I put in here a little block for where Grace is, uh, where the throughput is not as good and where the wavelength um, range is tiny uh, compared to what ghost will be able to do. And uh, I also wanted to put down here from our ghost LP, from Alan's analysis of um, Southern ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, especially as we go to fainter and fainter magnitudes, we have hundreds and hundreds of targets in uh, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies in the South that have never been observed, many of them at very high um, outer uh, half-light radii. So we're super excited to get started on our, our LP. Uh, and, and also just to highlight what Christian said, from a paper by Ian Roder just a few months ago, this is the ghost spectral, re uh, sorry, Grace's spectral region versus the full ghost spectral region and beyond. And you can just see in this blue spectral region, which is which is uh, you know has amongst the highest throughput of any high resolution spectrograph I've yet seen, is where many of the chemical elements lie, especially of the heavy elements that are so important for distinguishing the different supernovae that may have contributed. Uh, as as first stars. So uh, I, th I know I've run out of time. I'm just so grateful to all of you for the opportunity to talk to Gemini for the commissioning of Grace for for purchasing and commissioning uh, and and choosing Grace's uh, sorry, ghost and uh, super, super excited to uh, start working with it um, uh, for just its um, its its straight up abilities as an amazing uh, high resolution spectrograph. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Kim. I think uh, we can both get, to, we can all get excited about uh, uh, graces and ghost equally, um, but uh, let's all focus on ghost anyway. Uh, any questions in the room uh, for this fantastic talk? Anyone? Oh, Janice? Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. Wonderful Hi, talk. Dennis. Hi. Um, about C19. So the main argument for it being a remnant globular cluster instead of some old dwarf galaxy is just mainly the homogeneity in the abundances and star formation, presumed star formation history. How watertight is that argument? Yeah, it's a great, I, I skipped over the, the worst controversial part of it. Um, the, yeah, the absolute precision, there's no velo There's no metallicity dispersion. That's very unusual. We have eight objects that all have metallicities of about minus 3.4, plus potentially a few others. And so with no metallicity dispersion at all, that would be very unusual for a, a, an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy. But then on top of that, you can see uh, sodium to magnesium, well, sodium variations. And so sodium variations are also a characteristic signature of globular clusters. Every globular cluster that we've looked at uh, that's a bona fide globular cluster has uh, stars, has first, sec first and second generation or 
uh, uh, stars in it. So you can actually see these sodium variations. But again, I mean, there's other possible variations, uh, aluminum, which we can't observe with graces because there are no aluminum uh, absorption lines. But with ghost, we can ghost the aluminum lines around 3,900, which is available to ghost. Um, we can we can we could see. Whereas in graces, we don't get that spectral region. So there's so many re reasons that ghost is going to be so much better uh, for these analyses. We'll actually get decent, like you know, the the range of chemical abundances that are needed to confirm uh, their uh, you know objects as globular clusters, as dwarf galaxies, or even right down to the mass of a supernova an explosion energy of a supernova that may have contributed to an individual extremely metal poor star. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, so what, so, so, to, so to answer your question though, the one thing I didn't say though is the velocity dispersion. Uh, so the velocity dispersion is the other thing and the velocity dispersion from our objects is actually much too high. Uh, so this has been super exciting because all the theorists have gone crazy uh, enjoying this, assuming that it's a globular cluster that maybe has interacted with the disk in a unique way that has actually caused the dispersion of the um, velocities uh, to, you know, to be larger than you would expect uh, for a very cold object, for a very dynamically uh, cold object. Um, there have been, there've been several um, there are several, there have been several theoretical analyses and even a few papers coming out. I didn't, I wasn't aware of the controversy part of it. So, <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks for asking then. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's all really cool and lots of stuff to look forward to. Are there other questions? Because I do have another high level question if we have time. Any online? Not yet. No. Yeah, go for it. Right. So, you started off your talk by, um, motivating the study uh, as a way to understand the early universe, right? And I guess I wonder how to reconcile this detailed study of abundances in the nearby universe with the kind of metallicities that we get further out, which are the gas nebular metallicities. So how do you bring those two fields together? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there are people that do quasar absorption line studies, damp lime and alpha studies. And so we can compare abundances to the DLAs, hmm. uh, which I think is interesting. But, you know, most of the DLAs that I'm familiar with are registers of kind of like two to four ish. Um, you know, I think what probably like quasar absorption line studies would be even better, but there's, uh, I don't know that you can convert. Well, you, you can, but also the element, the specific elements that you see in emission are different from those typically that we find in absorption. Not not completely, but um, the gas phase abundances versus the stellar atmosphere abundances can be you know quite different for things like oxygen, for example. So so I'm not sure I'm answering your question in a good way. There are some elements that overlap and some that don't. Um, the gas phase versus the stellar atmosphere phases. Uh, historically have been pretty good, but really limited to only, you know, like we can look at radial gradients in our galaxy. You can compare um, H2 region abundances with uh, some star formation that's happening nearby in hot stars. So I'm thinking going, I'm thinking of several things around oxygen, CNO, things like that. Um, but I think the elements that we really want and need to constrain supernovae and the supernova explosion energies are really more like the heavy elements. And you'll never, at least, my understanding is you'll never get those in the gas phase. So uh, that's my long answer to a very good question. And, and you know, to be honest, I don't really know what's going to happen with JWST, right? It's There's like really new discovery space. And it might be that, that you know, that the emission lines that they're looking at now at high redshifts are such that we can put this together with some of our most metal poor stars. Sorry, last thing too. Some of those lighter elements change in the history of a star as well. The heavier ones really don't, but CNO you know, cycling um, can, you know, mixing can can change those lighter elements, which are often typically the ones that we're seeing in the interstellar medium. So, um, well, thank you. So that's Kim. a long... Janice. What do, what do you think? Uh, about which part? <laughs> <laughs> about bring, about, so about bringing together. That was such a good question okay. about bring, bringing together the ke chemistry that we get from emission line studies at high redshift, like presumably what's going to happen with JWST and has happened with the HST. Um, I mean, we, with, can't, we, can't, we have trouble doing that in the nearby universes. So I, <laughs> it was an honest question, so I don't have an answer. Yeah. But I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, we can go on and on. I should stop. <laughs>
And well, uh, I'm sorry. Be, I'm really sorry that not here because we could. Yeah. We it'd be lovely to have this discussion over dinner. Yeah, I think we're going to have to continue the discussion online uh, just in this interest of time. Um, uh, but that's one of the benefits of having a hybrid is that we have a great Slack setup. So uh, please jump online and and put your questions in there and uh, get the discussion going. Um, so let's uh, let's thank Kim again uh, for for the fantastic talk. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. We're going to be uh, taking a brief break from the Victoria tour de force that we've been experiencing. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Vinny Plakis from uh, CSDC Noir Lab. And he's going to be telling us about uh, making good use of bad weather, a chemically pristine star found through the clouds with Gemini. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, it's, uh, I'm really happy to see all my Noir Lab co-workers and colleagues there. I wish I could be there with you, but well, maybe maybe next time. So I'm also really glad that my talk is just right after Kim's because I knew that she would give such a great introduction to low metallicity stars and would get everybody really excited about them. So my job now is, I think, easier, right? And I cannot state how happy I am with the results from Ghost. You know, seeing HD 222925 there, it's, yeah, so it's really amazing, right? I could go on and on just, just like that, but I won't. Um, so the, the reason I'm here is I wanna talk about two things. Um, and the reason my background here has clouds is that I wanna talk about bad weather, right? And this is the only picture I could find on the Noir Lab website with Gemini and clouds actually. So this is, that, that's why it's here. Um, uh, and, and the reason I wanna talk about this, I realized that I've been using you know, poor weather proposals on Gemini for actually 25 semesters now. So there has been you know, thousands and thousands of stars observed and a lot of good science done with bad weather. And I just wanted to show you here, not only talk about a little bit about the bad weather, but also share a very interesting result that we found uh, next year. It's a very peculiar, chemically peculiar star that we found in the halo of the Milky Way. So since uh, Kim did an introduction for me, I would just go really fast through my in intro slides. Um, and the, the one thing I wanted to show you, and assuming that I have control, let's see, let me try this. Oh, okay, good. So, so then you see my periodic table here. So this is, well, my science question. This is why I do science, is just to understand how the universe can go from hydrogen and helium only, all the way to all the elements we see in the surface of the sun and the surface of these low metallicity stars, right? We know all the physics or most of the physics behind this, you know, uh, stellar evolution, um, some sort of a, you know, burning stages, explosive stages. But then we want to know a little bit more about the specific astrophysical sites, fractions, mass distribution of progenitor populations, and so on and so forth. So that's why we observe those really low metallicity stars, and we call this stellar archaeology or galactic archaeology, or depending on your inclinations, you can say near field cosmology, or also known as the universe as z equals to zero, right? Uh, and, and this again is this is the same timeline you just saw. You know, those really massive stars were born, you know, metal-free, exploded, polluted the interstellar medium with metals. Then we formed the second generation, low mass stars, and those would live for well, 13 billion years, and we would see them today in the halo of the Milky Way. That's how the story goes, right? So if we observe them today, we can just trace back the progenitor population and say, hey, in order to give this abundance that we see today, maybe I needed a first star with such mass and such distribution of parameters. And if you want to do that, of course, you need high resolution spectroscopy, as we saw for ghosts, for example, right? And here on the right-hand side, I'm just showing uh, two spectra of a solar type star and of an ultra metal core star, just so you have an idea of the amount of lines you can see in both of them. So for the ultra metal core, these are really hard to find. I think that the community uh, in its entirety, I think found 36 of those so far with high resolution spectroscopy. So they're really hard to find. I think it's about maybe one per 100 square degrees of the night sky. Again, so this is a really rare. So what you do is you increase your chances of finding them by doing smart pre-selections, right? You can do Gaia, you can do moderate resolution spectroscopy, or you can do narrowband photomet photometry, just like the pristine survey that uh, Kim just mentioned. Uh, another uh, effort to do uh, narrowband photometry is this project called Southern Photometric Local Universe uh, Survey, 
right? It's a 0.8 robotic telescope sitting in a mountain or in Chile. Our own Cerro Tololo here, you can see on the, on the bottom of the image. This is what we call the mushroom farms at Cerro Tololo. So the S plus telescope is the one on the left hand side of the picture. So this is a, a two square degree field of view, just scanning the southern sky, 8,500 square degrees. I think what you see in the top right is just the current footprint, which is about 4,000 uh, square degrees. And what's special about the survey is that they have 12 filters. So they have seven narrow band and five broad band. And this is what you can see here on the left side. Um, some of those narrow bands, they're really well positioned, uh, calcium lines, uh, hydrogen lines, magnesium triplet, calcium triplet. So you can get not only your stellar atmospheric parameters, but you can also get uh, selected chemical abundances. And you can get your temperatures also from the broadband photometry. Right? On the right-hand side, I'm just putting just two animations of an extended object and on a stellar field. Right? Because if you have those 12 filters, this is pretty much a low resolution IFU. Right, so for each pixel of those images, you have those 12 pieces of information in terms of the spectral energy distribution. So we use those in order to pick interesting stars for spectroscopic follow-up. So for the calcium filter, on the left-hand side, you see how different metallicities behave for a given temperature. So these are synthetic spectra, uh, same temperature, just varying metallicities on the top. And on the bottom, you see how those changes in metallicity reflect on the actual integrated flux on that band. So in principle, you can distinguish very well between solar type stars, metallicities minus one, minus two, minus three, and even a little bit lower than minus three, right? And on the right-hand side, what you see on the top is just the same thing for this S plus filter, this Havalambri filter system on the top. And on the bottom, this is just an example of the SkyMapper little V filter, which is a little bit, uh, some sort of wider and slightly bluer. You can still pick out a lot of metallicity information, but the narrower one, which is essentially the same as the pristine one, it's very, very powerful in that sense. So what we did for this particular work is, okay, so we have those 12 magnitudes. So can we find a color color space where we could isolate low metallicity stars and increase our chances of finding them? And this is what you see here. So on the left-hand side, it's just a color-color diagram. So the colors are a little bit weird, but again, color-color diagram. And the blue box that you see on the zoom on the right-hand side is just a region of that space, but then color-colored by metallicity. You see, as the, the points go from blue to black, these are metallicities decreasing. So as you can see, if you go to the, 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 the bottom left corner of that image, if you select stars over there, chances are most of those will be low metallicity. So that's what we did. We just picked you know, 500 stars from that bunch and said, let's do uh, spectroscopic follow-up and see what happens, right? And this is where uh, Gemini poor weather program, uh, programs come into place, right? Because these stars are fairly bright. So let's talk about well, the good, the bad, and the poor weather. So here I have two time lapses from our Gemini South uh, All Sky camera. And I want you to try to guess which of those two nights that I actually got data for my Ben 4 program. This is just a 30 second video. Just again, enjoy the visuals. And again, both nights, telescope is open for most of the night. And then at some point on the left-hand side, you see that again, clouds, bright, the moon is up. So this is where I got data, right? So this is the sweet spot for your uh, poor weather program. Again, you can still do a lot of science in those conditions. And here, you just see a snapshot of those two nights. On the left-hand side, this is an actual snapshot of the last spectrum I got from my, you know, the, the 22A poor weather program. So this was June 20th. So this is the actual, uh, the telescope is open, you can see. And on the top left, you can see the GMOS spectrum that I got for a particular object. We have that problem with AMP number five on GMOS but that doesn't prevent us to do great science with that data, right? So this was the last one we got for this, uh, for this particular project. So looking at all of the data for the, those band four programs for this particular paper, this is what 91 hours of band four time at Gemini give you, right? So here we have 138 stars and out of those 91 hours of awarded time, we have almost 46 hours on target, which to me, since this is a poor weather program, and as you can see in the title of the slide, the conditions are, well, whatever, right? 
if you can open the telescope and point somewhere, again, you can give me that data because I will use it, right? Um, and, and this is the result. We have 138 stars and all of them, you can see here, you know, the calcium lines, Balmer lines, carbon G band, magnesium triplet, everything. You can get reliable parameters for all of those stars taken under poor weather conditions. So we used those 138 stars and then we went to our friends on Cerro Tololo with the Blanco telescope and the Cosmos spectrograph, and we observed another 384. So we have a combined sample of 522. And this is what you see here on the top left. This is just the footprint of the observations. Uh, the bottom uh, shows just the magnitude distribution for eight of those 12 filters. And hopefully the image is not too small for you to see, but then on the right hand side, I'm showing 50 spectra on the left side taken with the Blanco and the Cosmos spectrograph. And on the right hand side, it's Gemini GMOS. And as you can see, those are really you know, similar. The Gemini data taken under poor weather conditions is really amazing to do that type of science. And again, all of those stars over here reduced with the Dragon's uh, pipeline. So thanks Kathleen and the team for sharing the development version with me. All of those reduced uh, using Dragon's. So what we did was we took those 500 stars, calculated the metallicities, and this is what we get. The top histogram here shows our success rate in finding stars with metallicities below minus two, because these are the most uh, interesting ones that we want to find. And our success rate is about 83% of all of those have metallicities below minus two, which is pretty good, right? And if you look here on the right-hand side, the color color diagram, we picked one star here that had a metallicity from GMOS at about minus four. And we did reobserve that star with uh, Mike on the Magellan telescope. And this is what you have, right? On the top here, you have your 12 points or your really low resolution narrow band photometry type. Then you have your GMOS data. Again, five minutes of bad weather give you this. And then you have the Magellan high resolution. Uh, and again, I put a ghost emoji here. I don't know if you can see it. And that's a, an opportunity for ghosts. Absolutely, we could observe uh, that star with ghosts. And this star turned out to be super, super interesting, right? You have high resolution data. You can do spectrosynthesis. Again, this is carbon, this is lithium, and this is strontium. So we can measure all of those elements in that star. And we can measure you know, a bunch of you know, lighter elements. But what's interesting about this is that this was the lowest carbon ever measured for a low metallicity star in the Milky Way. Right? And you can see here the dot over here, the lowest carbon ever. And what that tells us about, for example, the, the makeup of the first stars is that, well, you need to find a progenitor population that would give such a low carbon abundance uh, in the interstellar medium and in the gas cloud that actually formed that star. And we can do that here. And you see on the bottom that you know, he, the points are the observed um, abundances and the lines are all some sort of theoretical models for a zero metallicity uh, thin supernova explosion and the chemical yields from that. So we can compare that and say, well, the most probable uh, progenitor population has a 29.5 solar masses uh, metal free. And, and this is again, an unexpected result again, coming from Ben Ford. I don't think I can state that enough is that with five minutes of GMOS time under poor weather conditions, we can actually put a constraint on the IMF of the first stars to be born in the universe. And, and this is not an overstatement, right? By any measure, we can do that. Right? And, and this is how amazing this is. And we can continue doing that now with ghosts. That's why I think people are so, I know at least 20 people who would you know, apply for ghost time tomorrow if available. And my second to last slide is just to, to summarize all of this work is that this is really the, the power in numbers, right? We have this S plus, this really tiny robotic telescope that observed 20 million objects. Then, by doing you know, smart selections, we got down to 500, observed 138 with Gemini under poor weather conditions, not the picture that we see here. Then got the most interesting one out of those, put on Magellan, and hopefully in the future with Ghost, you know, the emoji is here again. And then we find one of those very chemically peculiar and pristine uh, stars, right? And this star actually made you know, the rounds in the press, and you know, it, it got some interesting things to talk about just because it was such a low carbon abundance. Um, and yeah, and then I actually have my summary slide. I'll just stop talking. I'll leave you here with another picture with clouds because I think one of the takeaways 
is that, well, the, the poor weather shouldn't be seen as weather loss, in my humble opinion. It should be seen as an opportunity to innovate, as an opportunity to try different things and try maybe things that you wouldn't otherwise try in a regular tech. So I'm really happy to talk to anybody about you know, those poor weather opportunities. And again, I think the, the, the future is really bright uh, for Ghost. Well, bright and faint, depending on what you have, right? But the future is great for people who are using Ghost. And I'm really happy to be you know, just, just part of it now. I think that this is really amazing. And I'll leave you with my conclusions. Uh, I'm really happy you know, to give this presentation. Thank you again for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions if, if, if you have them. Thank you. Great, yeah, thanks so much, Vinny. Um, and uh, can I say, take that, radio astronomers. Um, that's uh, some super, super cool work and uh, really great featuring how uh, you can really do some great science in uh, cloudy weather. Uh, first question, uh, Denise. Oh, thanks. Uh, it was really great uh, talk, Vinny. Uh, I, I have a question because you said that uh, in your color, um, color, color diagram, I see a number of uh, there you selected the metal stars and they said you have a chance that they will turn to be really uh, low uh, metallistic stars. So what is the fraction of those you selected that uh, tended to be really the kind of uh, object you are looking for? Okay, so, so I think you're talking about this and Oi Denise, uh, yes. by the way, well, <laughs> good, good to see you there. Yeah, so um, the fractions, well, as we saw, is about 80% uh, for wow. metallicities uh, below minus two, which, and for metallicities below minus three, I think it's about 17 to 20%, which is great, right? Because usually really if you if you wanna randomly find a star at minus four, you, you actually have to observe a million of them and find one. So yeah, in, in this case, we observe you know, 500 and some two. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is perfect because in general, what we expected with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, diagram is that perhaps, you know, we'll not find that ma many objects. So this is a really good one. And then the way you follow it, that's perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, time for another question, uh, Zach. Hey, Vinny. Um, I had a question about your magnitude distribution, because I didn't, I may have missed it, but I was just wondering, like, what ranges were your targets uh, in terms of, like, V magnitude or the band you were looking oh, at? Oh, yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's this one. Yes. So we, we had things ranging from 12.5, you know, 13 G magnitudes all the way to 17.5. So Gemini got the, the really faint end of that distribution. So anything uh, G greater than 16.5 uh that that was that was gmos and, and these were all 20 minutes uh half an hour on on a really bad day but 20 minutes gives you a really nice spectrum already the, the ones you see here all right yeah this looks great okay let's uh thank Vinny again and uh, move on to the last speaker of this uh this part of the session So I'm pleased to uh, introduce in person uh, Federico Sestito from uh, University of Victoria, and uh, Federico is going to be talking, uh, continuing with uh, what Kim was, was talking about, uh, unveiling the formation and evolution of the Milky Way with the most metal poor stars in the bulge and in the disk. Um, can I have the pointer? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so good morning, I'm Federico Sassito, a postdoc fellow at uh, UVic and work mainly with uh, Kim, as you already know. And today I'm gonna uh, present a chemodynamical investigation of the oldest and most metal poor stars that we can find uh, towards the bulge. So, uh, so we sit here in the present day in this fancy and elegant room in this hotel, and we wonder how did the first stars and the first structure form and evolve? What were their properties? What are um, what were the properties of the first supernovae? And to do so, uh, we either look at high redshift or we hunt for the most metapool. We hunt for the relics that formed in the early universe and are still uh, live uh, nowadays, and we can find it in the uh, in our Milky Way. 
And these are the most metal poor stars. So not necessarily the uh, very first generation, but probably the second, third, and fourth generation. And they really carry uh, the imprints of these first stars. Um, so the classical picture is that uh, um, first stars and metal poor stars formed uh, in low mass halo that they merge together, forming the proto-galaxy, bringing together uh, pristine gas, uh, the most metal poor stars, but also uh, dark matter. And then the proto-galaxy forms, settle, and we should expect to find uh, uh, the most metal poor star in a sort of pressure-supported uh, distributed um, distribution. So uh, where to find the most metal poor star? Uh, Probability mentioned suggests that uh, there are mainly three regions which we should expect to find them. One is the very inner region, which is usually, usually crowded by more metal rich stars. Uh, there is a lot of extinction, so it's very hard to find star there. And we'll talk about this later. The easier uh, region is the halo, the, the halo of a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And then there is uh, in satellites. They are usually faint and very distant. But each region is very important because uh, the most metal poor stars that are there are really informative on the chemical evolution of these uh, uh, of their birth region and all of these regions. So uh, as already uh, spoke, introduced by Kim, uh, a very efficient way is to use the calcium HNK, which is a, a proxy for metallicity, and it has been used by several surveys such as SkyMapper, Pristine, and here on the Left, you can see the narrow band pristine filter over plotted with two uh, EMP stars, but also a much uh, wider uh, sky mapper filter. On the right, you can see the pristine uh, color for the uh, color color uh, diagram, which is very efficient in separate uh, star at different metallicity. So the x axis is essentially temperature sensitive, while the vertical axis is uh, uh, variable to uh, assign a metallicity. So uh, we found after um, three years of low gas campaign that uh, we have an efficiency of 56% on finding star with protometric metallicity below minus two, point five, that are also spectroscopically um, very metal poor. And this is a much higher efficiency compared to other previous surveys because now we can also um, use surveys like SKSS, which are really good in uh, in deleting all the contaminants. So this is a pristine footprint. Uh, so uh, the main uh, pristine is targeting stars in the halo, while the pig's uh, footprint, or the big survey, which is the pristine inner galaxy survey, is uh, targeting stars in the budge and also in uh, Sagittarius Drosperoida. So now I'm going to focus on the peaks. Um, so we selected uh, 12,000 stars to be observed with both the red and blue arm at the AAT. And so uh, we get uh, uh, the spectrum, the metallicity and carbonicity. And in this plot, you can really see that uh, uh, peaks is really efficient in finding a new very metal poor star. And especially here, you can see that compared to other um, surveys targeting the, the bulge, such as the Ambra, Argos, or even Apogee. So for the chemodynamic chemo analysis that I'm going to talk about, uh, so we selected 17 stars from the pigs uh, to be observed with races, which is an awesome instrument because it combines uh, the large collecting area of Gemini and also the high efficiency of Espadons through these incredible fiber. And uh, so before venturing into the chemistry, we now live in the Gaia era, so we can now uh, measure uh, precise uh, kinematics. Um, on the top panel is showing that all the 70 stars have a pericenter uh, below 2 kpc, so they are at a certain point of the orbit, they are very close to the center of the galaxy. All of them have a very high eccentricity, the middle panel. And according to the bottom panel, which is the maximum excursion from the plane as a function of the center, uh, we divided uh, the, um, the star into four dynamical groups, which are a few star remains inside the bulge, other are somehow confined to the Milky Way plane, and other goes into the inner and the outer plane. So this is the uh, a lot of thoughts about the chemistry. So what I want to give to you is that uh, um, so all the stars 
uh, of my sample, but also uh, the budget literature, which are displayed by blue dots, they really look like, uh, they really look like a normal halo star. And this is a first take on message, which uh, uh, is a sort of confirmation of the hierarchical assembly of the Milky Way. So this low, low mass building block system, they merge together and they scatter the star uh, in the bulge, but also in the halo. So they should not look differently. And uh, of course, there are a few weird stars that are, let's say, a few magnesium poor star, uh, which I will talk later, a few barium uh, low stars. And uh, let's dive into this now. So, um, previous work suggested that, uh, ob observed that uh, the presence of uh, some nitrogen rich star in the bulge. And you can see in these, in the two top panels here. Um, the, the stars denoted with the squares are somehow really different from the other bulge field stars. And uh, the same locus of the two regions is also occupied by uh, second generation globular cluster stars. So it has been proposed that uh, uh, ancient and solved globular cluster might constitute up to the 25% of the building blocks of the inner halo. So that is a, a huge fraction. And very recently, um, Lucy, uh, using the COM survey, also found uh, a couple of stars in their sample that uh, are compatible with second generation globular cluster stars using aluminum. Uh, can we do the same with braces? Well, no, because we don't have aluminum, we don't have nitrogen, but we can use uh, sodium and magnesium. And this is my work. So my stars are also compared with the bulge and the halo literature, but also selection of uh, first and second generation global cluster stars. And the highlighted region is the region in which we should expect uh, less contaminant from the first generation and halo stars. And in fact, we have two, three stars which are compatible with uh, second generation GC stars. Um, one of them is a carbon enhanced star. So, um, which means that uh, uh, its atmosphere is polluted by an AGB companion. And uh, probably the sodium is, might be a little bit uh, uh, an answer to, but uh, to, to us seems to be compatible with second generation GC stars. And it will be very rare to find such star in a global cluster because, uh, because of the rarity of binaries in a, in a dense environment, such as a global cluster. So uh, for this star, we, we will need other elements to really confirm um, its nature. And then uh, another star, P171, is an uh, extremely metal poor star with a metallicity of minus 3.2. And uh, this is very similar in metallicity as uh, C19, uh, already introduced by Kim. C19 is uh, the most uh, metal poor globular cluster that we find so far. And this is challenging the metallicity floor. So on the right, you can see this distribution in metallicity of all the global cluster in the Milky Way. And as you can see, C19 is very far uh, from, the, from the others. And this is also seen in uh, all the galaxy, uh, as you can see from the uh, left plot, all the galaxies uh, independently by their mass, uh, their size or, or whatever. So there is no extreme metal poor uh, global cluster known up to date except C19. And this is because EMP stars are very rare. So global cluster, EMP global cluster will be much more rare uh, to form. But we think that uh, this is a second hint of the, of the feasibility of forming uh, such structure in the early universe. So if they form very early, maybe we are not finding them because they are disrupted by the tidal forces of the Milky Way or the host galaxies, if they form in an extra galactic uh, and then what we what uh, we also uh, looked is uh, okay um, maybe these star are coming from second generation global cluster um, so we want to see if uh, these clusters are different from what we can observe nowadays in the Milky Way and uh, a work from Pancino 2017 pointed out that uh, uh, if you look at the magnesium over alpha. Alpha uh, uh, might be like magnesium, calcium, and titanium. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, Milky Way globular cluster stars are picked uh, at zero. So magnesium is equal to uh, the other alphas. 
where exergalactic uh, globular cluster have a much wider and negative distribution. So they are somehow magnesium poor compared to the other uh, elements, alpha elements. And these three uh, four stars that might be associated with second generation global cluster stars are really similar to the extragalactic ones. So they are very negative in magnesium over alpha. So this is some, uh, these are suggest us that uh, maybe these ancient global cluster are somehow different than the one that we can find nowadays. So maybe the evolution or the formation path is somehow different. And this was also uh, hypothesized by uh, Schiavone in 2017, and they suggested that uh, ancient GC are more, much more uh, massive, like up to 10, 100 more than the one that we can find nowadays. And then I want to spend a few words on uh, um, a peculiar star, so uh, which is the magenta one. Um, so this star is a very uh, has a very planar and high eccentric orbit. So and its upper center is uh, well below the sun distance, up to 12, 13 kpc. And this suggests that uh, the star has been accreted very early. Uh, so presumably uh, within the early assembly of the Milky Way. So that's a relic of the uh, building blocks. Well, the chemistry, well, the chemistry uh, on the left panel, you can see that this star is very, has a very low sodium over magnesium ratio, but also a very low calcium over magnesium. And also on the right, you can see that uh, the volume is pretty low for this star compared to all the other star uh, from the bulge and the uh, halo. So we said, okay, let's compare this star to uh, ultra faint dwarf. And in fact, uh, this star looks like uh, uh, some star that are in Hercules and Sigur 1. So we think that uh, the building block that formed this star was polluted by only one or not many low mass supernovae. So no very stability supernova, no massive stars. And uh, uh, yeah, so. Oops. Uh, how to go back? Uh, oh. Oh, oh. Yeah. It was the very first, last slide. I have it. Mm -hmm. this is, this is the slide we have. Uh, yeah, let me just go down, uh, down, 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 like 24, probably. Uh, yes, 24. Whoa, it does not like that. We flipped all the way through all your slides. Yeah, well, anyway, so. Um, so this star has a very planar and high eccentric orbit. It's not the first time that we found a uh, um, very metal poor star in a planar orbit. We did find uh, that uh, metal poor star can occupy um, the plane at all metallicity from minus four, below minus four to the metallicity of the, of the disk. And uh, uh, I looked into a cosmological simulation and uh, we found that uh, um, these, Planets are very informative of the early assembly of the Milky Way. In particular, these high eccentricity stars are really tracer of the building blocks of the Milky Way. So um, we need a high resolution campaign to find uh, uh, how many building blocks formed uh, uh, this kind of planar structure. And uh, if there are any other star with such a weird uh, um, composition, such as very low barium, very low sodium, and magnesium. Um, yeah, so, and then I should, uh, it was, yeah, done, but uh, that's uh, uh, 24. Yeah, uh, no, I, I think I'm going to have to skip that. Yeah, no, well, anyway. 25 working, but then I tried to go back to 24 and it died. Okay, well. I don't know what it is. No, I, I mean, I, I did finish, so, so yeah. All right, sorry. Yeah. Technical malfunction is unfortunate. Sorry about that, Frederico. Yeah. Well, 
but still, that was uh, that fantastic results. Um, uh, are there any questions in the room? And the one. May I have a question now? Yep. Actually, I have a question about the magnetic abundances of your metal posters. Sorry, sorry, can, can I, you speak, uh, get a little closer to the mic? Yeah, I have a question about the magnetic abundances of your metal poster. So when you show you uh, the FUH and magnetic probe, so your metal poster has uh, shows a positive correlation. So I mean, the magnetic abundance is increasing with the increasing metal C, but that is not usual. But so as I know, in the mid crystals, the, the magnetic abundance is constant and that they there's the decrease with the increasing FOH. So I'm wondering how can you explain that kind of the positive correlation between the magnetism and the iron of the system? Well, yeah, so so uh, the point is that, okay, these stars are not normal here stars. So if they are like normal here, we should expect like a 0.4 flat curve up to, I don't know, minus 1.5 until you see the disk. So uh, in fact, so these low magnesium star are telling us that uh, they are not so normal. So if you uh, we also look at other uh, chemistry, chemical abundances, and we found that uh, uh, they are kind of tracer of the global cluster stars. So um, yeah, so second generation global cluster star might be uh, kind of different from normal helo stars. Yes, why first generation GC stars are totally similar to, um, to halo star. Well, then the second generation somehow formed from a processed, uh, uh, from a polluted gas from this EGB uh, global cluster star that uh, contributed to the chemistry that we can see in these, uh, these peculiar stars. And yeah, and so they are somehow very different from the normal halo. Yeah. Is there any chatter online? Um. No questions from the chat yet. Another question here. Uh, well, thanks for your talk. And uh, sorry to not see mm -hmm. <laughs> the very end of it. Yeah. Uh, you are showing that the baryon uh, abundance of uh, this object, it's, well, unusual. And then I had another uh, dot there that uh, what would be the explanation for them? I mean, it's in, it's not only in this case you have that low uh, barium abundance, no? You had other, well, you know, very uh, very yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That this was like a clue for, you know, how peculiar this one was. Yeah, so um, so the low barium abundance is suggesting that uh, um, the, the, the region in which the star farm was polluted by only uh, low mass supernovae. So not many because otherwise the supernovae will produce barium or other uh, uh, neutron capture elements. So we really need the uh, uh, low mass supernovae and just one, it's called the one shot model, like just one or not many um, events that can contribute to the, uh, to the barium. Uh, and the same supply, uh, so we need also low mass here because we also need to uh, have a, a very low sodium over magnesium and very low calcium over magnesium. So, so yeah, and uh, we should also, I think, involve the inhomogeneous mixing in the gas also to have, it's a kind of relatively high metallicity uh, because the metallicity is minus two. So, yeah. Okay, thanks, Rodrigo. Let's, uh, let's thank him uh, again for this fantastic talk and uh, as well have another round for uh, all the speakers in the first part of this session. Uh, so just before we... Just before we go to lunch, uh, just a couple uh, housekeeping thing. Uh, the speakers in the next section, please, before going to lunch, come up and test your slides and get all that uh, tickety boo. Uh, and for those, if anyone uh, needs to 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 miss parts of the next section um, for whatever reason, please try to come back uh, at least at three o five for the conference photo. Uh, so that's again at three o five. Uh, please be be here for the photo. Uh, Janice, anything else? Okay, great. Let's. Yeah, I just mentioned that, slide testing for lunch. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, break for lunch and come back at 1.55.
Yeah, so right, right after he was born again. They're just gonna put you in a bubble. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna find lunch. I think we're all done for now. Yep, I'm just gonna find a safe place.
Oh, I'm checking the Slack. Yeah, that's my. All right. I put the, the little stars. Did you see the little stars? Yeah, those five. That's my role. <laughs> yes, for not. Yeah, it's just been nothing for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, need to do the thing. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, sounds good. Welcome back. We'll start in just one minute so everyone, if everyone can make their way. Like everyone else. <laughs> Or you, Very easy though. or you can show the whole thing in whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that it's more appropriate to use oh, the mask. It's so perfect. <laughs> I can imagine.
Okay. Denise. Or, yeah. Yeah. Here's just the PDF, right? Yes. Okay, let's go uh, to the afternoon session. Um, we will start with uh, Denise Gonzalez from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He's going to speak about uh, innovating the hunter techniques, the Ramses II, Raman search for extragalactic symbiotic stars. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. And uh, well, thanks for the opportunity of being here. That in that so great meeting so far. And uh, for me, it's a privilege being here to talk about uh, a innovative technique uh, to find the symbiotic systems in the local universe and in the nearby galaxy. Um, using these uh, Herman uh, initial line that I'd like to explain you what it is about. Uh, the collaborators in this project are a number of people. In this part here are those that are really members of uh, the Hunters 2 team. So people in the different countries uh, of the Gemini Consortium. And here it's people, and one it in these two, that uh, uh, participated in something that I call the pilot uh, project for this, that it was an attempt to use the force to a DVLT to do the same science, but it didn't work quite well, and they will explain you why. Uh, so these guys we are talking about here are uh, above the stars, so in binary systems, and we need to have uh, the, a white dwarf accreting or a uh, giant star. So a fraction of the wind of the mass of uh, the giant star, it's captured by the white dwarf. And here it's a really beautiful example of this because in this kind of uh, systems we have, in addition of the binary systems with these two uh, guys in the center, we have this uh, like a planetary nebulae like uh, uh, nebulae. Um, and here we have this wonderful uh, example. We see the jets that are coming out from this system. And in this case, uh, using uh, AMA data and CO and continuum, it was possible really to uh, pick uh, the position of the two stars in the system. So this is really cool. But it's the only example we see things so clearly. Uh, the fact that we have uh, these uh, binary systems has to do with this beautiful uh, nebulae around the system. And uh, because of that, there are the interaction between these two stars, which are a number of interesting physics for us to study, like uh, the shaping of the nebulae, the accretion disk that is there, the formation of jets, the peculiar uh, chemistry of uh, the stars because we have mass being transferred from one to another of the system. And in addition of this, it's very much important as well, that symbiotic systems are uh, one of the uh, really promising systems as progenitors of supernova one way. Uh, which here there are a number of possibilities for this, for, for that, it's still not proven that they were the progenitors, but there are two ways that symbiotic system can be uh, related with this, using the uh, single uh, single white dwarf scenario or the double white dwarf scenario because in these systems we have one white dwarf and one giant star and much later in the evolution, even uh, uh, two white dwarfs. So they are, you know, really promising candidates as with the mass uh, transfer um, and to, to, the, to the white dwarf, we can reach the center of the mass, uh, mass and then have an explosion of this kind of supernova one way. Uh, so these are reasons why, why we want to uh, count on uh, mapping these kind of objects in different galaxies. And uh, here I'm showing you the number of uh, these systems we know in uh, dwarf galaxies of the local group and some of them. And note that for our own galaxy, the expected number is some, something in between uh, 3,000 to uh, 4,000 to 4,000. But you only know 
less than 300 uh, systems. And the, the extra galactic ones, only 74, most of them in the uh, much bigger galaxies like uh, Andromeda or um, M33. And we are, you know, studying this population in these uh, uh, dwarf galaxies. Um, if, even though, we, I would say that you don't know how to estimate the number of, uh, of these stars. We see that whatever is the way, if this is true or not, we really have only a you know, handful of these uh, guys in the local group coming from uh, dwarf galaxies. Um, another thing that is important, it's, uh, I don't have time to go through all of these, but it's important to remember that this kind of systems will appear uh, in the uh, dwarf spiders or irregulars, because they are as much as planetary nebulae uh, present in the uh, key extent or star forming galaxies. So you can really go for a number of, uh, you know, most of the dwarf galaxies in the local universe. Uh, traditionally, the way of finding these guys is using color color uh, diagram and uh, on which, if, for instance, you have here a IFAS uh, example. So using the optical, the R uh, minus I band versus the R minus A minus uh, H alpha, and the located stars there. But this is not enough because there are a number of other emission line stars that would appear here as well. Then you can use as well the uh, infrared to, you know, to try to much better select these, uh, these objects. Even though uh, this is a much older version, and uh, if you go here, and it's too much as well, but in this um, much nearer uh, example, we see that there are a number. Here, it's the, the place on which you see uh, the singlet uh, stars. But you see that there are a number of other objects that would appear here as well, like uh, planetary nebulae, B stars, or CVs, uh, young stellar objects. So after, Using these kind of things, you need the uh, spectroscopic follow-up. Uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, the kind of work that it's been done by uh, M33 and M31. A number of objects were uh, detected in this way. And uh, I would call attention here very quickly to, you know, that you can use color-color diagrams much better than those I was talking about uh, just a minute ago. Uh, for instance, he uses the, the J and the S plus that uh, Vinnie Plackle uh, explained to you this morning. Because here we have an addition of the broadband lens, we also have a number of uh, um, narrowband filters that would make a much better job in terms of uh, selecting the objects in the optical. Uh, using these, uh, those two uh, systems of filters, uh, what we're putting here are kind of uh, like word, uh, uh, colors because these are colors of the J uh, J and S plus uh, system photometric system and here wherever that it's in red are uh, uh, singular systems so here we do a little little bit much better work than using the traditional uh, uh, ways of uh, finding these guys or finding uh, by the candidates of singular uh, stars using the optical. But then, of course, as in the previous uh, slides I show you, the follow-up, the spectroscopic follow-up is mandatory in this kind of work. Then what we are doing with the Hamses 2, our approach is we want to uh, map this population in dwarf galaxies of different mass and metallicities. Um, uh, but we want to do this using a purely photometric technique. And uh, this is really important because, for instance, if you think uh, of mapping this population in the, the nearby galaxies, if you take the SMC, for instance, the expected number there, it's this number. So far, you know, only 12. But then we are not doing this exactly in the SMC because the SMC is too huge, so you, need, you would need to observe the SMC forever to be able to to see the population, then we're doing with the smaller galaxies, in fact. But uh -huh, what's the way you are trying to do this without using the, the spectroscope? The fact is that there is an emission line that it's unique. 
of this kind of system that uh, it's this uh, Hohmann emission line, but it's the scatter of uh, the O6 line in the UV, but uh, it's, uh, well, these are resonance lines, they, they are scattered by a huge column uh, density of uh, uh, neutral hydrogen. And this is the kind of uh, configuration that it's unique of, of uh, these systems because you have uh, the uh, white dwarf that is responsible mainly, not only, but for the O6 emission, so the higher ionized dark, and uh, as, as well as uh, a huge uh, column density of uh, neutral hydrogen coming from the giant that, uh, you know, matter it's being accreted to the white dwarf. So this is really, it's, you know, it's really unique of this kind of system. So if we see this emission, we know for sure we're talking about single systems and not other kind of uh, emission lines or emission line uh, objects. Using that, I mean, this pilot project uh, I mentioned before, we select at the SMC a number of candidates uh, and they did this uh, using a sulfur two filter that uh, it was uh, meant for uh, high redshift uh, uh, galaxies. And then because of that, we had, I'm with problem here, sorry. I can help you. No? Did it turn off? Hello. Yeah. Okay. And move to maps, so it's, uh, yeah. okay. I tried not to move, move much. Um, the point is that you use those filters at the VLP and uh, you are going to uh, pick up this emission. And then you, you had uh, 12 candidates, and then you went for the, the spectroscopic confirmation, and they turn out of being uh, false positive O6 emitters. And why? So here is the spectra you took for those guys, or they are here. And the, the reason, uh, uh, the important thing here, these are the uh, spectra of, uh, um, you know, cold stars, uh, giants, red giants. And uh, the reason is that the, filter, the filters, the pair of filters we were using were not really appropriated for this emission. Okay, the point is that the continuum of uh, this kind of objects can be, this one is really a well-behaved one. But you know, there are a number of characteristics of the core star here that make the work not that easy only using uh, two filters and not really appropriated because you see here are some of these and these, so it's hard to see the emission of your six. Uh, then what we're doing now, the Hamster's team is doing, is like imaging. So here it's an example of the one galactic uh, symbiotic system. And, uh, well, you see the whole spectrum here. And what we're doing now is, in addition of proving the O6 that could be false because of the kind of, uh, because of the spectrum is not flat in that part, um, we are also um, measuring the emission in uh, helium 2 because the ionization potential of the O6 is twice as much as the helium 2. So if that, that guy is, uh, that emission is present in the system, this one will be there as well. So we are uh, imaging using a uh, metal band imaging here and it continue. Uh, H alpha as well, of course, whatever ionized gas you have H alpha. And, and then a filter uh, centered in the O6 line, the Hammond O6 line, okay? Uh, this way, what we're doing is like uh, trying to be sure that we have the O6 in this red part of uh, uh, the spectrum and all uh, the, you know, and signatures of the ionized gas as well, H alpha and O6. For there, we need a uh, proper filter to do that. So the, uh, uh, the team built uh, O6 and the O6 continuum filters for the GMOS in the north and in, in, in the south. And these filters are here. And we have the on band filter and the off band one. That's uh, here are the characteristics of these filters. 
And here we see, I mean, just to be very clear that the continuum and the region of these lines is very, you know, can be mapped. So this is why you need uh, uh, to uh, get uh, uh, imaging in not only in this pair of filters, but the other two as well. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, Gemini uh, sponsored the, these filters and, uh, well, they were successfully um, uh, proven uh, allowable. So here are uh, the results of the main, the, the, the first results we have in the science verification uh, uh, phase of the project. Uh, they, they were published in this paper you see here. And this is uh, the field of the of Gemini, and this is Gemini South. And uh, we choose a object that you knew for sure that had this O6 emission. And we see it there. So O6, O6 minus continuum, you see the guy there. This is not a crowded field. Then in a crowded field, as you see here, again, we have a guy that you knew that were uh, emitting uh, this O6, and you see there the emission clearly. We have a third one here, and which we knew that this guy, it's as we are an emit, um, emitter of uh, uh, the O6, and we didn't find it there. And why? So, in the following day of these observations, this image, we got a spectra, and you see that the Hamon 6 here, uh, the emission here, very faint. In fact, for this same guy, you see from the 2013 to 2017, we see uh, that uh, this emission is fading. Um, uh, you need to go really uh, deep to be able to see this line in the faint object. And then there was a very nice surprise that is this guy here, MC1, that so far is not a human emit emitter. And then we find this. Because of that, we got uh, the spectra in the following light. And you see here the emission. And this is the comparison in uh, 94 uh, that there were no emission of this because this uh, emission is uh, very split time. So, all in all, oh, there are lots of things here, but the important thing is, is saying that this emission line is almost unique of the symbiotic systems. So, this is why you are using this one to uh, map this population. The other thing is that uh, there are some other, mainly uh, younger planetary nebulas, some like dubious ones, like this one, uh, that show lines that could be identified as this one as well, but well. It's not for sure. So the point is that only 50 or uh, half of the population, if you put it together the uh, galactic and that's the rest of galactic guys, only half of the population would find at a certain time, you know, show at a certain time this emission. So it's not that they can, even this way, find all the single systems in a galaxy. You could find at most half. But then you know, you know, you know with this number, you know the, the general thing. Another limitation is that you are seeing here in nearby dwarf galaxies, these two guys, we see that the emission is very faint. So hard, they need to go deep to see this. In fact, the luminosity in this line goes with the luminosity of the system. But anyway, if you put all the different uh, um, uh, guys you know together, uh, this emission is about 5% of the HR emission in the system. So, you know. But there is the advantage that this is a broad uh, line in general because of the scattering film. And then it's much easier to observe it, even though it's faint in general. So what you did, uh, we observed in the six filters all of these four galaxies. Uh, these are all uh, dark galaxies in the local group. And you see uh, preliminary results for Fortnite in a poster being presented by uh, Federico Angeloni uh, tomorrow, we'll talk about it. Um, and then I will show you real quickly the results for this guy here, and then we have another two to analyze. And uh, it's important to show here that you are in, using these four galaxies, you are probing different metallicities because so far you don't know what's the effect of the metallicity on this kind of emission. Uh, the result here is that for this galaxy, we already knew one true symbiotic system and another two that are possible. 
but in, in that work that it was made for Planeta Nebuli, we observed two fields, and this time we have only one field. And here it's uh, the exposure times we use an on and off band of these three units. And here is the results. So the first thing we recover in uh, the seconds here, it's not written, but this is H alpha, helium 2, and O6 emission of the guy we know, no, the three bands. And this is only the eight of emission, that one that's a possible planet, uh, possible symbiotic system. The helium 2 we were not able to recover, but it's really, really much fainter than the other. And then we have four new systems that are these four here, which is simply the emission in H alpha. I mean, this is the uh, the N minus uh, minus off uh, on board the minus off band emission, and then we see this. So the emission H alpha in helium 2 in no 6 for this system. So in this case, we know for sure this is a symbiotic system. Um, yeah, if you do simple extrapolations here in terms of uh, uh, estimating the number of uh, uh, this kind of objects in this galaxy, you would have when comparing uh, that estimation I, I showed at the very beginning, um, again around 2003, if we are doing now. So we take this one field and the galaxy in the result of that. And then you, you need to understand that you have much more, uh, uh, twice as much, and you are only observing part of the galaxy. So the expected number in this galaxy would be this one. Uh, the conclusion is of this is that we really don't know how to estimate this population, neither in the galaxy or in any other galaxy. So we are trying our best. Um, and there's the last one. Uh, the important things here is that uh, so far, the, uh, the symbiotic systems that we know in this uh, dwarf uh, galaxy of the local group work only uh, via uh, serendipitous discoveries. With Ramses too, uh, we the public is designed to do these statistics in this kind of galaxy in the local group. Uh, we built the filters, the proper filters to do this uh, in Gemini South and Gemini North that are attached to Guinness. And uh, for this galaxy in particular, we the number of systems went from one to five. So I think that we already uh, you know, prove that it's a promising way of mapping the single systems in the local group. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Is there any question in the audience or Slack? No? I would like to encourage students to make questions. Yes, this is a very friendly environment. So it doesn't matter if uh, how basic your question you think it is or the level of your English, please don't be shy. This is a very good opportunity for you to practice how to, to uh, interact. We have one on the Slack. Uh, I can read yeah. it. Uh, there's nerdy data reduction question. So how do you PSF, how, uh, how do you do the PSF match, matching when subtracting the narrow band image from the continuum image? Huh, this was really uh, the complicated thing in this project because, you know, for the first observations uh, in this galaxy, in fact, you don't have like the ideal thing uh, and uh, you need to uh, observe the sequences one after the other in a very uh, particular way in order to be able to do not have that much of uh, shading thinking and seeing for one to another of the image. So this is the word that German is uh, the work that uh, Germany uh, of the Gemini, Gemini is doing because we tried a number of different ways. For instance, if you use the phot photometer for crowd fields and try to do it automatically, it does not work. So the way you do is treating and retreating these images all the you know the uh, combined images uh, to find these guys using PSF matching. Yeah. No other way. The other for one you use anyway. Any other question? Okay. Oh. 
Nice talk. So let's see, maybe a dozen years ago, late 2000s, there were lots of people, well, some groups of people trying to make binary population synthesis models by the folks who make BPAS. And, you know, back in the 2010s, everyone just kind of wanted to ignore them because it just made population synthesis so much more complicated because of all the additional parameters. But they persisted. And, um, you know, when first LIGO results came out, their, all their work was cited. Um, so I was just wondering, it's kind of a high level question, but the survey like this, how does that inform um, the parameters that go into or the models, uh, the binary population synthesis models? Yeah, I mean, there are two things. The, the first thing, I mean, the very easy thing on our side is that as this population is not known in the nearby universe, you try to map this. And this is the first thing. And it's important in itself because of the physics uh, behind this kind of object. The other thing is that we, so far we don't know how to estimate this because, in fact, I have a, a student that is doing this, this work like following the evolution of the two stars in the system, not theoretically speaking. Um, and, and there are a number of uh, channels or different ways to end up with this system at a certain uh, epoch in the evolution of uh, these two stars. And then the point is that when you were able to do this from the theoretical side of modeling and from the observation, comparing these two things, you'll be able to say something more. So far, you don't know even the, uh, uh, the effect of, of metallicity on this. You only know part of the population of the galaxy. So it's so kind of uh, really in the first steps of this science. And uh, it's not easy because not even for instance, uh, knowing the fraction of binaries at uh, this uh, mass range per galaxy, it's something that you know for sure. You know, so yeah, it, it's a long way to go. Okay, we need to move to the next talk. We thanks Denise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this I can leave there. I'm sorry, I lost the program. <laughs> Okay. Now, uh, Song Young Yoon will speak about, about the eye greens survey of young stellar object. He works in the CASI. Hi, uh, I'm Song Yong Yoon at Kasi, a uh, graduate student at Kyung University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the eye green survey of young stellar objects. First, I'll give a short description of star formation. At the beginning of star formation, giant molecular clouds form into the cores by gravitational collapse. The material surrounding cores generate circumstellar disks. The envelopes got clicked onto the disk, lose their angular momentum, and finally are clicked onto the protostar. Just then outflows eject, eject a part of the mass from the protostar. As the time passes, the outflows from protostar and circumstellar disks further develop, and envelopes gradually disappear. When protostars are young, most fluxes come from IR and submillimeter wavelengths. And then, when and that loss finally disappear, protoplanetary disks remain, but protostars still operate through the circumstellar disks. So we are, so at this phase we are so and then the when finally envelope finally disappears, protoplanetary disks remain and uh, we are able to see the young stellar object through visible light. Then the mass of occlusion or YSO approaches the end and planets and debris disk remain. It is essential for protostars to operate the mass from the circumstellar disks. Envelopes that extend from 100 to 1000 AU scales are created onto the disk and move inward. The inner motor region of the disk is channeled to protostars by magnetic fields 
which radiate mass occlusion to the star. The inner region of the disk consists of the gas within one AU in which test three of planets form. Therefore, it is important to investigate the physical phenomena and chemical properties associated with the planet and star formation. However, it is difficult to observe inner region directly due to the spatial resolution limit. So we would like to observe the YSOs with high resolution spectroscopy to resolve them in velocity component. Iris is a proper instrument for our purpose. The near infrared light provided by iGreens is able to uncover protostars and protoplanetary disks which, which are extinct in visible light. Also, it is efficient to observe sources since iGreens cover H and K band simultaneously. The high resolution 45,000 can resolve the light profiles that distinguish the kinematics of the system. The difference in resolution is remarkable, remarkable compared to specs of IRA. So our total sample uh, has 90A, uh, which consists of 45 class one sources, 16 class two, nine class three, 17 FUORs, eight Holbig AB, and three Matthew ISOs. The spectra shows different features by object types. As you can see from the C over to band spectra, plus one sources have emission and absorption spectra in CO, and some have broadened the line features, while plus two and three have only absorption spectra. It indicates that plus one sources have a higher occlusion rate by which optically seen this atmosphere is heated. The emission spectra also can be seen in some Herbig AB star and FUOs. The absorption spectra in class two and three sources are regarded as photospheric features. Eigen spectra shows various atomic and molecular lines in H and K band. The ion to four with line and H2 lines in emission in H appears in H band, while K band spectra show hydrogen recombination line and H2 lines in emission together with atomic and molecular lines in absorption. Each line arises from different physical environment. There's a four, uh, ion two fold between line and hydrogen molecular lines mostly arise from jets and outflows or circumstellar disks. The emission lines of ion two and H2 can be seen in early phase protostar, especially in the case of ion two line it primarily appears in class one sources. Ion two line has several velocity components in which high and low velocity components appear separately by jets and outflows. On the other hand, H2 emission has low velocity components compared to the ion line, which indicates that H2 emission arises from a different area from ion two line. The ion two lines is rare in class two sources, which generally shows H2, H2 emission only. It indicates that jets and outflows have been developed properly at early phase protostars. H2 emission also have several velocity components, which indicates that these arise from different places. We can fit the line and estimate temperature density and we can infer the mechanism of the line emission via a rotational diagram. The protostars accrete material along magnetic field uh, channel to inner disks, which emit strong energy exciting surrounding gas. From this, hydrogen recombination lines, in, including bracket gamma line, arise. From the bracket gamma fluxes, we can estimate the mass accretion rate of wire source. Observed the hydrogen line shows different fluxes by mass occlusion rate of protostars. So if we get a relation between occlusion luminosity and bracket gamma luminosity, we will be realized that they have a linear relation on local space. Hence, the bracket gamma line play a 
plays a role in estimating the mass occlusion rate of wire source. Also, bracket comma line have various line profiles which are affected by outflows such as disk winds as well as mountain spherical accretion. The ascent inner disk is lifted from the disk atmosphere by ascent or disk wind and accelerate along magnetic fields affecting the bracket comma line profile. As you see in the figure, we can infer the geometry and physical properties between the protostar and inner disk through the bracket gamma line profile. Also, the near infrared spectra of wire source shows show various atomic and molecular absorption lines. In general, absorption spectra arise from the protostar photosphere, of which physical properties such as temperature, surface gravity, magnetic field, rotational velocity, and bearing lead to spectral characteristics. The high resolution eigen spectra is are able to show absorption features which have been identified, and the physical properties of YSO can be derived from comparing it with stellar atmospheric models. On the other hand, in some YSOs, the inner disk atmosphere heated by stellar, stellar radiation at a high occlusion rate, which is generated emission, which generates emission in atomic and molecular species. In this case, we are able to estimate the physical properties of the inner disk. At high occlusion rates, some YSOs show the emission spectra in C over ten bands, which shows various line profiles by physical properties of the disk. And we are able to estimate the temperature density geometry and kinematics of disk comparing with the disk model. And next is I'm gonna talk about the spectral characteristics of episodic occlusion in YSOs. The mass occlusion of YSO is variable over time due to the low mass occlusion of the disk compared to the envelope occlusion, the mass of the disk is filed up gradually. And occasionally, if it is dumped onto the star, brightness increases by several magnitudes. We call these objects as FUOLINES objects, in short, FUOLINES. Our first thing, protostars have, have very hot mid, disk mid plane around 10,000 K, which fluxes overwhelming the protostars luminosity. The radiation from the disk is observed in the disk atmosphere, which produce absorption spectra. The FUOS spectra observed with eyeglass shows golden line profiles, which are consistent with the disk models. Such an occlusion bars are often found in classic two sources, which are uh, lack of, which have a lack of envelopes. However, protostars at uh, earlier phase are surrounded by envelopes, so it is difficult to detect our first. Well, uh, one of our class one samples shows different line profiles from other class one sources. It shows broadened line profiles that are consistent with the FEO or spectra. However, any outposts were not detected, so we investigate line profiles to determine the source physical state. There are two mechanisms that broaden line profiles. One is the rotation of the protostellar photosphere, and another is the rotation of the disk undergoing the operation burst, which produces a double peak to a boxy profile. We examine the spectra by comparing that with the temporary spectra compared with, with each kinematics. As a result, uh, the protostar spectra have shown a spectral type of m drop and the line profiles are consistent with the temporary spectra compared with disk rotation and velocity over 40, over 40 km per sec. So we conclude that uh, this, this source uh, has been undergone on an operation burst. We expect more protostars that show the spectral features of occlusion burst exist, and we continue observations of young protostars. Also, the high resolution of eyeglass enables us to examine the FUO spectra in detail. 
we found that actually spectra are similar to those of brown dwarf stars or uh, late high dwarfs. This have this have uh, so so this we we continue this uh, analysis to uh, study physical and chemical properties of inner gaseous disk. And then we have conducted monitoring observations at infrared submillimeter wavelengths to detect uh, variability in YSOs. We use JCMT at 450 and A50 microns to investigate thermal variability in YSOs. And we use neowise or sky survey to find the variability. We, we found several YSOs having variability and we implemented all our observations to examine the physical states of YSOs. Our CASI team arranged the uh, variable YSOs and proposed IGRIS observations to Germany South to study physical properties of protostar and circumstellar disks. This is a summary. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, questions from the audience? Thanks for the talk. Questions? No? Slack? Uh, no, nothing. Nothing? Uh, could you please come back to the slide a uh, couple, couple of times before? That's one. No, the next one. Yes. Yeah. You have. There are di different uh, features in the relative flux and the velocity uh -huh. plot. Uh -huh. uh, I'm sh I, I would like to, to ask you, because I'm not an expert in this term, which is the difference because of, of the two features in, the, in that plot? Uh, this one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is because the... you have a, a, a 10 kilometers per second of difference. Uh -huh. Is because of rotation or because of what? This is the cellar rotation of 60 kilometers per second, and uh, these are these are uh, disk rotation of 40 kilometers. Ah, is because of a disk? Yeah, it's a it's a temporary spectra and uh, comparable with the models. Ah, okay. And uh, these are sources spectra. I understand now. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any question in the audience? No, Ms. Luck? No. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. Next talk. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay, next, next speaker is Bruno Diaz from University of uh, Tarapacá. He will speak about the Magellan Cloud history told by their star clusters. Okay, well, I have my timer here as well. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, well, I'll be talking about the Magellanic Cloud. I think that what uh, Gemini is doing for the science case. So first of all, I'd like to thank very much for the SOC and for the LOC for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be back to a Gemini conference. Actually, that brings me some memories. In 2007, I was a student, and the second Gemini meeting was actually my very first international science conference. That was the way of my advisor to show me how the astronomy world works. And I was quite pleased to see that, and I'm here now. So thanks to, to your community. You can recognize some faces. OK, so about the Magellanic Clouds. OK, so what do I have to say about them? So. The southern hemisphere is very interesting I mean, because you have the Milky Way bulge, you have the Magellanic cloud. So why is this so interesting that brought a lot of attention, a lot of investment to build a lot of telescopes here in the southern hemisphere? So uh, in the 70s, there was this large map of the whole sky uh, that traced the gas, right? So they found this beautiful, what is called now the Magellanic stream. That's actually the trailing structure that's left behind the orbits of the LMC and SMC around the Milky Way, right? A few years later, 
there was a confirmation uh, of the leading part that's actually crossing the Milky Way disk in the line of sight. So that was kind of difficult to prove, but they, they got it right. So the beginning, so when you have only the, the training structure, you can think about the run pressure stripping. That's only gas interaction between the halo of the Milky Way and the SMC. But when you have the both kind of opposite structures there, then you have gravity and tides taking place. So if it's moving the gas, it's also moving the stars, okay? So this is what we are looking for now for stellar populations. That's kind of fitting in uh, what I'm saying later, right? But even if you think about tidal forces, tidal stripping, it's not straightforward. How did the LMC and SMC ended up in this configuration nowadays? So there are still two very independent and completely different uh, paradigms. The one on the left here called the bound scenario, that's the classical, the, the canonical scenario that says that the LMC and SMC, they are bound to the Milky Way, meaning that there are dwarf satellite galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way and their orbits kind of synchronized. So now they are a pair of galaxies. And there is this new, relatively new from 2007, the PhD thesis of Ugortina Bezla. So saying that the LMC and LMC, they are kind of a pair, binary pair of two, two galaxies that are in their first in fall to the Milky Way. So they just arrived to the Milky Way vicinity, right? So they're completely different, but still both ideas, when you go to simulations, they can reproduce kind of the, the whole general broad view of this gas stream. So the leading arm, the Magellanic stream, but there are still a few uh, things like fine tuning the very specific position of the two galaxies, uh, the double filaments. And if you see here on the left, you see that there is like two filaments coming out here from this simulation that's kind of seen in the uh, in the, the observations that's not reproduced by the other and so on. So there's still some some steps there to to really find what was the past of these galaxies, right? So here at least a few uh, observational evidence that kind of support one and another and some discussions here. So this double filamentary structure in the Magellanic stream is actually real. So uh, there are some studies showing that the kinematics and the chemistry are different and they match uh, the LMC and SMC. So apparently the gas is pulling out from the two galaxies, right? So the bound scenario, the classical scenario uh, can reproduce that with simulations. And the first and first scenario says that uh, could not, but they apparently they argue that it depends heavily on the initial conditions from the SMC. So it's really important to know how was the SMC at the beginning, because now we know that the SMC is really disrupted structure and then has a line of sight depth that's huge uh, and has tidal arms and streams everywhere. So. How was the, the initial conditions? This is an important question, but the answer is not trivial. And that apparently uh, causes a lot of impact on the results from the simulations. Another prediction here is the, the LMC look awake then. So this is a prediction from the first in fall scenario saying that, okay, basically if, it, if you have the LMC that's really massive falling into the Milky Way, so when it passes through the stellar populations, the outer halo, it will cause some dis disturbance there and it will cause some local density of stars. And that was recently found by our observations. Right? It was a nature paper last year. Uh, okay, so this was uh, a prediction and, and a confirmation of observations. And another topic that's very interesting is the plane of satellites problem. So the Lambda CDM cosmology predicts that we have dwarf galaxies surrounding large galaxies. Okay. But their orbits should not be organized as a plane, should not be very tight organized. But the observation shows in the Milky Way and another two galaxies that dwarf galaxies are actually organized in a plane. And by coincidence or not, the LMC orbits are matching the kinematics and the position there of this vast polar structure, for example. So the question that remains is, is the LMC the cause of this vast polar structure or not, right? So the bound scenario, the classical scenario says that, okay, if you think about 
the LMC and SMC orbs kind of synchronized. So why not the other galaxies as well? So they could synchronize and be able to in, in this. Personally, I think that's a wrong shot, but there is a paper uh, uh, discussing that. And on the other, other context, uh, there are some simulations thinking about the LMC bringing together the SMC to the, the Milky Way, along with other smaller dwarf galaxies. And there are some simulations showing that, and the observations from Gaia, so we have this proper motions, parallaxes, beautiful data. Uh, so there are some studies there that already confirmed like four dwarf galaxies that belong or are compatible with the kinematics and positions of the orbits of the, the LMC. So apparently the LMC could have brought a small system of galaxies to the Milky Way. So that's pretty interesting. And then other, other details from the simulations that you need to consider uh, some mass for, for the LMC. So usually the classical models, all the simulations assume like a, a lighter mass and uh, the first thing false scenario assumes a heavier mass. And there have been many recent studies with different observational evidence showing that the LMC is actually heavier than previously thought. So it kind of endorses better the, the first thing false scenario. So also the, the potential for the dark matter that they assume it's simpler in the bound scenarios is more realistic than the other. And the proper motions is another source of uncertainties here because the classical uh, scenarios, the, the, the simulations, they use usually the ground-based proper motions that have a large uncertainties is less precise. There's some discussion there on the accuracy, but well, let's leave it there. Uh, so the space-based, um, uh, Proper motions have a better precision there. So I see some more green here on the left. So I think that the first and foremost scenario is winning this, this, this thing. So it's gaining a lot of uh, attention recently. And that, that's the, the current paradigm recently uh, currently accepted. Okay. Right. So the Magellanic system is in the, its first thing fall there, right? And we know that it can reproduce the, the gas structures. We have these two events and some scenario to explain it. So the next step would be stellar populations, right? So if gravity is taking place, is moving away gas, it should move also stars. So where are those stars? So their main surface covering the large area of the sky, it's large, then easy just said, right? The SMC is huge. So if you want to cover this, not only the SMC, but the LMC and the, the stream and the 200 degrees, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So there are many surveys that are complement each other in wavelength and variability and area of coverage and so on. So I just like to point out a few of them here so we have an idea. I am particularly interested on star clusters that I try to put in my uh, work here on the Viscata survey that's concerned the star clusters specifically. So why the star clusters to trace the stellar populations of the, the Magellanic clouds and what, what information they can bring here, right? So the idea is that star clusters are very good standard candles. So we can measure distances if you have the photometry very well. So if you have a population of star clusters around the, the Magellanic clouds, we can trace the standard structure. So we have the 3D structures of these galaxies, right? On the top of this, we can have their ages. So we have a timeline, right, of the past history and 3D structure. So it's great. So you are building up only using these guys as fossils. And also we have the metallicity. So we have the chemical enrichment history and uh, and on top of this, we have also uh, the opportunity to do kinematics. So that's why where uh, Gemini will fit in. I'll show you in the next slide. And on the top of the all of the things that we can have the structure of the galaxies using the star clusters, the star clusters themselves, their internal structures, they have their internal evolution, okay, because of the the, the interactions between the stars. But these internal evolution sometimes can be affected by external forces, external effects. So we can use this internal characteristics of the star clusters also to trace something that happened in the Magellanic system. Okay. So the idea here is to end up with a 3D map of the star clusters, tracing everything that we can using these star clusters, right? 
Okay, so just go to the current service, right? So Bruno, come on, just go there and take the data. Don't need to apply for more telescope time. It's expensive. Leave time for the others. Come on. No. So uh, yeah, but no. I'll show you why. So the idea here is I show the limiting magnitude of the current service and the, the image quality that you can reach with this service. So you can see clearly the jump between the two meter telescope size base surveys to the four meter ones that's uh, jumping photometric depth. So it can reach actually in the, the color magnitude diagram. You, you need deep photometry to reach the oldest stellar population. So where you can measure ages, okay? But the thing here is that uh, they're all ground based and limited by atmospheric turbulence. So for the core of the star clusters, it's not useful. So we cannot do properly a photometry of the star clusters themselves. These surveys are great for a general view of all the field stars, star populations, viability. They have a lot of results that are very interesting, but for the star clusters, no. So it could go to space. So Gaia would solve it because have everything, but it's shallow photometry. So it just read barely the red clump stars and maybe the top of the main sequence for younger star clusters. And HST could do it, but for a large program, like very many clusters there that are not super beautiful as the globular clusters and many stars there, it's not, uh, it's not feasible. So the compromise we found with the Viscaccia that comes to the rescue here is using adaptive optics in a four meter telescope with a solar telescope in the neural lab. So the idea is that uh, I can reach like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 arc seconds maximum the I band. Uh, and I show here, link here. So the difference between imaging the core of a star cluster. So this is the image of uh, one, one example from the Viscatra survey. And here in a comparison of the core with and without AO between like an example, the, the Viscatra and the Smash survey, okay? So I can imagine here how it would be like with an eight meter telescope, huh? it would be great. And if I compare directly the color magnitude diagrams here in rings, okay, so you can appreciate here that in the outskirts of this region, the photometry with and without a yield, they are comparable, high quality, deep, and that's fine as expected. As you go down to the core of the star clusters, so we really need this uh, adaptive optics to, to solve, to find this compromise if you want to, to study star clusters. Okay, so just a brief summary of the Viscatra service and the statistics here. So essentially have more than 40 members working nowadays and more than 200 clusters observed so far and 80% completion. This is the photometric part. So. Uh, right now, I think it's a bit difficult to open the dome, but I hope that by September, the weather will be better so when the Magellanic clouds are up on the sky. Again, I just the neighbor, so I think that would be difficult, but in September, I think that will be fine as well. So Gemini jumps in here for the spectroscopic follow-up. So we are using GMOS, okay, so in a large program, no, not a large program properly, but we are applying for them for uh, uh, three national problem with the three different tags. Tags so have to manage all the three countries there, and then get the time at the end for another drill. Okay. Uh, so the GMOS we are using the calcium triplet spectroscopy for mood with masks there, right? So we can get metallicities and radio velocity. So we get the the component. Uh, on the line of sight for the velocity. So remember that from the photometry, I already have the 3D positions. So the goal here is to have the 3D velocities. So we get the spectroscopy from, from calcium triplet that's actually cheap because they really ha have your strong lines. And the proper motions we get from Gaia. So we have all the phase space vector completely for the, for the motion here. Okay. And well, as a byproduct, I produced this like distortion map of the GMOS field. I talked to Herman Jimeno, he, he said that uh, it was not done this kind of detail before, so it was useful. In the center is okay, in the corners as known, right? It's, it's a bit distorted, but it's about like maximum two at second, so we don't care. In the center here, that's useful for us, it's okay. Then the guy for promotions. 
Right. So I'll just send those one example here of science case, having many others if you want to, to discuss later. But for the sake of time, I'll focus on one example here that where the Gemini data were crucial for our results. And so this first and fourth scenario, there were some simulations done in 2012 that predicted that about 150 to 100 million years ago, there was a close encounter between the LMC and the SMC. So they are a pair of galaxies, but they are not like strongly, uh, they, they kind of oscillate, right? Their relative distance, they oscillate. So about 200 million years ago, they have a different uh, uh, directly shock there that caused some distortions in the LMC. So the LMC is essentially a disk. So it's tilted on the sky, but caused a warp. And on the SMC, it caused a bridge. So this bridge, same drill as the Magellanic stream that was really big, but the, the local structure there is the same thing. So it caused some stripping of gas, but also of stars. So for the LMC, when you see it edge on, so this me holding the LMC here, uh, a reference. So the LMC is like 50 kiloparsecs and from us, and the LMC is 60 kiloparsecs from us. So the LMC is tilted on sky like this towards the LMC, and the warp is more or less like here and towards the SMC as well. And the idea is that some models predicted that the warp the observations confirmed it with this mesh survey, and we're looking for the star cluster. So is there any signature there that we can find the, the warp? So the distances themselves will come in the next paper. We already have the results, but they will not spoil them here. Uh, but we studied the internal structure of the star clusters here, and then we found something that is really curious. Uh, here, essentially, uh, the colors of the star clusters don't bother about the details. They only show the region here around the, the LMC, right? So the red points here shows the clusters that are around the LMC warp. And they show a larger dispersion in the internal structure of the star clusters. And we don't know why. This we didn't expect that. So this is something interesting that we found. And we are looking for 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 the investigations here to understand which kind of external forces, if any, could be could have been affecting the, the internal structure of them. So the SMC, and that will be my, my last point, the SMC, that's the structure is kind of uh, more difficult here. The bridge here and the contours are gas, okay? So you see that this orange part, yellow part here is the, the heavy bridge of gas, okay? And the red and blue points are from this study here using Gaia data uh, that shows with some selection that the red points are younger stellar populations that matches the gas, meaning that when the gas was pulled out, it was forming a star, so that makes sense. But there was also a discovery now of uh, older stellar population that's forming a bridge here towards the south. So that's very interesting because these stars were already formed by the time when the bridge was formed, okay? So this was pulling down. If I go to the beta catalog that contains some heterogeneous age compilation from literature, but still can see some uh, some relations there. We see the two uh, bridges there of younger and older stellar clusters. And we found that there is a third bridge to the north with intermediate age stellar clusters. And here with the full phase space vector for a shorter sample for starting, we studied exactly this northern bridge and the opposite side. And we found here that they are moving away. So not only they are aligned with the direction between the SMC and LMC, but these clusters are moving towards and away from the LMC. So this is clearly, uh, uh, I interpret it, it's clearly, uh, it's moving. So as the bridge and the counter bridge structure, so these two tidal, uh, tidal events here. And for the future here, there are many, many other telescopes and instruments following up this. But I'd say that they are broad in general for the field stars, for gas and stellar populations. For the Gemini, what I think is that's playing this role in the star clusters, for example, like follow up specific targets going very deep. So adaptive optics, going deep photometry, core of the clusters, spectroscopic follow up. That would be my goal for, for the very near future present, I would say. 
maybe like high resolution spectroscopy, we're seeing ghosts there to do stellar populations, really heavy chemical evolutions and so on. I leave you with my take home message and thank you for your time. Thanks, Bruno. Is there any question from the audience? No, Slack? Yep. No? Okay, I have no questions because I part of the project, <laughs> but uh, I would like to, to make a comment and uh, is I would like to emphasize the, the importance of the synergy between photometry and spectroscopy, because if we want to understand the, the chemical evolution of the SMC or any galaxy, we need to know a lot of things, uh, metallicity, ages, distances, but that is not enough. We need radial velocities and metallicity with the, the, the accuracies of the, the um, that the spectroscopy can give us. So for us, it was very much important to, to have the, the possibility to, to observe star clusters with a, a lot of star clusters with the same instrument with GMOs. And it was a, a, a complement of the Viscata survey very much important. So I would like to emphasize that the, the possibility to observe a lot of clusters with the same instrument is, is something very important and necessary. Okay, the questions? Uh, nice talk. Uh, I wonder uh, with uh, in the you saw the work of the uh, of the Magellanic clouds, and I, I didn't have a clear is uh, which is the model that is uh, supporting this work is uh, I mean the bound or the infall. And another related question is uh, what do you think? is the more appropriate the model for explaining the like the formation of the large Magellanic clouds and the association with the Milky Way. Yeah. Well, this model here is from Basel 2012. That's the first info scenario. So there are some simulations there that produce this. So, uh, well, personally, I'm, I was tempted a lot of time to do to follow the classical scenario because they have collected a lot of evidence, not only in the structure, but also chemical evolution, stellar populations. There are lots of other evidence that we're trying to match for a long time, many decades. So there are some evidence there for the classical scenario. So I was kind of defending that since until a while ago. But now I'm turning to the, the first thing for because there are new events now that are more compelling and then more accurate data and they're getting creative and in independent evidence. So that's I think that's that's key. So when you have independent information there from different predictions and then can prove that with observations, I think that's supporting a lot this first thing for. But there's still a lot of open questions for them to answer because they still have to run models to explain everything that the classical scenario explained before. So there's still open questions that I mean yet to be answered. So that's here is the next cap chapter now. So we are in our side we are keep collecting evidence on the side, for example, for the SMC structure. So they really need that for the initial condition. So with the stack classes we hope to have some hints on that. Okay, I think uh, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Quick question. Okay, uh, this is Songcho uh, from Kasi. Um, I'm I'm what I'm curious about uh, in the LMC system is uh, how how your uh, you know the first info scenario and your dyna dynamical model and observations that supports or explains about the age metallicity gap in the LMC uh, star clusters. Yeah, that's a very good point. I have not seen any of these yet. I think that's one of the open questions that I, I want them to explain, but there is none, no, no, no model so far, but uh, that's very curious. For those who don't know, the, the age gap is talking about that the LMC has stars, huge stars for all ages, but star clusters have ages from young down to three billion years, and there is a jump, and then you don't have any clusters between three and 10 billion years. And then you have older clusters that are similar to globular clusters. So this is a puzzle that we, is one of the questions that we try to do, try to solve with this catch a survey on the goal of the mass of this, the cluster. So the very massive clusters are studied and define the, the LMCH gap. 
but and the field stars do not present. So what happens in between, like the intermediate mass star cluster? So do they show some intermediate transition, something? I don't know. So we are trying to answer this with the Viscata survey, for example. As for the models, still to see. Okay, uh, we don't have more time for questions. So we'll, let's thank Bruno again and coffee time. Okay, so we're going to get up and get a little bit of exercise. Who is in charge of the conference photo? Ah, okay. <laughs> the conference photo is actually going to occur on the stage. I invite everybody just to come up. Um, and we have the photographer here as well. Uh, so, so Tom, do you want to just direct everyone? Okay, so um, we need a more light. And then, um, okay, 저기, 여기 불좀 약간 밝게 켜질 수 있을까요? 저희가 사진을 찍어야 되기 때문에. And then, uh, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, we, we don't have any banner, you know. So I, I was thinking about, yes. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, the stair thing, things. And then, but, you know, since that, that gives us more view and angle for the everybody, so maybe we can go outside and then, you know, is it good? Okay. On the stairs. Central's in charge. Yeah. But <laughs> if we don't, uh, we, if we don't have uh, the banner or, you know, uh, dead things. Okay. 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 Can you do it? I mean, the, on the, on the lobby. Yeah. Okay. Ah, you mean the that? Hi, <laughs> the virtual attendees. Can you take the turn your videos on? We're gonna take a photo of you. <laughs> we're like Photoshop. <laughs> okay, three, two, one. I can see Stephanie. <laughs> All right, don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, Tiag and uh, Ji Hoon Kim and Mina, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm gonna do. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's go outside. I mean, the, let's go on the lobby. And then we, we, we have a stair area, so we can just, you know, distribute oh. people around the stairs. Then I go upstairs and then take a photo. All of you, okay? Good. <laughs> Let's go to the stairs. Tiago, I see you uh, picking a good background. Yeah, um, I was just trying to move around a little bit for, for the light. So, sorry, what are they going to screenshot us or what? I think they already took a, they already took a picture and then they went in all outside or something. I think. Um, <laughs> well, I posted a Zoom link in the general channel, but I, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm sort of feeling slightly left out of you know the talks are fine, but it's the socializing part that's kind of kind of missing from this yeah Where is they didn't everybody? organize they didn't organize anything for us to socialize but um hey, but it's a lesson candies. to it's a lesson to to learn i guess they could have 
a station in the room where during the coffee break anybody can sit and chat on the Zoom, for example. I I, I don't know. Um, well, I mean that's harder because breaking for a moment. Uh, you're welcome to stay and hang out via chat or head on over to Stephen's social Zoom hour. Um, it looks like we'll be back 15 okay. minutes after the hour, but um, <laughs> this room's empty for a moment. Yeah, we know. All right. Well, <laughs> well, if people want to take a break, that's fine. But I'm I'm uh, waiting on. I've, I've got two screens going here, and I'd I'd love to chat sort of uh, face to face with one or two people just to find out what the heck's going. You know, not well, not find out what's going on, just sort of socialize. Uh, in in the link that I posted in the uh, in the Slack, um, that sounds good to people. Stephanie, uh, Joel, I'd love to talk to you and find out what your reactions about this are from uh, as people who've gone to gym, many multiple Gemini meetings meetings over the past. Like I, I don't even know how many people are in the room because the view is kind of it's not from up, right? It's like. Do, do we know how many people are there in, this? in, in the room? In, in, Zoom. Would... in Zoom, 12. No, no, in, in the, at the conference in Seoul. At, at the conference? Right now, there's, uh, we, right now, there's, right now, we don't, I'm looking we don't at the see GSM the room audience. at all, right? We don't see the, the, the room at all. So for people giving their talk online, they they, they don't um, they have no idea. Like, is there twenty people there or two hundred? Like the view from to the room is oh, too flat. So you don't so see from. Up. The... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking at the um, uh, GSM audience uh, one, yeah. and I. Yeah. I yeah, and I well, I, I, it looks like fifty-ish people. Like you made a comment after your talk, like there was a reaction. You said something in your online talk, and there was a reaction, and you were not even capable to read the crowd, right? But yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. always hard. And so normally, you you normally what happens though is like the person, you know, because Janice was supposed to be doing the exact opposite of what she was doing, which was to 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 uh, make sure that the question was repeated and the answer was repeated to 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 the speaker. Yeah, I saw her um, connected in on the Zoom. And that was nice to know there's a, a real person who's actually there but who's also on the Zoom. That was a nice link. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, but you know, Stephanie, you've been to multiple GSMs over the years. What, what is this sort of typical of the science? Like, it's really so. I mean, I, I normally go to CFHD users meetings, um, and the science is very <laughs> different when you go to Gemini. Uh, it's sort of um, much more stellar. Well, much more stellar. But I guess we've had the stellar populations talks more today. But well, I like the <laughs> formula that you have sessions dedicated to a particular subject so that you have several talks on it, it, it it's you know it, it's not like se sessions where you really go from a to z it, it's a particular uh focus i i i really like this format yeah right. uh, it, it, so so to answer your question so every germany science conference has been different because the host was usually choosing the formula like some some of them they decided okay we're gonna focus on exoplanets and the uh, harwich universe that's gonna be the main theme you, you know like every conference was a bit uh difference in 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 what would be the highlighted uh fields so Right. But of course, um, because of the strength of Gemini, you, you will always have like an exoplanet dedicated session, right? Or it's, uh... Yeah, I mean, if you've got GPI, you can, yeah. like, can't really not have an exoplanet <laughs> session. Exactly. To it. Whereas, so... Yeah. And then um, I guess the yeah. other question I have, like, like all these are like, a lot of the talks are kind of, 
uh, we did a survey with, I don't know, CFHT or VLT or something like that, but we use Gemini as the specialist comic follow-up. I guess that's, well, that's what typical. it is. It's the, like this, yeah, yeah. If you look at the, it's the papers, it's very rare. I mean, and that it's not only true for Gemini, it's for any eight meter telescope. It's very rare to have, well, no, no, it's not rare, but most papers are multi-telescope papers. So, it, it, well, you know that yeah. from CDC statistics. You probably have statistics on that, right? It's, uh, well, I mean, we don't have, I, have I can tell you statistics for what, you know, uh, the, the things that I'm on are <laughs> like, but um, I'm on, you know, so I'm mostly mega, CFHD mega cams. That tends to be the thing that, you know, you do the big survey first and then yeah. you kind of. Oh, right. oh my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Maybe we should go to your <laughs> Zoom yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the people are coming oh, yeah, sure, to the sure. party. <laughs> Hello. Yes, yes. Oh my God. We're here. We're here. Do you mind going to my Zoom? I, just, I would, I really I would like to talk to you. I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly, slightly, because we're both in. Okay, I, I'm gonna. Yeah, I think Joel is off, uh, but I can, I can text him. Okay, okay. see you later. <laughs> yep, see you in a bit. No problem. Well, that's important. I hope you see today, but I looked at my recording that I made while I was partying with the box. I don't know why I did uh, do that as well. I'm very sweet. Okay, well, the good thing is that you see it. Okay. Does that pass the pass? Oh, 
For uh, things like that, I'm, I'm, I'm good with doing stuff. I just, <laughs> it always just causes more stress. Like, if you take off my title, you're responsible for it. Uh, well, be nice. Right. Okay, I won't do that to you. But I'm like, Thank you. 
Yeah, I hard know it's where we find in uh in uh Arizona, because uh, <laughs> poor Robert Sparks is uh, running the streaming. Oh, from Arizona? From Arizona. So all the people from uh, Yes. Oh, the recording. I know. Well, at least he started, and it's a reasonable time. And, I and then I guess he set some alarm, like in the middle of the yeah. alarm. Oh, okay. I think he checked off. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this continuous thing like that. No. Yeah, I've had several weeks that at first I was like, oh, maybe I'll attend because they're like important stuff is going on. And then they're at one in the morning and I was just like, I can't do it. I just tell me what happened. And like, yeah. <laughs> I can't. So you've been waking up before your alarm here? Yeah. Um, I, well, I got here a week ago and I was visiting Kathy for a few days. Um, so I've now totally adjusted. Oh, you yeah. have. But the first few nights I was waking up at like 3 30 for a while. Well, I guess I guess yeah. I'm sleeping in better because I wake up at like five ish that's and my alarm is set for six. Oh, um, that's okay. Yeah. But I mean, I never wake up more. <laughs> I guess I, um, for an astronomer, I have an amazing um, like sleep rhythm connected to the sun. And so I always wake up when the sun comes up, no matter where I am. So Jocelyn? Yeah. She did a night shift. And did the night shift, jump on the plane now. Yeah. <laughs> she said as long as her sleep schedule is all messed up, she might as well just go to different times of the year. Yeah, I'm going um, straight from this back to the US for a week. And I think my friend said I'm going to be really messed up with my zone. But I will probably be partying at the wedding until midnight because I won't know what time it is anyway. So it'll work great for I usually get tired earlier. Well, <laughs> yeah, as long as the wedding's not in the morning ish. Yeah. Nice afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, perfect. So where where's that? In New York. New York? Oh, that's gonna be cool. Oh, that's gonna be long. Oh, cool. oh, that's gonna be long. Nice. That's okay. It's, it's actually the second longest flight I've ever made. Um, I did uh, Joe Burke to Atlanta. 
Okay, see, so I don't know how many light powers. Yeah. But my worst one was something like 23 powers on the clock. Oh. You know, if I start the stopwatch. Yeah. From La Serena all the way back to Google. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I mean, it's, a lot of people don't realize how it twists and, and it's like the same uh, yeah. longitude <laughs> as New York. Yeah. <laughs> but other hemisphere and uh there were layovers that were kind of long but not long enough that you could go anywhere and see and then first thing i got back in white they're like uh jerry we have a server now it's coming it's looking like okay i'm gonna take a shower so i'll take a shower it's gonna do nothing I don't know. Someone took it. Oh. Yeah. That's my choo choo. Because of how much JWST stuff going on. Every time someone's like, I got um yes. Uh, yes. Well, hi. <laughs> oh, oh, your talk was my super <laughs> fun. <laughs> I I did um wrestle with Jacob Dean. I was not involved in the Red X, okay. but I got the first one counted. So I, oh, I yeah. okay. Right. You were okay, everybody. Oh. Just get started in a minute. Maybe we can uh, keep the lights a little brighter so we don't fall asleep. A little bit, yeah. Or in the back. Okay. The oh, oh, the lights a little bit brighter. Oh, okay. Okay. So the chair for our last session of the day is Jennifer Burtz. You're stuck with me again. I'm so sorry. In my messy right. Okay. Okay, so as a reminder to our two speakers, I believe you both have 15 minutes for your talks. So I will wave my little clipboard when you have five minutes remaining and then stand up and get increasingly close to you as the 15 minutes are up. <laughs> Um, okay, so kicking off our last session, our last speaking session for today, uh, we have two more talks about exoplanet science. The first one being given by Megan Mansfield, who's at University of Arizona, and will be telling us about efforts to characterize transiting exoplanets at high resolution. So take it away, Megan. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's better. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. So I'm super excited to be here today to kind of introduce to all of you a little bit of what we can do for exoplanet spectroscopy at high resolution. Um, so I'm going to be mostly focusing this talk around a um, large program I'm leading with iGRINS. But along the way, I'm hoping I'll give you a little bit of background on, um, in general, how we do exoplanet spectroscopy with high resolution instruments and some of like why we're interested in studying this. All right, so first, um, why are we interested in studying the compositions of exoplanet atmospheres? Um, so there's a wide variety of different reasons. Um, we wanna eventually do things like look for gases that could indicate habitability or signs of life in small planet atmospheres. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about hot Jupiter's large hot gas giant planets, where um, one of the big questions that we want to answer is, um, how did these planets form and how did they end up in their current close-in orbits? 
And one of the ways we can investigate this is by measuring their molecular abundances. Um, so specifically here, I'm showing a plot looking at the carbon to oxygen ratio as these planets are forming. So the idea in this plot is as you go out from the star in the protoplanetary disk, um, the disk is going to get colder and various molecules like water and CO and CO2 will condense out from the gas into solid grains in the disk. And so depending on where your planet forms and whether it's mostly accreting solids or mostly accreting gases, um, you can get a different carbon to oxygen ratio in the atmosphere of that forming planet. So the idea is now if we take observations of um, hot Jupiters and we measure the carbon to oxygen ratio, we can kind of back out this information on where these planets might have formed. So the problem with uh, previous measurements to uh, look at the carbon to oxygen ratio in these hot Jupiter planets is that they've really been limited by um, low wavelength coverage and low resolution. So one of the uh, premier instruments that been, has been used to look at hot Jupiters is um, the Wide Field Camera 3 on the Hubble Space Telescope, of which I'm kind of showing that wavelength range here. Um, so this instrument's been really great for looking at, in particular, the abundance of water in these planets' atmospheres. Um, but it has a pretty restricted wavelength range from about 1.1 to 1.7 microns and observes at a resolution of only around 50 to 100. Um, so with that resolution and that wavelength range, essentially what we can detect in these planets' atmospheres is a single broad molecular band of water and no real carbon-bearing species. Um, so if we compare that instead to studies from the ground, um, so today I'm going to be talking mostly just about IGRINS. Um, IGRINS covers this uh, wider wavelength range where we can see features of a wide variety of molecules, water, OH, uh, CH4, CO, basically everything we think should be um, major carriers of oxygen and carbon in these planets' atmospheres. Um, and additionally, IGRINS has this much higher resolution. So instead of just seeing one broad absorption band feature, we can resolve all of these individual lines, which give us a much better handle on what the actual composition of these planets are. Um, so I'm currently leading a survey to measure the transmission spectra of um, 11 different exoplanets with IGRINS, um, with the idea being in this survey that we're looking at planets, um, I've plotted them all here, with a wide range of different parameters like mass, temperature, and age. Um, so we're going to measure precisely the abundances of all of the major carbon and oxygen bearing molecules in these planets' atmospheres and um, measure the C to O ratios for all these planets and then be able to look at how that ratio depends on some of these key planetary parameters. Um, we're also hoping to, uh, in the future, combine this data set with other existing data sets for these planets like um, those from space with Hubble and Spitzer, as well as uh, ground-based data at high resolution at optical wavelengths to get a better holistic idea of what's going on in these planets' atmospheres. So today I'm just going to be focusing on one data set that we've taken from this program, and that's for the um, hot Jupiter WASP-76b. So just to give a little bit of background on this planet, it's what we refer to as an ultra-hot Jupiter, um, which means it has a really hot temperature around 2200 Kelvin. Um, and because it's so hot, it was actually predicted that in the atmosphere of this planet, um, water would be dissociating and breaking apart into hydrogen and oxygen molecules. Um, and indeed, it was observed with the Hubble Space Telescope and observed to have a black body like spectrum, which indicates that it was being impacted by water dissociation. It's also been observed at high resolution before. Um, and one really interesting result was that it was observed to have an asymmetric signature of iron absorption in its atmosphere. Um, so the idea that the team proposed who made these observations to explain this is that um, it may have a hot spot that's um, slightly shifted towards one side of the planet uh, because the planet's being heated primarily on one side facing the star and then winds kind of shift that warmest spot around the planet. Um, and in that spot, it could have vaporized iron, whereas on the cooler areas of the planet's atmosphere, that iron would condense out. So by having this kind of shifted um, spot where you get vaporized iron um, throughout the course of the transit, you could produce this asymmetric absorption signal because one limb has more vaporized iron than the other. Um, and then it's been observed uh, several times at high resolution, and there have been a lot of detections of various other molecules and atoms in this planet's atmosphere. Um, some examples are OH, um, several metals like magnesium and iron, 
Um, but importantly, a lot of these have only detected these um, molecules and atoms and not really constrained their abundances. So that's what we wanted to do with these iGRINS data. All right, so we observed a single transit of WASP-76 with iGRINS this past October. Um, so to start our data cleaning process, we just removed all of the orders that had a lower signal to noise. Um, here I'm just showing uh, the signal to noise from one of the AB pairs that we observed. So we really get um, a lot of signal to noise for these planets because we're trying to see these very small signals um, of the planet hidden in this uh, stellar data that we're getting. All right, so our goal is, um, so we want to detect this signature of this planet. And like I said, it's very small compared to the amount of light that we're getting from the star itself. Um, luckily for us, uh, the planet is orbiting as we're observing it. Um, so that means that uh, because of the change in its radio velocity, um, it's going to have a slight shift in the wavelengths of any lines from the planet over the course of our observation. So this is kind of the key to how we separate out exoplanet data from everything else that's going on uh, at the telescope is that the planet signal is the only thing that's going to be changing in, in velocity significantly over the course of our observations. Unfortunately, this signal is completely drowned out by the star, um, the instrument throughput, and telerics. Um, but again, all of those are relatively stationary in wavelength over the course of the transit that we're observing. Um, so what we do to remove those is we use a principal component analysis. Um, so if you've never done a PCA before, the way that it works is it essentially identifies axes along which most of your data lie. Um, so here I've just got a little cartoon showing an example. Um, so let's say you're measuring uh, heights and widths of a bunch of different fish. Um, and maybe you have some small fish and maybe you have some large fish, but if they're all the same species of fish, then you might expect there to be some relationship between their height and their width. So if they grow, both the height and the width increase proportionally. So in that case, um, you'd measure these red data points here. And then if you applied a principal component analysis, the first component to come out would be uh, the blue line running through those data. So it identifies that you've got this trend between uh, height and width. And you could say, oh yeah, now we can tell all of these fish are just different ages of the same species. So we're essentially doing the same thing with our data, um, finding all of the things that we have in common in between different exposures and in um, one exposure at different wavelengths. Um, so here I've just shown um, one uh, data set here. I've picked out um, these two different plots here on the left. You can see just a few of the orders that we're observing with iGRINS um, in wavelength. And the main features you can see are um, the throughput, and then we have some torics in this leftmost order. And then basically every other feature you can see with your eye is from the star, not from the planet. Um, and then I've also plotted a single point from one of these uh, data sets over the course of our observations. So this is in terms of orbital phase of the planet or time throughout the night. And you can basically see a trend in air mass. So all of these trends, are going to be essentially constant um, over the course of our observations, whereas our planet signal is going to be the only thing that's changing in wavelength. So if we apply this principal component analysis, the first few components identify all of these signals from the telerics and from the star and from the instrument, and we can subtract all of that out and we're just left with the planet signal. So this plot on the right kind of shows how that process works. Um, so here I'm just showing on the top our raw data before we've applied this PCA. Um, so you can see that we really can't see anything from the planet at all. And then as we subtract out more components, we uh, we get rid of um, more of this stuff from the star and from the instrument, and we're just left with the planet afterwards. Um, so then once we've uh, gotten rid of everything except our planet, um, we apply, uh, we use a cross correlation with a model template to detect the actual signal from our planet. Um, so there's kind of two types of plots people usually show in exoplanet work. And I apologize, we're not very inventive at naming our plots. Um, but the first is called a trail plot. And the idea here is we are cross-correlating separately with every different exposure. Um, so if we correctly detect the planet, we should be able to see the peak of that cross-correlation at different velocities as we're observing because the planet's uh, shifting. 
So indeed, we are able to see, um, I've kind of highlighted here to guide your eye, this diagonal signal is from the planet. Um, and then the signal that stays pretty constant in velocity throughout the night is um, actually from the star. We've got a little bit of leftover stuff from the star, which I'm not going to talk about too much in this talk, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. All right, so then the second type of plot that you'll see in exoplanet papers is called a blob plot. Um, so basically what we're doing here is taking this sped up signal in this trail plot and summing it all up into one point in terms of the systemic velocity of the star on the x-axis and the Keplerian velocity on the y-axis. Um, so again, to guide your eye here in white, I've put um, what are the expected values for these velocities for this system based on previous radial velocity observations. So you can see we get this peak in the cross-correlation signal near where we expect, which is how we know that we've detected this planet's atmosphere. All right, so then we can do this for um, a bunch of different gases individually to see what we can find in the planet's atmosphere. Um, so we found detections I'm showing here uh, for water, uh, CO and OH in this planet's atmosphere in our iGRINS data. Um, we also searched for a lot of other molecules that have either been found in this planet, suggested to be in this planet, or found in other hot Jupiters before. Um, but we didn't find um, basically any of these other molecules. I'm just showing some examples here. Um, so we just found those three primary molecules in the data. All right, so now we know what molecules are in our data. What we really want to do is constrain their abundances so we can get that carbon to oxygen ratio out. So the way that we do this is we um, take models for this planet at high resolution, um, and then we kind of add back on noise from our principal component analysis, everything that um, we took out of the planet signal, like the telerics and uh, everything from the star and that, and then run that model through the same PCA that we applied to our data. So that way we can kind of compare apples to apples because maybe we did some weird subtraction on our data with the PCA, maybe it didn't work perfectly, it left a bit of the stellar signal behind, but then if we apply the same process to our model, we'll get out something that has the same inconsistencies, I guess. Um, so then we can compare them. So in this way, we can do an atmospheric retrieval and actually constrain the abundances of, of these gases in this planet's atmosphere by comparing which of these models uh, fits our data best. Um, so here we were able to constrain the abundances of all three of these molecules that we detected really well um, with just a relatively simple atmospheric model um, fitting for these three uh, molecules and then also fitting an isothermal temperature profile. Um, so if we just take these values at face value and calculate a metallicity and a C to O ratio for this planet from those, um, what we get is that we have a uh, metallicity that's consistent with solar but a significantly super solar C to O ratio of about 0.96. Um, that's pretty high for what we expect for an exoplanet. That would be pretty strange. Um, so we wanted to investigate whether this is really what's going on in the planet's atmosphere, or is this somehow being driven by um, the assumptions that we're making in this model? Um, so to kind of put these measurements in context a little bit more, um, here, these points I'm showing are comparing the abundances we derived for these three key molecules um, to these lines in the background, which show the abundances that we'd expect um, for a atmosphere in equilibrium with a solar metallicity and C to O ratio. So you can see that the abundances that we derive for OH and CO are pretty much consistent with what we'd expect for a solar composition atmosphere. Um, and the reason we're deriving this high C to O ratio is because um, the water abundance looks depleted compared to what we'd expect from this uh, model. Um, however, if you look at this model, you can see that as you go um, up through the planet's atmosphere, um, you uh, the water abundance changes significantly. And what's happening there is actually what was detected for this planet um, with Hubble. The water is dissociating as you go higher up into the hot parts of this atmosphere and is turning into OH and atomic oxygen. So you can see that the OH abundance increases and then decreases again, and that oxygen abundance increases as well as you go up through the atmosphere. Um, so to see if this uh, water depletion that we're getting from our models is driven by this water dissociation in the upper atmosphere, um, we're working on upgrading these models now to allow um, non-uniform abundances throughout the atmospheric profile, um, as well as uh, non-uniform temperatures.
All right, so this was kind of a whirlwind summary of how to do exoplanets at high resolution. Um, but I wanted to point out that um, this is just the first preliminary result from this survey. Um, we've observed five of the 11 uh, planets in our program, and we have um, another year left in this program. Um, there's also a lot of other exciting exoplanet work going on. Um, Jake Turner is going to talk about using GRACES for exoplanets, and there's other large programs on IGRINS as well as Maroon X to look at exoplanet atmospheres. Um, so it's really an exciting time to be studying these planets. Um, so before I end, I also just wanted to point out that there's a lot of really interesting synergies that can happen between um, Gemini and high resolution studies of exoplanets and JWST. Um, so uh, one that uh, is immediately comes out that people talk about a lot is that the way that we process these data that we get from the ground, we actually remove all of the continuum information. So we uh, we get information on relative strengths of absorption features, but we don't get any absolute information. Um, so by observing these planets from space as well, we can actually add back in that continuum information. And like is being shown in this plot here, if we combine low resolution and high resolution data, we can get tighter abundance constraints than we'd be able to get from either data set on its own. Um, and then there's also lots of other synergies as well. Um, I just want to talk about one more that I'm very excited about, which is um, starting to understand a little more about the 3D structures of hot Jupiter atmospheres. So one thing that JWST is going to be able to do that we can't do from the ground is um, eclipse mapping of hot Jupiters, which is essentially a technique to get a 3D temperature map on the day side of these planets, resolved in longitude, latitude, and altitude. Um, but this whole temperature map is uh, presumably being driven by winds in the planet's atmosphere. And at high resolution from the ground, uh, you can measure those winds directly based on red shifts and blue shifts in the lines that you're observing from the planet. So I think this is a really interesting area where you could combine um, temperature maps from space and uh, wind speed measurements from the ground to really get a lot more information on the dynamical processes happening in these planets' atmospheres. Um, so finally, before I end, I just want to acknowledge a few people, um, all of the co-eyes on this program, um, all of the Gemini and Igrin staff, um, especially I want to point out Greg Mace and Puyun Kim, who have been really helpful in figuring out how to use this great instrument for exoplanets. Um, exoplanets have a lot of weird requirements, so it's been very helpful having their advice. Um, I also want to acknowledge funding from a NASA Sagan Fellowship and respectfully acknowledge that the Gemini South Telescope is located on Cerro Pachon, which is in the traditional territory of the Diagita people. And I'm very grateful for the access that we had to this site today to get these incredible data. All right, so just to conclude, um, so we detected uh, water, CO, and OH in WASP-76b using IGRINS. Um, our first retrieval results suggest that this planet may have a solar metallicity, but a significantly supersolar C to O ratio. Um, but we're currently looking into upgrading our models to see if this result um, is really true for this planet or depends on any model assumptions, such as uh, constant abundances in the atmospheric profile and the constant temperature that we were fitting. Um, we're also going to be looking in the future into seeing if we can detect any uh, limb differences such as was seen on this planet with um, iron in the past. Um, and this is just the first result from this survey and there's lots of exciting surveys happening on the ground now with uh, the Gemini telescopes. Um, so I'm sure that soon you're gonna be hearing about a lot more awesome exoplanet results with Gemini. Um, so thanks so much and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Megan, for a wonderful talk that was gloriously on time. Well done. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions in the room? Let's start with Jake. Uh, great talk, Megan. Uh, thank you for introducing this uh, to everybody. <laughs> and uh, so can you go through how you correct for the star? Um, yeah, so basically the, the star, for the most part, um, gets removed by the principal component analysis um, because it's mostly stationary. Um, at least at the resolution of Igrins, um, it has about two and a half kilometers per second resolution. So we can't um, see the star moving over the course of the transit. Um, this little bit of stellar signal that you can see left in here is um, basically because of something called the Rositer-McLaughlin effect, which is that um, as the planet transits the star, 
it's going to be blocking different parts of the star that are because the star is rotating red shifted and blue shift, shifted differently. So you do get a little bit of a shift in the uh, net velocity of the lines from the star. Um, so we haven't actually explored correcting for that yet. For now, we're just masking out that stellar signal. Um, so it doesn't affect our data, but that would be an interesting thing to look into in the future. Uh, Hui, do we have anything online? Yeah, we have two questions now. So David Trilling, <laughs> who is in the room. On the pressure abundance plot, your points were near 10 to the minus two bar. And you said maybe they should even be higher up at 10 to the minus three. Why are you sensing the atmosphere at such a low pressure? I would have thought it would be deeper, uh, where I'd guess the tau like equal one level would be. Maybe my intuition is totally wrong. That's <laughs> yeah, um, that's a good question and something that I um, can't answer in detail right now. But I so for um, low resolution infrared observations for these hot exoplanets, um, typically the photosphere is around 10 to the minus two. Um, but we can see uh, higher up in the atmosphere at high resolution, we see like a little bit more of a range of pressures in here. Um, so I don't know exactly where the photosphere is for these data. The, I kind of just plop these points down around where is reasonable. Um, but we should be seeing a range of pressures there with the different line strengths that we're seeing, um, which is part of why we're hopefully going to be actually fitting for non-constant abundances in our data as well. Okay, hey, so we have one more question online. Yes, uh, from Joel Rediger. So what is the statistical significance of the molecule detection of OSF 76 b Yeah, um, so these plots down here are actually in terms of um, statistical significance. So you can kind of just read it off here. It's, uh, we detect water and CO at a little bit higher than four sigma, and then OH is a bit more of maybe a tentative detection, it's around three sigma, but you can see there's a couple other um, bright spots on that plot. So I guess I would call that one more of a probably detection, but yeah. <laughs> other questions in the room? Oh, yeah. Or I'm gonna trip over the uh, tape. Um, so uh, on the plot that, you, or on the uh, slide you were just showing with the metal C numbers, um, and this is kind of, uh, oh. Building off of Joel's yeah. uh, question, so you have a m over h of uh, minus 0.19 plus or minus some really large numbers, mm -hmm. and then the co is plus or minus some really small numbers. So what's why why is that happening? Yeah, so you can actually see in this corner plot here, um, we have pretty wide ranges that we get for each of the individual molecular abundances. They're like almost a dex error bars. Um, but they're really strongly correlated with each other. And so the ratio of those is very, very strongly constrained. Um, this was actually found in, there's a published paper by Mike Lyon on iGrin's data of WASP-77, and they found a very similar thing that it's much easier actually to constrain, constrain the ratios of these gases than the absolute amounts. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah, please. May I have a very quick question? So can you compare their the abundance with the planet with the planet host star? Yeah. With the host, yeah. Um, so I guess I didn't say this up here, but the host star in this case, I think is um, pretty close to solar metallicity and C to O ratio. Um, so it's basically the same comparison, yeah. Okay, with that, let's say a big thank you to Megan for her wonderful talk. Okay, and we'll take a moment for a speaker switch over to Jake. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, that's why the tape is important. Otherwise, it's all the tape. Okay. Yeah. That might make it stay. Okay. 
Perfect. Okay. So let's welcome to the stage Jake Turner, who's our last talk of this exoplanet session. Uh, he's joining us from Cornell University and we'll be speaking today about the ExoGem survey. So take it away, Jake. Hi, right, thank you everyone for having me. So as we said, my name is Dr. Jake Turner. I'm also a, a NASA Hubble Fellow at uh, Cornell University and the Carl Sagan Institute. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the ExoGem survey, exploring uh, the, the relationship of exoplanet atmospheres and high spectral resolution with Gemini Basie. And I would like to start by analyzing my entire collaboration, the ExoGem collaboration, because most of this work was done by multiple people in the collaboration. So this was very much a team effort. So Megan did help introduce this a lot to you. So this is going to be a, a review. So essentially, as a planet orbits around the star, as you can see here. Uh, basically, if you look at the phase versus the wavelength, you can see uh, that the stars, uh, if there's something in its atmosphere, such as CO, it, the wavelength changes based off where in the orbit the planet is at because the radial velocity is changing. And then you can see in this plot here, the terroric lines are basically stationary. So you can use the large Doppler shift for the planet to basically disentangle uh, the spectrum from the host star and also the Earth's atmosphere. So it's a very uh, useful technique. And this technique has been used uh, for almost over a decade now uh, for a variety of different planets, different instruments, uh, and uh, it's quite an interesting thing you can study a variety of different type, type of planets around a variety of different types of stars. So it's really an interesting technique. Uh, so I'll show you a few examples of here of some of the comets uh, from HD 209458, which is a comet of hot Jupiter. Uh, this is the detection of CO by Snow and Adel 2010, which I would say is probably the start of this field. And so you can see here basically the uh, radial velocity of the planet in the orbital phase, and you can see right away you can see this absorption on the, on the trail, essentially. And so they use this to constrain the bare CO there as well as some atmospheric uh, things that were going on in the atmosphere. And uh, basically started this build. So it's quite an interesting result. And then the result that I just found a few years ago, looking at Cal 9D, uh, we, with Carmenes, we detected H alpha in a ionized gas in this atmosphere. And so you can see here, right away, we, we, uh, you can see the absorption quite well here. And I put this dashed data line, you can see here is actually the radial velocity of the planet. And so if you uh, actually put this in the um, velocity space of the planet, you can actually get a spectrum of the H alpha line. And I, that's what we show here. And so we're able to do this with H alpha and also the ionic spectrum lines and compare this to atmospheric models. And we're able to constrain the, the, the density with the, the pressure, the pressure of the density of these lines that were formed. And we found out that this planet was basically going through non LTE effects. So there was a very interesting stuff in this atmosphere. So that's just an introduction. And Megan introduced it as well, which is, I thank you about for that, doing that. Uh, so the Exogem survey, Exogem is with Gemini uh, Spectroscopy for short, has an approved life program on, with graces on Gemini Nord. Uh, we observe in the octave, so uh, it's complementary to Megan's survey. We observe from 400 to 1050 nanometers at uh, pretty high spectral resolution of 60 seconds. So going more into our survey, so we're actually observing the planet's water transit. And uh, so I show here a, a, a normal transit of an exoplanet for this blue and off the mirror. And essentially, as the planet's going uh, in front of a star, uh, and when the planet enters the transit, and actually the spectral lines will be blue shifted. When it gets to the middle of the transit, it's species zero. And then when it goes the later half of the transit, it's rest shifted. So we should be able to see the spectral lines of the, in the atmosphere of the planet shift, essentially. And so I showed some examples here of some atmospheric models for the Diana McDonald. And so these are the atmospheric models that we actually use to cross correlate our, our, cross -correlate our data. So here I show again wavelength versus um, flux. And so you can see several of these molecules and these atoms um, have very distinct fingerprints. So that's how we can separate them from each other and also know that we're actually detecting what we're making detect. And some of these uh, molecules and atoms have hundreds of thousands of lines. So it's quite a unique detection. Uh, so it's really exciting. And so we're basically searching for everything in our spectral uh, region, uh, so for for the for the uh, we can search for H alpha, we can search for uh, calcium, uh, iron, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can actually look through the whole PI table, uh, which is really really interesting. As well, we have some molecules um, in our wavelength range: PIO, VO, a little bit of water, um, and some hydrides as well. So we search for pretty much everything to kind of see what's going on in our atmosphere. 
So we're trying to find these species across a wide parameter space of frontier parameters um, to see if there's any trends that we can we can notice. Um, as well, we're trying to look for 2D and 3D uh, structure in our atmosphere as much as possible. So we can look for abundances um, and temperatures with altitude and latitude. Specifically, we can observe multiple lines. We can see where those form. And it's an example from um, a show on top uh, from my 2020 paper with that line B, where we detect that we can actually figure out the temperature and the, the density and the pressure of the air of the four lines form and then get some kind of crude uh, 2D effect. And we actually show that there are differences in, in pressure and density uh, and temperature as well. So that's really exciting. And we're hoping to do that with more plants as well. As well as the measure atmospheric winds, um, which can either be in a latitude or also even um, altitude winds from the bottom of the atmosphere. But we're really hoping to combine with uh, low resolution. So, Megan talked about this before. So, we showed us that there's this result from Gregory et al. Um, that when we combine uh, low resolution high resolution with a thermometer, and then hopefully in the future, and being able to do this D, that we can get a better constraint on some of the atmospheric effects. So, we're hoping to do that as well. So this is showing our observed sample. Um, and so we have planet mass and planetary temperature, as well as the radius. And so we observe basically planets all the way from this from 0.7 out of the mass of Neptune. And so it's very much a Neptune type planet, so about four times the mass of Jupiter. And we have to observe planets for the value temperatures, starting at 670 Kelvin all the way to 3,200 Kelvin. Uh, and then so all the planets we observed are shown are circled there. And the other comments that we show that are possible targets we can observe in our survey, because of the way that GRACES is set up, it's only on the telescope uh, pretty much once a semester in a specific uh, time scale. So we really can't pick individual planets, kind of like what Megan was doing, but we kind of just get a variety of different planets and hope we can observe a lot of interesting ones. So that's why we, I don't have names like Megan had on the first. So we've, we're, we're really getting a quite a range of planets we've observed so far. So, not surprising, probably. Uh, to our next kind of person, we're actually going to talk about uh, WAS 76 first, which you just heard about. So, WAS 76 is an ultra hot Jupiter, uh, about 2200 Kelvin, uh, has many atmospheric detections, also with IVENT, as we just, just learned in the previous talk. Uh, but multiple, almost every I think, high resolution spectrograph on Earth has detected something of this planet now. And most importantly, as Megan discussed, there's also asymmetric iron that was detected. So the iron is not a, 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 the same abundance across the entire transit. And because uh, the, during the transit, that's part of the atmosphere we're looking at, so it really changes. This was indication that there's some 2D or even 3D effects going on. And so the first original uh, uh, thought was there was iron rain, but there's many, many, many theoretical studies showing that we take clouds that are happening in different parts of the, ter the terminator. Scale high good ranges, et cetera, et cetera. But all pointing to is the 2D, a 3D picture of the planet. So we're now getting into more of a regime of looking at these, these 2D effects. And so in our survey, we looked at this with braces and uh, we detected the ionized calcium in its atmosphere for the first time. And within a week after we submitted the paper, um, another group independently detected ionized calcium as well. So that was quite uh, nice to see. Uh, and so we use this planet to basically calibrate our reduction techniques as well as make sure the telescope is working, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to see the same thing other people saw. Uh, and so we also detected sodium. You can see those two sodium lines on top. Um, many different groups have detected sodium as well. And then we compare these to cerebral and atmospheric models. Um, and we realized that our calcium signal was a lot stronger than we predicted uh, if you just use a, a normal LTE model. And so we, we think there are some non LT effects that are going on. So the planet is actually hotter than we would expect. Uh, or the end, or there are some strong atmospheric winds that are moving ionized calcium uh, across the planet. So we're observing some really interesting stuff. So we also detect iron. I mean, we detect the asymmetric uh, uh, iron signal. And so, as, as Megan was showing, this is the systemic velocity um, uh, versus the rate velocity of the planet. And so as uh, again showing the, the dashed lines here is where we expect the signal, and we see it pretty close to that. Uh, and so we're able to re detect what people saw previously, but we're having to use some 3D models to actually get some more information out of this planet. So stay tuned for that. As well as we detect everything else that people detected, um, such as 
uh, lithium and potassium, and I showed the potassium detection here. Uh, so we're, we're, we're thinking that exogen survey is working as, as we expected. So that's very nice. And so the next one I'm going to talk about is loss 31. So here's where it falls in the primary space, somewhere between about Saturn and, and Jupiter in terms of mass. So loss 31 is what we call a puffy pod Jupiter. So it is pretty hot, it's about 1600 Kelvin. And it's about, uh, the mass is about half that of Jupiter, and it's about 1.6 the radius of Jupiter. And with the wave resolution with the HST, um, there was some evidence of uh, chromium hybrid. And so I showed the detection here. Uh, basically, this is again, uh, wavelength versus the, the transit depth of the planet. And you can see uh, that it, it varies, and there were some atmospheric models that we compared this to do. And we see that there is evidence of chromium hybrid. And I show uh, the plot. This is the, the retrieval uh, the plot they have here. And for some reason, it's not showing up very well. Uh, but yeah, we found evidence of chromium hybrid. So we thought this would be an interesting target to look at. And uh, so I, and thankfully, we actually detect chromium hybrid as well in high resolution. Um, so you can see our plot here. Again, the systemic velocity versus the rate of velocity of the planet. And we get about a four, four ish sigma, uh, about 4.2 or 3, I believe, uh, detection. So it's quite uh, interesting. And so we're able to detect this at high resolution and low resolution, um, which we can use to get some more interesting constraints. We haven't done that yet, but we will do that in the future. But what this tells us, if you maybe you've ever heard of chromium hybrid, is that basically chromium bird species are very important for the formation of clouds. And we believe clouds is like pretty much ubiquitous on all exoplanets. So they should hopefully tell us something interesting about how clouds form on these planets. As well as chromium hybrid specifically could be an indication that there was accretion going on of solids during formation. So this could be a, a direct constraint to how the formation. Uh, the planet formed. So the next planet I'll, I'll discuss in our, in our survey is WAS 85A. Uh, it's basically a typical of Jupiter, so we want to look at it. And so we get actually a detection of uh, uh, sodium for the first time on this planet, uh, which is not surprising because we detect the sodium on multiple planets. And here I show uh, our detection. So again, Earth versus um, the rate of loss of the planet, and we, we see both lines pretty strong. So they sum those lines together, we can get a spectrum here, and you can see it's, it's detected quite well. We're eventually going to model this and see if there's not any non LT effects going on. We haven't done that yet. But the interesting thing about this planet is that it's around a very active star. Um, and so we were not really expecting it to be detection because activity kind of makes it difficult, but we would find one. So this is very really helpful that even we can detect things around active stars, which is really useful because there's a lot of active stars, specifically. So we're starting to look at M dwarfs and some of these smaller planets. So the next uh, planet we're going to talk about is uh, Happy 32. Um, so I'll go into that. So that, again, Happy 32 is kind of a normal hot Jupiter. Uh, but there's some interesting things going on. So there was some previous observations with H alpha that showed there might have been early ingress as well in escaping atmosphere. So we actually confirmed that. We confirmed that there was H alpha. So I show here. The spectrum of H alpha, so it's the wavelength versus the flux. And if you can see on the, the flux axis, this is actually about a 2 to 2.5 uh, percent transit depth, which is quite large. It's a lot larger than the optical transit depth. Um, so the, the radius that we're seeing is actually beyond the width of the lobe of the planet. So this atmosphere is escaping. Um, and there's not very many planets that we can actually detect their atmosphere escaping. So this is going to be an interesting observation for that. Uh, so that's that it's going to be very important for understanding how atmosphere escape happens. And so we also detect ionized calcium in its atmosphere, um, and that doesn't seem like it's escaping. So we're actually detecting many different elements in its atmosphere, one that's escaping, one that's not. So we can actually learn some of that really interesting structure. As well as we see some tentative evidence of detection of urban ingress. Um, so I show here a plot of our data of the length versus uh, flux of different parts of the, of the observation. Uh, and we see that they might, they might have this early ingress, which uh, there's only a handful of planets with that. So this is going to be really interesting for our survey. Um, the last planet I want to talk about within the last minute of my talk um, is GJ3470b, uh, which is the smallest planet in our survey. Um, okay, there you go. So GJ3470b is a super puff, um, about 670 Kelvin, uh, about four times bigger than that of Earth. Um, 0.7 meta uh, mass of Neptune. And we actually do not detect water in its atmosphere, um, which is inconsistent 
the railroads for some observations. Um, it's not quite surprising because we don't have many of the water bands in our observations, but we want to look for it anyway. And hopefully we'll get some kind of instrument of why we want to see this in some kind of 2D structure or 2D structure of the water abundance, at least in upper limit. Um, and we thought we detected ionized calcium. It's on the screen I showed here. You can see all the ionized calcium lines. Uh, however, with future investigation, that's probably likely caused by stellar activity. So this definitely puts a lot of limits on what our survey can do, but it's also very interesting. So the next steps of our observations. We have one more year of observations left. Um, and we're going to concentrate on uh, uh, targets that are observed by JWST, either currently or planned in the future, as well as other pre uh, previously detected planets. So we show here some of the possible targets we can observe in the next semester um, in our parameter space, in which we're trying to open up our parameter space, go to higher, smaller planets, higher planets, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, as well as we're going to try to produce some more 3D models uh, to compare it to our data. Uh, and this is an example of one of the 3D models that shows uh, the temperature as you go from the night side to the, the day side, as well as the terminator, which is what transit observations are usually sensitive to. And you can see there's quite a gradient there. And so we're trying to produce more of these models um, to see if we can see these interesting 2D to 3D effects. Uh, and we're hoping to understand better the set of activity because we have several stars that are very active. And we're trying to see if we can detect something in them. As well as we have several planets where we have no detections at all, and they're very similar planets to planets that we do have detections. So we're going to try to see why that is the case. Um, and uh, and so stay tuned for that. So the Exogem survey, um, in summary, we're hoping to explore the diversity of planets across a wide planetary space, finish on exoplanetary atmospheres. And preliminary results uh, show that we're, we're doing a pretty, pretty good job so far. So this is just an higher lesson those results. And thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for an excellent talk. Our questions in the room for Jake. Yeah, please come up to the microphone. Thank you for your talk. I have a question. Uh, how did you select the target? Uh, yeah, so we originally, when we first started the sample, we were going to look at specific targets, but because there's only one week where Grace is on the telescope, we essentially just look through every possible exoplanet transit. We make sure it has good signal to noise. Um, and, you know, we make sure it, it doesn't, it has a, a wide variety of, of rate of velocity changes throughout the night and the transit so we can separate from the star and the, and the planet. And so thankfully there's lots of planets now that are really bright. So we at least have one planet each day of the run that we can observe. Uh, and so it's more of just like we're getting a variety of planets instead of individual targets that we want to look at. I see. Oh, then another question is, uh, how about the uh, range of the ages of your target? I'm Most of these there... are uh, pretty, I think they're pretty old. We don't have any young planets, um, right. partly because a lot of uh, young planets are very difficult because their stars are varying a lot and we don't expect that we'll see. We did include some of them in our original sample, but they weren't observed. So, so far, we haven't observed any young planets. I see, thank you. Okay, next question in the room. Thank you for your talk. Um, this may be a naive question, but I was wondering, uh, have you considered or would you expect there to be a trend in these chemical abundances and also the atmospheric escape with respect to the distance of the planet from the host star? Right, so yeah, you definitely would. So most of the planets we are looking at are quite close to their star because um, we have to observe them within one night of observations. And so usually our constraint is about uh, a transit duration of five hours, which means these are all orbiting within two or three days, uh, maybe four days is our limit. So they're all really close to their star. Uh, and so, yeah, there's some, if the planets are really close, they're more likely to uh, have an escaping atmosphere. But this is still an open question in exoplanets because even some of the, like Cal 9b, for example, is, I, I guess I might have not said this, but it's the hottest known planet we know, about 4,500 Kelvin, which for people who study stars is actually hotter than M dwarfs and K stars. Uh, so this planet is actually like a star almost in a sense. But it, but as far as we can tell, we haven't detected its escaping atmosphere, even though most everybody predicts it should be there. Uh, that's why we actually look for the H alpha, but it seems like the H alpha was formed pretty deep in the atmosphere. Uh, and so this is still a very open question in, in exoplanets of how we can detect it and also see these trends because we expect there to be, but so far uh, we haven't had enough detections to say that. Thank you. 
other questions in the room? I have one. So the, the plot you showed earlier for the chromium hydride detection. Yes. My impression of this is that you have to go in knowing what molecule or atom you're looking for. What prompts you to say, maybe there's chromium hydride in this planet? Well, so partly because it was previously detected, but okay. right now we're with coming- Prompted them. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think they ran a retrieval with just a bunch of stuff. And so what we're doing in our observations is we're actually cross correlating our data with every known element and every known molecule, uh, which takes a long time, because there's a lot. Uh, and then usually there's most of those are non-detections. Uh, and so in this case, we started with chromium hydride because we knew it was might have been there and it was previously seen. So for, for them, yeah, it's the same idea. You, oh, you, uh, you want to try to see what's in your data. Um, and so with low resolution, yeah, you run a, a lot of different retrievals with pretty much everything that could be there. Uh, and this is a, this is predicted by theory that it should be there. So that's also one reason why people were looking for it. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, last chance for questions in the room for Jake. Going once, going twice. Okay, well, with that, let's give a big round of applause for both of our speakers in this session. Thank you. And I believe Janice has some announcements before we move to the last session of the day. Right, so the last session of the day is actually a workshop, but I think we should give a round of applause to all the speakers. I mean, we spanned an enormous range of science today from the edge of time to planets in our cosmic backyard. That really speaks to the enormous capabilities, all of discoveries that Gemini really enables. So let's give a hand to all the speakers today. From our sign-up sheets, I do know that not everyone is staying for the workshop, although I really encourage you to attend Jocelyn's fabulous diversity workshop. So I just wanted to have uh, just give the reminders now. If you have a talk tomorrow, please, in the morning, 8 o'clock to 8.30, that's when we're testing um, slides. So please be here then. And we don't have everybody's slides. So if you are delinquent, please. Um, and the other reminder is that tomorrow we have the public talk um, from famous astrophotographer O Chun Kwon, O Chul Kwon, o Chul Kwon. And please, we're going to have, it's going to be given in Korean, but we'll have translation in real time. So please put that on your calendars, um, bring your friends. And, and that is my cue to look around. That is here. Yes. Look around to the rest of the yellow sea to see if there are any other announcements for the end of this day before the workshop. No? Just the testing, right? <laughs> okay. Huh? No, well, COVID testing. We have extra tests. So again, um, please, if you haven't tested in 24, 48 hours, go ahead and do that before you go out or before you um, come to the session tomorrow. Okay. And do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, yeah, she, she's saying, <laughs> give everyone a minute to shuffle around and please, we invite you to move forward to the front of the room if you're staying for the workshop. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's been a long day, I understand. Um, hey. Yeah, if you want to stretch your legs, move forward, that's fine. But a uh, fair no, sign up isn't necessary to, if you haven't signed up and you want to stay, you're more than welcome to join the workshop. Yes, that is true. Please feel free to stick around. In the interest of time, I will just dive right into it. Um, I actually, okay, fair warning, I'm going to ask you to like turn and talk to each other. So as long as you're concentrated in, in different areas, it's it's not essential that you be in the front of the space. 
And I see more people standing up when I say that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's a workshop, okay? So the name of this workshop is actually, it's, it's the Gem and We. Uh, this is the second one in the series of DEI-focused workshops that uh, were started at the last virtual GSM. So last time we focused on like assessing your workplace. Um, and so we're taking it a step further this time by talking about developing an inclusivity strategy. So first, who am I? Why am I talking to you? Um, my name is Jocelyn Ferrara. I have been a diversity advocate since 2018. So coming up on four years at Gemini North in Hilo. Um, I'm a science operations specialist. As you've seen a few of us here giving posters, we wear lots of different hats. I was just observing for you all um, until the morning of my flight here. Excellent, excellent conditions. You're welcome. Um, so um, under Aura, we have a network of diversity advocates. And um, so there's generally eight of us across the different Aura centers. Um, I actually started, I worked at Space Telescope Science Institute for a few years, was involved in DEI uh, committees and initiatives there. And then when I came over to Gemini, I picked it up again. Um, so Aura, we actually do have a chief diversity officer, Amira McBride, she's amazing. Uh, we're bringing on a DEI officer at the NOAA lab level to be announced soon. Um, and we have different committees at the NOAA lab level, a task force that achieved very specific goals over the course of a year. There's a standing committee coming up. And then I also have monthly meetings with the Gemini directorate, the NOAA lab directorate. I hesitate to say have because it's turning into a had because I am rotating off as diversity advocate for years is longer than the recommended term, but I do love doing this work. So um, I am passing the torch and that will be announced soon as well. But I'm so glad that I can be here today to talk to you all. So let's just, you know, do a refresher. What is DEI? I do think there is a purpose to put it in that order not just to avoid making the acronym D-I-E. Uh, D-E-I makes a lot of sense to me because you start with the D, with diversity. That's where you have the presence of individuals with different identities, perspectives, and experiences, aka you're invited to the party at all, right? You get your foot in the door. Equity is the fair and impartial treatment of these diverse people with different backgrounds and experiences. And equity is not always equality. So it's just, you know, making sure everyone has a fair chance to contribute to the playlist at the party. And then inclusion, um, I've seen it like separated out into uniqueness and belonging. So your uniqueness is allowed to be there. Um, we acknowledge all of our unique facets and experiences and, um, you're valued for it. You feel like you belong in the culture. And that means you're actually asked to dance at the party. So I know I see it as this kind of pyramid where you need to build uh, one on top of the other. So as a diversity advocate, um, I mainly focus on, was tasked with focusing on the I part, the inclusive culture, but what I've done over the last four years has touched everything. Um, it touches policies, human resources, your outreach and education programs, and the workforce community, which I would call this. Me talking here now is kind of like engaging with our, you know, science users and sharing these resources with the community. So if you registered ahead of time, you got a survey from me. Um, and thank you to those who've responded, but I'm just gonna bring it up anyway, because let's all think about it. Uh, so there's this is a nice rubric that I really enjoy that I have the um, reference at the end here, but it's a way to assess your workplace in terms of where it's at in terms of DEI. So starting from pre-awareness where um, it's not, it's kind of, 
not necessarily seen like as diversity is integral to the success of an organization. Diversity versus excellence are mutually exclusive concepts. Moving to diversity awareness, you're aware that biases exist, that it negatively impacts people, um, but you don't know how to do it. You're still figuring out what should we do. In the transition state, you know, you have like structures being put into place and programs, they're making an effort, but it's a transition period, it's hard. Intentional inclusion, the culture is really starting to embrace um, DE&I. It's really built in consciously into discussions um, and you know people are trying to improve that climate. And then in a culture of inclusion, you don't have anyone like me. It's just part of the way you operate. There's no like systemic glaring issue. It's not a separate thing from the way you do your work. So here's some anonymous responses that I've gotten. <laughs> um, I did pass this rubric around last year and that's the results on the left. And you could see that it was very much uh, weighted towards the diversity awareness stage. The five responses that I got, uh, not a big sample, but um, it's really nice to see, oh, it's transition state <laughs> within a year, rescue a little more towards uh, improvement. So with that, I'm gonna ask you all some discussion questions. I ask you to turn to your neighbor, preferably someone maybe you don't already know, or you can quietly contemplate these questions if you're not comfortable discussing it. Um, like, <laughs> it's okay to not want to feel, you know, too vulnerable. Walking up to that microphone and answering this question, I think, is maybe too scary. So my questions to you are, like, what did you expect that answers would be on that rubric, um, just in, like, the general climate and why? Uh, why did you pick what you picked? either in the survey or now, I will bring the rubric back up. And do you think your organization is making concerted efforts to like move up along the rubric? So just think about it for a little while. Bring this back up. Um, there's lots of examples that you can kind of read through on each one. But please discuss, turn around. Oh, and for those online, well, actually, no one's in the Zoom, so um, there is a specific Slack channel devoted to this if people want to discuss there. Okay, I'm going to give you like one more minute to thank you all for Okay, um, if anyone feels strongly, if they would like to share it out with everyone, if they had something they wanted to say at the microphones after discussing, feel free. Um, and we will have all week to talk about these types of things. <laughs> and no one's jumping up. Okay, thank you all for discussing together. So what I'm going to do for this talk is go through different potential models you could follow for creating an inclusivity strategy 
that is geared towards moving up in this rubric. So let's start small. Let's go with um, the small wins model. Okay, so this is where you might start out if your um, organization is a little bit lower on the rubric. Uh, you know, sometimes there is like a lot of pressure put on like, we need to change everything now, but we're not gonna give you any money for it. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, you don't necessarily have the backing yet. And so this is like when you're just starting and you wanna characterize the issue, you know, let's just tackle one area at a time. You can hold focus groups, you can send out a climate survey. If you're really just getting started, you don't know what some of the issues are. You wanna hear the voices of everyone at your organization. A climate survey is great for that. There was a lot of a little overhead in like processing the survey and getting recommendations out from there. But I think those two methods are a really great place to start. Um, you should, you know, don't feel free to just focus on like very specific locally focused issues. Uh, this is a big example is with Noir Lab, you know, we have our sites in Arizona, Hawaii, and Chile, and all three of those are vastly different climates. So that's great that we have different efforts across the different centers. And, you know, I think a lot of people talk about engagement. Um, I think I, I'm glad to see so many in the room, but it's, I really noticed the trend of 20% of people will sign up for these types of things or show up to these types of things. So it was maybe 20 people had registered for the workshop out of the hundred or so. And then 20% of those people actually answered the survey. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you can just find the people who are enthusiastic and willing. They're going to produce the best work for this anyway and um, get them like starting to start the momentum, get the ball rolling. It's not ideal. You know, we, I see it very often. Like you have a specifically like women of color doing most of this work. That is just how it is. Um, this, you know, statistics and fun things you get to learn when you do this work like women volunteer for these types of committees more often and of course they have like more stake in this so we we want to move away from that we want everyone to be engaged but you have to start somewhere and it, to keep this like sustainable um you can involve the managers they're the ones who will really perpetuate and keep these efforts going if it's really built into the way they operate. And if it's required to be built into the way they operate, we can hold managers and leadership to a much higher standard. Uh, examples of small wins, <laughs> having like a code of conduct at your scientific meeting, um, just, you know, even asking the organizers of meetings you go to about how are they paying attention to um, having an inclusive meeting, uh, like Celeste uh, encouraging students to speak up or um, ask questions and, you know, encourage people to um, create like a environment that's, you know, welcoming. Uh, meeting culture, that's a big one that we participate in all the time, but it doesn't take a lot to set those expectations. Who's taking the meeting minutes? Is it the same person? Is it always a woman? Um, who speaks? Who gets to speak? Who gets interrupted? Things like that, guidelines of how you should um, conduct yourself in inclusive meeting. This is a Noir Lab example that I worked on with the DAs. <laughs> um, Next, kind of next level, uh, different level of a model for an inclusivity strategy is to leverage the existing structure in your organization. There may already be a big strategic plan. So you can infuse DEI goals and initiatives into that rather than writing a whole separate one. Uh, like this hermit crab, you take what you can. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can integrate, you know, like, let's bring up this topic into meetings that you all have to go to anyway. You don't have a choice to not participate. 
no one likes the M word mandatory, but you can, you know, uh, squeeze it in there and, um, you know, make be an example and incorporate it into your regular meetings. And again, I'm going to say it again, involve the managers and leadership. Uh, they should be leading these efforts. So let's let's discuss a little more. Like, what do you think you could add, like in your day to day work? Where could you add this into the existing structure? Like, what could you build off of? And do you feel right now, like man your management and leadership would be supportive of this? Like, what do you think is challenging? Please share again amongst each other, and we'll just take a few minutes here. Thank you. 
Let's take about one more minute here. I hate to interrupt any of these amazing discussions, but there will be more. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, it pains me, but I'm going to start talking again. You guys are amazing. I am living for this. I have an idea of something you could utilize. Astro 2020. <laughs> Remember when that was coming out? We were all waiting with bated breath. <laughs> when it was like, boop, 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 boop. like it just dropped. Anyway, um, for the first time, there was the state of the profession section. And that, I mean, just for that is just honestly, in my opinion, fantastic that it was included. I think all of us can use this. Um, there's there's words for you of what you can use to justify these types of efforts for you know funding and resources. So definitely, you know, there are seven essential goals for the profession. There are if you you know don't necessarily have the resources to run a focus group um there's you know some identified goals that you could work towards so i think that is a really really great resource absolutely recommend it uh, if you haven't read that section definitely check it out uh let's go to some other models that you know i found on uh, developing an inclusivity strategy. This one is just called Metrics, Accountability, and Transparency, a simple recipe to increase diversity and reduce bias. Um, I will definitely post all these slides in the Slack channel so that you have access to all the links, but this is kind of simple, you know, collect some metrics, compare it to your peer, peer organizations um, from that and analyze that data. Sometimes, you know, there are pitfalls where metrics will be collected, it might be inconsistent, or it might not be analyzed and tracked over time. So you have to establish some accountability, you know, get some goals out of there, and then make these goals transparent to your internal and external stakeholders so they can hold you accountable. Feel scary because everyone knows if you didn't meet your goals, but I think that's I guess I'm a millennial and I want everything transparent all the time. <laughs> but, um, it is a really good way to show and be very clear about what you are doing. And then this was another point mentioned in this model is to you know listen to internal complaints. So it's very similar to kind of the focus group model, but a little more structured. This is um, when I was just starting this presentation, this is just what came from my personal work. Um, it's kind of very similar in terms of starting with metrics and data, uh, form that justification, start those hard conversations uh, so that you can build a network. And then I really think that it's effective um, to just hit those policies and practices right away because I think of DEI efforts like recycling you can do little things like for number five, the icing on the cake. It's important. It's so valuable. Affinity groups, you know, events. Um, and I liken that to your personal recycling. But at the end of the day, there's systemic and larger companies that are contributing much more. So if you change the policies, you can reach everybody and you can really change the culture much more effectively. And then in between all of that, you know, um, engaging in your with the public and with your workforce community. So we'll go right back to discussing because that was so you guys had a great conversation going. I just wanted to ask, you might have already been talking about this, but like what is jumping out at you as an area that needs improvement and attention? And what's I think most important going back to like who is engaged and excited about this, like what are you most driven and interested towards improving? So have at it. Oh. 
I'll just give an example. Like I started a mentoring program at Space Telescope and that was very fun to run. Okay, and I'm just going to move on in about a minute here. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the most intense strategic plan model here. <laughs> Very detailed. Um, this comes from the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. So the bar is high. Um, as many of my disillusioned American friends like to say, like, that's it, we're moving to Canada. <laughs> when the whole world's on fire. Anyway, you do have to approach some of this with a little bit of a sense of humor to stay sane, I feel like. So this is like 
very, this is what we used actually for the NORLAB strategic plan um, to craft that document. So you start with like an overarching mission and vision statement and values, your guiding principles, go through with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis of the organization, kind of getting into like competitive advantages and benefits to the organization, that justification. You've got your long-term goals, your short-term goals, action items. You need a way to like assess your progress, assess the financial contribution. And then finally, you know, identify like the critical success factors. Like what do you really need to have in place for this to work and who's responsible, who's held accountable, who are you consulting as you're making this progress and who gets informed about it? Um, I think the latter two should be a wide audience within the organization, but um, the, here's a little example of just our table of contents for our strategic plan um, and how it was very much based off of the previous example. Uh, so my qu next question for you, this is our last discussion question. We're coming up on maybe 10 minutes left here. Uh, what do you think you know, would be very difficult to write and implement in this type of strategic plan? And what would you maybe write into a mission or a vision statement? We're not gonna have a lot of time on this one, but I'll bring back up the, the very detailed strategic plan. And please just take maybe three minutes to talk about that. It's a lot. I know it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely like, you know, we what we stepped through small wins all the way to this where it's very much um built in, you know. so yeah i would say this type of thing is way more achievable when you have like a professional diversity officer who is who knows and does this work and can craft this type of st strategic plan so definitely hard mode <laughs> um, and to all answer you know yes it's all hard it can all be difficult in its own way so i'll just you know share some thoughts um before I invite you to do one more exercise. So, it, you know, 20%, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm so glad you all showed up and, you know, having that, those allies and that network is so important, but you can change policy and you can affect 100%. And there was a common theme in pretty much all of these um, models is involving managers and leadership. And my recycling uh, metaphor <laughs> here. So um, I have, I don't know if you've heard of Project Implicit, but it is kind of a fun game where you get to kind of test out some of your implicit biases. I just wanted to share this as a tool. If you're just getting started, people aren't really recognizing that they might have some sort of implicit bias, or you just want to interesting exercise to see what might be hidden in the depths of your subconscious. Um, you can go to this URL and try it out. We, it's uh, 508, it's 508. 
you know, take this link home. Um, feel free to stick around and discuss, but let's let's end on time. And uh, if anyone has any, let's take the last two minutes for any big questions. I'm sorry, I didn't leave a lot of time for that. And that, yes, Pat. In our little group, one of the common themes that came up was, A, it takes a long time to make change. Mm -hmm. B, how do you know you're making progress? I mean, you talked a bit about metrics, but if you could share some things that were more concrete of how we can gauge whether we're actually accomplishing anything, I think that will help people stay the course and stay engaged and really keep working. Yeah, I think in terms of metrics, um, you have to cross cut them in certain ways, you know, evaluate in terms of uh, who is leaving the organization, who's getting promoted, separated out into different departments, if you can, um, you have to kind of get detailed with your metrics and then measure them over time. Unfortunately, that seems like the best way. Um, you can repeat climate surveys, but I really do think that looking at the numbers, um, looking at where are you recruiting, where are you giving your outreach, keeping track of those types of things and how much it's being um, sustained is are all really good measures of success. But I do agree, it does take a long time um, and you just gotta keep at it. I mean, we do, there is progress and I think keeping it fresh and having people involved, like rotating in and out of this work, but also, you know, keeping it kind of mandatory for managers is just the way to continue on pushing forward. Janice. Um. This is not quite a quantitative metric, but a more a qualitative one. Something very interesting I've heard um, diversity advocates say is that if you see people in your organization from um, underrepresented groups be able to feel comfortable in their own skin and present themselves confidently, that's actually a sign that what you're doing is working. Because oftentimes, when a person does not feel comfortable in their own skin, they're not being their best selves. They're not bringing all they have in terms of their potential to the table. And you can feel that. You can see that. And so again, it's not quantitative, but you know, it's, it get, gives you the sense that they're comfortable in the space that you're creating. And that's actually good for the organization because you do want everyone to come and achieve their full potential. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, it, it does get frustrating to have to form justification based on bottom line and have to give forth like, well, you'll make more money this way or you'll be more successful. And just, you know, the humanity and the authenticity factor is very important. Absolutely agree. Okay, if there's no one else, um, Andre Nicolas just left to go play the Gemini card game <laughs> in the Oak Room. So, you know, feel free. And thanks, thanks all for coming. And we made it through. Stay tuned. <laughs>
He used to be a I'll take him for it. 